showed the ESL version. That's what it was actually in here for Town Hall. Too bad I deleted it. Oh, really? That's what it was. I was like, I was putting the version on my phone. The window was like, yeah. I
waiting for the cue. I don't know. Do I start? Okay, good morning, everyone. It's a tremendous honor for me to welcome you all to our Bracing for Impact conference on the future of AI for society here at Osgoode Hall Law School. Now, we're delighted to have you join here. For those of you uh, joining from our live stream on our YouTube channel, and those of you here in person, finally here in the room, thank you so much for joining. I had a peek also at the attendance list uh, on, in our virtual online environment, and there's people from all over the world. So thrilled uh, for that, and we look forward to your comments throughout the day. And we really want it to be a fun and engaging and rich learning experience for you all. Now, I'm Professor Pina D'Agostino, and I'm the founder and director of IP Osgood, and uh, one of the founding co-organizers for today, along with Professor Ian Stedman. Hi, Ian. And Dr. Aviv Gaon, who just flew in uh, last night from Israel. So uh, thank you. Uh, you know, it's uh, always funner when we work as a team. And uh, you know, we've been at this for some time, uh, leading the charge on the AI uh, discussions even before it was popular to do so. And uh, we're also, of course, grateful to Microsoft. So Microsoft is one of our founding sponsors, and they've been uh, with us from the very beginning. And they're, of course, champions of all things AI and responsible AI. And here, a big shout out go to Nadine Letson and Marlene Floyd from Microsoft. Now, please tweet away. We're on all socials, so hashtag IPOS Bracing for Impact and hashtag IPOS Future of AI for Society. And as I like to say, the conversation always continues. And so you'll see some of our students here today, and they'll be blogging on this. We'll have blogs going out throughout the next few weeks on our website, and we'll also be posting a full recording of uh, today's event. Now, we're especially thrilled uh, to be holding this in person because, of course, I recall uh, very well <laughs> that before the whole world was uh, locking down, uh, we were about to hold our big conference, our Bracing for Impact, but we actually decided early on uh, to postpone it. So I remember having to put that uh, postponed sign across uh, the conference website. And here we are again. So uh, several years later, and it's so nice to see so many faces joining us and some very distinguished guests who you'll have a chance to meet throughout the day. Uh, we have with us the Honorable Maurizio Bevilacqua, Mayor of the City of Vaughan, uh, so close to home. And we also have uh, distinguished guests flying in from British Columbia. So Justice Marshall Rothstein, recently retired from the Supreme Court of Canada. Flying in from Israel, we have Professor Lior Zemer. He's the Dean of the Harry Radzner Law School in, at Reichman University. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and you'll hear from uh, Professor Zemer in the keynote. Um, so uh, looking forward to that. Uh, we also have uh, a very warm welcome to extend to Costantinos Yorgaras. He is the newly minted CEO of the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. Congratulations. And I believe this will be your first, perhaps, among the first official uh, speaking engagements that you make. And delighted to be welcoming back Professor David Waver from the UK. Yay, it's been far too long. Uh, so nice to see you again. And of course, uh, here leading the charge at York University, we have Paul Saparis. He is the chair of the Board of Governors of York University, and he'll be extending some welcoming remarks very shortly. Now, a big welcome to all of our students, and it really is all about the students. We start and end with the students because they are the ones that give us reason uh, you know, to put all these things together. And for those of you who don't know, it's pretty quiet around the law school today because it's actually reading week. 
So um, it's a good use of your time for the students who've come uh, to extend their time to really support us through this conference. And uh, a big welcome again to the guests who are here in this room. And uh, we look forward to your active participation. Now, for those of you joining us on uh, our YouTube live stream, uh, please do ensure you know there's a chat function. You can make comments. We want your feedback if you have any questions throughout the day. Uh, we have our students who are monitoring the chat, and we'll be sure that the panels uh, are aware of your feedback. OK? So uh, keep that in mind. We want to hear from you. Now, IP Osgood is the university's uh, IP flagship program, so it dealing with all things IP and technology, and it's a program, really, uh, my own little, my first baby that I started 14 years ago here at Osgoode Hall Law School. And I'm very proud that throughout the years, we've been able to inject many more diverse voices to the debates in IP and technology here in Canada and around the world. And really, today is uh, really no exception. An event like today, the Bracing for Impact series, we've brought together many global experts, not only from law and policy, but from different domains, so in the sciences, engineering, in health, and other important fields, and crossing many bridges, academia, industry, government, and other expert hubs here in Canada and around the world. So you're in for a treat today, as always. Uh, it's action-packed. And along with so many of us, I think I've learned a lot from COVID. Um, now, throughout my many years of conference organizing, and I've been at this for a long time, and I feel like I'm all, almost always organizing a wedding a year. <laughs> um, and I keep making tweaks along the way because I like to make things optimal. Uh, my husband, who teaches engineers, jokes that I should have been an engineer. So there are some innovations that you will notice in our conference today. And um, the first one, I think, is there's only so much resilience we've built up to our screens. So we've been doing a lot of screen time. And uh, so you'll notice that our panels are crisp. They're one hour uh, long, and they're more conversational and all, on, of course, on cutting-edge themes. Now, outside of the typical uh, keynote that is uh, you know, germane to the conference topic, what we decided to do is to have a compelling keynote uh, from Professor Lior Zemer that really, uh, followed by commentary by Justice Rothstein, that is on a vital topic that transcends all disciplines and that is of uh, you know, impact and importance to us all. Now, also another innovation, as Osgood is a leader in experiential learning, uh, this conference is all about that. We're not just gonna be talking about AI and theorizing about it, uh, as many academics, we like to do that, but also rolling up our sleeves, perhaps, and uh, making touch point with Spot. So uh, I am told we are the first law school in Canada to bring in uh, a robot. And why not, right? This conference is all about AI. And so let's show what this is about. So Spot is going to be making a debut appearance uh, here on campus. So we'll be having demonstrations throughout the day. And I look forward for you to engage with Spot. And I'm really grateful to both Boston Dynamics and MFE for coming on board and doing the demonstrations. Now, uh, one thing we've decided to keep is uh, uh, food and drinks. So every conference uh, always should have good food and really grateful to Daniel and Danielle for the food. And also, every good conference should be as accessible as possible. So we've tried to do that through the in-person now and the online streaming which we'll be posting up. And of course, we've had to keep within the, proto the protocols of COVID, so you should feel free uh, to wear a mask if you want. You're not required to do so, but of course, whatever makes you feel comfortable. You're, this is meant to be a safe place of learning, and we're meant to have fun together. Now, fittingly, also marking the day, um, 
we're launching the new center for AI and society uh, for the university, so CASE. So we'll have the VPRI of York University, Dr. Amir Asif, uh, making some welcoming remarks later on in the, in the day. And also I'll be joined by the co-director, my co-director, yes, that'll be something else I'll be working on, Professor James Elder. So, and then we close with celebration and drinks. So to honor properly the IP Osgood David Weaver Medal for Excellence in Intellectual Property, we wanted to do something here with everyone because that's another thing that happened with COVID. We were able to give the awards on paper, but not actually <laughs> in person. And that's no fun, right? Especially for the students who work hard uh, throughout their um, you know, time here at Osgood. So and I'm looking at some of our stellar students. So that's coming up. And we'll hear again from Justice Rothstein on that note. Now, to put an event of this magnitude together, we need top speakers, and there are many here. We need the robots, the food. We have uh, lots of help. And here, it's important to say thank you. And first and foremost, Ashley Moniz. Uh, Ashley, he's the assistant director of IP Osgood and the IP Innovation Clinic. And he's really been the go-to on all the logistics round the clock and truly exuded superhuman AI qualities. So I think you'll have a very good sleep tonight. Um, so thank you, Ashley. At Osgood, I'm also grateful to Mia Yu, who's been unrelenting in her support, and she's fairly new on the job, and she's been incredible. Big thanks also to Anita Herman and her team. She is a pro, and I've known her since day one at Osgood. And I know I'm looking at Trevor. Uh, you know, we, all, we started together, and she's been fantastic with us, and her team, Erica Robertson and Megan Carrington. Now, my gratitude to Anna Kajor. She's a delight to work with from the ISM project at Lassonde. And as usual, uh, we have the enthusiastic crop of students, and I'll just uh, name them because they are going to be blogging, and they've been volunteering, and we're here very early today putting this all together. So Brittany Oates, Claire Wurtzman, Mina Alnajar, Jasmine Yu, Egan Kongoli, Pankuri Malik, and Gregory Hong. Thank you. Uh, I'm also grateful to Maria uh, from Maria Buddha Photography. There you are, Maria. She's going to make us all look good, all right? So you, you need to make sure you smile. She's the official photographer and videographer for today. And uh, looking forward to seeing all your smiling uh, faces also after on our website. Grateful to 1213 for all the promo materials and to York IT. Look at that. It looks like an incredible professional studio. Grant McNair, you're amazing. And uh, thank you for everything you do, you and your team with Burnt Iman. And uh, you know, Grant is uh, you know, leading the ship there and making sure everything is going to run smoothly. So thank you again. Now, this year's Bracing for Impact is titled The Future of AI for Society. And it looks to how AI has the potential to shape key elements of our lives, from our cities, where we live, to our healthcare system that takes care of us, to our educational system where we learn and teach our future leaders, especially here at the law school. Now, I always like to go back to our signature title, which is Bracing for Impact. And uh, Ian and Aviv, I think we really picked well. Um, because for those of you who travel on airplanes, you will be familiar with the instructions on the seat in front of you. The data shows, and yes, it's all about the data, that bracing for impact actually works. So it is always prudent to be prepared. While we all hope that this transition to the AI future will involve a smooth flight, we should expect some turbulence along the way. And we should train and prepare ourselves if things do go horribly wrong. And that is where we brace for impact. And that is why we have this major motivation to keep running this important series. Because we need to uh, discuss, prepare, and really be with each other to ensure that we develop and adopt legal, ethical, trusted, and transparent socially responsible frameworks to better the future of AI for society. 
So now, before we kickstart the conference, it is my honor to welcome one of our visionaries at the university, navigating us in the right direction, Paul Saparis. And Paul, I will say a few words about you, if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> So Paul is the chair of the Board of Governors of York University, and we're so blessed to have him. When I asked Paul to say a few words, he immediately accepted. Indeed, he is an avid supporter of our many initiatives at the university, and in fact, personally attends so many of our events, and I'm, I've seen him at countless events. And on this tech front, he is a superstar himself, as he's had a distinguished 30-year runway career marked by progressively senior appointments within the multinational tech company Hewlett Packard, including 12 years as president and CEO of HP Canada and VP at HP America before retiring in 2012. And I have to say, his retirement has been our fortune at the university. Now, Paul was appointed as the chair of the Board of Governors on July 1, 2018, and his appointment is the culmination of two decades of service to York since 1998, when he was invited to join the Schulich School of Business Dean's Advisory Board, a role he continues to fill today. In 2012, he joined Schulich as executive in residence, and he continues to serve as a guest lecturer and an advisor to the Master of Business Analytics program. Since his appointment to the Board of Governors in 2010, Paul has served on multiple committees and was proud to serve on the search committee for York's current chancellor and president. And you also chose, chose wisely there. As board chair, a role he says is perfectly aligned with my post HP plan to dedicate time to my passion for education. Paul is an ex officio member of all board uh, committees at the university. He also represents the Board of Governors on the York University Development Corporation and the University Senate. Paul also continues to bring his leadership talents to independent school, hospital, and industry boards, as well as the boards of startup technology companies and Inspire, an education foundation dedicated to the success of Indigenous youth. And I'd love to hear more about that and work more with you on that. Paul also serves as the chair of the Council of Chairs of Ontario Universities. Paul was honored in 2004 with an alumni award for his contributions to the, school, to the Schulich School of Business. He is also a past recipient of Canada's Top 40 Under 40 and a 2013 recipient of Queen Elizabeth's II Diamond Jubilee Medal, honoring significant achievements and contributions of Canadians. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. So, Pina, thank you for that uh, gracious and unnecessarily long uh, background. You folks are all uh, wonderful. You can read about these things, but thank you for being so gracious. And it, and it is. Uh, just so delightful to be with you uh, this morning. And uh, when Pina had asked me about joining this conference, it's just one of these things that was so easy to say yes to, especially after 30 plus years in the technology business. And uh, I guess in official capacity as well, to, uh, to say a few welcoming words on behalf of the university. And as uh, Pina has indicated my name and my responsibilities, but I think what I'm most excited about, a little tagline we're using at York University these days about write the future. And if you think of the power of those words in terms of write the future and what it means, um, I think it really represents what this conference is all about in the multi interdisciplinary perspectives that we need to look at at complex issues that are facing society today. And so, uh, as Pina eloquently talked about, the uh, Bracing for Impact Conference, this is indeed our third. Um, but before we do that, we have a very important tradition here and, and as many parts across the country in terms of our land acknowledgement. So I did want to take this opportunity to recognize the many Indigenous nations that have long-standing relationships with the territory upon which 
York University's campuses, and we say that quite intentionally, it's plural because we do have many, uh, not only in the GTA here, but also in uh, Costa Rica and India and places around the world. And so uh, in this particular campus, we want to acknowledge the territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabe Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat and it's now home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampon Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Now, for those of you that are joining us virtually from other parts of Ontario, Canada, and indeed around the world, this land acknowledgement may not be for the territory you're currently on, and if this is the case, we ask that you embrace this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territory that you're currently on and the current treaty holders. So I think you've seen uh, our leader in action in terms of the uh, founder and director of IP Osgood, uh, Pina D'Agostino. And uh, I guess uh, one of the things I wanted to share with you, I knew Pina before I actually had, although I've had a long-standing relationship with the university, it was actually from an industry perspective that I first crossed paths with Pina in her work in, uh, in, uh, in IP and certainly spending a career in technology. You can't help but be abreast of these issues and on top of these issues that are out there. So, uh, and so uh, certainly a lot of her uh, accolades have been quite, uh, she's certainly one of the most prominent leaders in terms of AI. Uh, here in Canada, and it was recently, I'm going to put this little plug in, was named one of the top 25 most influential lawyers in Canada. And uh, so we should give that recognition to her. She did not ask me to say that, by the way, so I felt compelled to do so because I think it was important to have that recognition. And I think this uh, Bracing for Impact series that she talked about talks about, you know, really stirring a discussion around AI, both in Canada and, and abroad, and bringing important, many important partners, like uh, the conference lead sponsor, Microsoft, which has been with, uh, with this organization since the very beginning, and certainly being on that side of the equation, certainly importance of sponsorships uh, from the private sector to help make this conference free, to help be able to have accessibility for students is so critical. So we thank all of the sponsors that uh, help make that happen. And uh, certainly I've been on the other side of that, writing those checks in my days, and so I'm happy to see the sponsors do that uh, today. Uh, so as uh, Pina was talking about, Bracing for Impact has addressed key policy concerns related to AI, such legal, and ethical issues, data governance and intellectual property, and in doing so has brought together experts from across Canada and around the world, both in person and online, and throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this year's conference focuses aptly on the importance of AI for society. And when York University developed its strategic research plan, and as uh, Pina indicated, uh, Amir Asif, you're gonna be hearing a lot more of that uh, later on in the session, we identified the integration of artificial intelligence into society as a key research opportunity. And today this has emerged as one of York University's central areas of focus and is demonstrated through the creation of York University's newly created Center for AI and Society. And you'll be hearing from York University's uh, Vice President of Research and Innovation, Amir Asif, and, you know, and two of the co-directors, Pina, as you heard about, and James Elder. Now, for those of you, uh, these are actually chronicled in uh, York University's Wi-Fi file. For those of you that are wanting to know all the current news that's happening with York University, both Pina's recognition as well as the organized research units are highlighted in Wi-Fi this morning. So fast breaking news is here. Uh, last year, the uh, the York University's task force identified the integration of AI into society as the key area of opportunity for accelerated research, bringing together the worlds of AI and society, the needs from collaboration from experts across varying disciplines, devising solutions not only to push technological boundaries, but also protect and assist our community and world more broadly. 
York University has aimed to empower students through interdisciplinary research and academic opportunities, making it a perfect home to advance the capabilities of AI technology with special consideration for the impacts on all aspects of society. And I can tell you in this privileged position of leading the board, I have the opportunity to step in and see some of the excellence in all the faculties across the universities. And I say it's a privileged position because you get these wonderful insights and you're going to see them displayed this morning. So as AI con concerns continue to grow, York University aims to lead the AI technical logical advancement and better understand the ways in which society can adapt to better interact with it. Programs like Bracing for Impact series will help push the university towards that goal and York's interdisciplinary approach is clearly demonstrated with members of four different York faculty speaking with you today. Now, as someone who has been part of the technology industry and continue to be uh, for the past 30 years, I have a real passion for innovation and education. And so me being part of this event is, is quite frankly a bit of a natural and a comfortable place for me. So I thought I'd provide you with some perspectives and they're going to be quick, I can assure you. Despite the challenges of biased algorithms, security, privacy, rampant social media where everyone has a megaphone, I remain incredibly optimistic that the important technological, social, and where appropriate regulatory frameworks will continue to be put in place to address these issues. As they've been in the past with all the other waves of technical, technological innovations that I've witnessed over the past 30 years, and I can tell you I have witnessed them. And at every major technological innovation, the same set of questions get answers and the same set of challenges are progressed and we find our way forward. And I think as it relates to AI, we'll continue to find our way forward. But how? How do we move forward? And I guess in my view, an ethical framework based on the emerging uh, ESG principles uh, can help guide both the private and the public sector in the right direction. We need to be cognizant of the risks. However, we need to be careful not to sacrifice the speed and time to value for business and society that these technologies provide. And we also want to continue to support the vibrant AI ecosystem that's in Toronto, the GTA in Canada, and in fact around the world where companies are utilizing these technologies to create and improve businesses, improve governments and governments functioning, and society writ large. So these are indeed some very heady challenges and that's why we are gathered here today to better understand the diverse perspectives necessary to provide insights and solutions. So I wish you all a fascinating and productive day of learning. I applaud Pina and the IP Osgood team for setting the stage for this wonderful discussion. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, I don't think we could have asked for a better welcome on behalf of the university. Thank you so much, Paul. And now we dig right in. We start with panel one. Um, so if I could have all uh, the speakers come up on stage. If you could take um, a seat, yeah, if we could take a seat up the front. It's better to do it now, right, so it won't be disruptive. And uh, while we set up our first panel, AI for the Future of Urban Development. I get to say a few words of welcome to the Honorable Mayor of the City of Vaughan, Mauricio Bevilacqua. So um, we're delighted that you're here. Uh, he, we're in for a treat. He's chairing our panel, our very first panel. And I think I can think of no one better than to do this uh, because I can attest firsthand, having been a longtime resident of the city of Vaughan for over 35 years. So I've seen his work in action and he's just been incredible. He works, he has this uplifting vision. He uh, does things with rigor, passion, and really tireless dedication. 
And he truly has built up the city of Vaughan. I don't even recognize it from, you know, when I first moved there. So that's all uh, thanks to you, Mayor Bevilacqua. And uh, I also think that we're among his last official business as mayor. Because for those of you who don't know, he's decided not to seek re-election as he completes his third very successful term as mayor and a much beloved mayor. So I'd like to just, if we could take a, a moment to recognize that and honor you and give you a big round of applause for all your service. <laughs> and you know, can I say a few words about you? Well, you got the mic. Okay, <laughs> I love it. So prior to becoming mayor, Mayor Bevilacqua was a member of parliament for 22 years, serving in several roles including Minister of State for Finance, Minister of uh, State for Science, Research and Development, and Chair of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Finance. And I can tell you, it goes on a little bit longer here. He's the Chair of the Finance and Administration Committee for the Regional Municipality of York, Vice Chair of the Regional Municipality of York Police Services Board, and Vice Chair of York Region Rapid Transit Corporation. Mayor Bevilacqua also serves as a director on the Electra Board, and uh, that's where um, I also get to interact with him, and a member of Electra's Human Resources and Compensation Committee. He's a member of the Global City Leaders Advisory Board for the World Council on City Data and the Advisory Council for the Postgraduate Certificate in Business Administration at York University School of Continuing Studies. Now he's the chair of the City of Vaughan Smart City Task Force, where I also got a chance to work with him and chair of the Ready, Resilient and Resourceful Committee. Mayor Bevilacqua is also chair of the Vaughan Healthcare Precinct Advisory Task Force and chair of the Vaughan Metropolitan Center Subcommittee. He is chair of McKenzie Health Foundation and was instrumental in the 250 million ultimate campaign in building that up. Chair of the Hospice Vaughan Capital Campaign and co-chair of the Lou Fruitman Rena Residence Capital Campaign. He's also very accomplished academically uh, Mayor Bevilacqua holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from York, yay, you picked well, a Master of Arts degree from Fordham, and a Master of Laws degree from the University of Toronto. Now, I know you've had a lot of uh, chair roles, Mayor Bevilacqua, but I bet being chair of panel one uh, on AI for the future of urban development will be the cherry on top. Yes. So a very warm and, welcome uh, to you. And my, uh, my resume will be updated accordingly. <laughs> uh, I want thank to you. thank you so much, uh, Pina, and uh, I just want you to know that there's a delay in the in the video, right, in the stream. So I, actually, you gave me two applauses, which I really like. I saw, it, I heard it, and then I hear it here as well. Um, so as soon as I walked in, somebody said to me, "You have four days left, right?" And I said, "You better finish that sentence." I mean, four days as mayor. Um, but I, I just want to say how pleased I am. This is my alma mater. Actually, my my son taught at the at the uh, at the uh, law school here, law school, law school and uh, had a great experience uh, teaching, I think, for four or five years um, and coaching the arbitration and mediation uh, team and th there's sort of like an Olympics competition uh, where uh, students from all over the world participate and I'm really proud of him because uh, as a coach he delivered a couple of gold medals and uh, the first time actually that both in our arbitration and mediation, uh, York University won both. So please applaud my son, um, <laughs> Jean-Paul. I want to um, say to you that um, as a, a person who's been in public life for 34 years now, both at the uh, uh, federal and, and, and municipal uh, level, I just want you to know that everywhere I go, obviously I put uh, my own filter in conversations because we all come in with sort of a context in my context, because I am in public service and because I'm an elected official, uh, I always view things uh, through the prism of uh, what we as a society and as individuals do, how does it improve the human condition? Because quite frankly, I think that is the purpose of life. Uh, how do we use our existence on earth uh, to in fact um, bring about positive change to people's lives? And so, Every time I attend a conference, I, I always think about that uh, because 
I think all of us in this room are here because we do believe that life needs to be a meaningful, purposeful, and fulfilling experience. <coughs> and uh, AI is part of that conversation. It's, um, it's our ability to use artificial intelligence uh, to do that. And so when we talk about the issue related to transportation, for example, ultimately, how does that improve people's lives? Um, how does uh, artificial intelligence take us to the next level uh, in, in making sure that our, our life's experiences um, are, are better and, and more meaningful? I say this to provide context because it's important to, to sit down and, 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 and soak it all in. And so we have great speakers here who are going to uh, give us uh, the privilege uh, to, to listen to, to ideas that speak, I think, to essentially that reality, uh, because ultimately that is what it's about. And we have Professor Zachary Spicer, Dr. Vera Roberts, Professor Guy Seidman, and uh, Keith Hemingway. Uh, they will be uh, our speakers. Um, I will talk very briefly here uh, about uh, my role as mayor and, and, and uh, Pina. Um, I want to say a few words about you as well. And, Chair of the board obviously stole most of what I was going to say, but that's okay. Um, her, uh, uh, as I often say when I speak about Pina, her record speaks for herself. I, I think that um, she's a dynamic person. I, I, she sits on the Smart City Task Force with me at, um, at the city. Uh, also, stellar performance at Electra uh, as a member of the board. And by the way, she represents the city of Vaughan. So don't be surprised that she's excellent. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Um, it's, uh, I'm really proud of citizens uh, like Pina because uh, not only uh, are they professors of this great uh, um, law school, but they also give back to the community. And remember where I'm coming from. As an elected official, I look for those things. I look for people who uh, truly care about bringing positive change uh, to, to our community. And she's done that in so many in so many ways, and the chair, you, you, you've covered many uh, of, the, of the points. And, and, and always, sometimes, you know, when we talk about an individual, we always attach a title to, to the individual. It's sort of, you know, something that we do as a society. You know, there are professors, there are lawyers, there are consultants, there are, there are dead batteries. And, um, <laughs> the, um, but I, I also think that it's very important uh, to understand not only what the person does, but who the person is. And Pina is a very caring, compassionate, uh, nurturing individual who truly cares about what she does. And uh, as mayor of the city of Vaughan, I, I want to say how, how happy I am uh, to see her involvement uh, your, 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 and, and the impact they're having, uh, not only Electra, but the city of Vaughan, but also obviously uh, Judging from the reception you got, you're doing excellent work here uh, by, um, by, by providing uh, such wise advice and, and organizing the meeting of the minds, which I think is very important. Now, her real claim to fame, however, is that uh, she handed Jean-Paul his law degree at the uh, ceremony. Jean-Paul was my son, for those of you who are not keeping up. Uh, <laughs> um, and so I want to thank you for that. That was a very special moment in our family's lives. So thank you. Um, so in, in reference to the city of Vaughan, uh, which is uh, something that we want to talk about and, and, and Pina is uh, involved, we, we identified the smart city um, opportunities to, to move our, our city forward uh, through, through innovation, information, and communication technology. And this is all part and parcel of uh, accountability and transparency in, uh, in, in our government. And how do we you know, use data uh, to, uh, to improve uh, services. And you probably, you know, in the narrative of what I'm saying, you probably noticed that I go back always to the issue of how do you improve life for, for people. And one of the uh, key areas of focus was uh, mobility management and uh, how we could use smart city initiatives uh, to improve road safety, uh, reduce traffic and, and congestion, and encourage residents to participate in active transportation. And we've taken some major steps. You probably know that the city of Vaughan is the only uh, city um, outside of the city of Toronto that actually has a subway. Um, Mississauga doesn't have one. Brampton doesn't have one. Markham will eventually get one. 
this is my last boastful act as mayor, um, but um, but this is very important for us. And um, our new uh, Move Smart Mobility Management Strategy has really guided our city's efforts uh, to improve and build more reliable, integrated uh, transportation uh, system. And um, we are now well known in, in the in the 905 area as, as a city that um, has really designed excellence and, and uh, flexible planning, uh, as well as convenient uh, travel options. And you know, it's very interesting when we, when we think of transportation and transportation investments. You know, there are periods, as you know, when the transportation system is being built where the ridership is low and it could get quite discouraging. And uh, because nobody likes to see empty buses, right? But you've got to stay firm. You've got to stay dedicated. You you can't let go of that important uh, element of city building, which is uh, developing a transit system and network. Uh, and 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 you will see. And I get the phone calls, right? You know, I wish I wish you know we had more um, we had more people on those buses. But what we noticed is there's an upward trend now where millions of people, there are millions of riders uh, uh, throughout uh, the year. And what has really helped us is obviously the subway. Uh, the subway that uh, as this interconnectedness with, um, with, uh, with the city of Toronto. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our um, panelists. They, they all bring extensive uh, experience to today's discussion. Which, are, which will range from the role of smart cities in the modern world to artificial intelligence and data uh, contr contr uh, contribution to urban development. And so I guess we're going we're gonna to get started. And um, we're going to get started. And, and the focus uh, of the first speaker will be data governance and industry interactions with, with government structures. And it will be uh, Professor uh, Zachary uh, Spicer to, to kick it off. Yep, um, more, more than happy to. Um, thanks so much. So um, I want to uh, start off today to talk a little bit about uh, municipal government and capacity as it relates to uh, smart city development. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm a uh, professor of public policy. Most of the work that I do focuses on local governments, and uh, all of that um, has to happen through the lens of constraints. So constraint over resources, uh, constraint by scale, uh, constraint by by uh, legislation from from the province. And my interest in, in, uh, in smart cities kind of stems uh, from this as well. So smart cities represent uh, a unique type of capacity, scale, and resource challenge for municipal governments. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second, but first I want to talk about uh, some of the benefits that, uh, that AI and different ICTs may actually offer for, for municipal governments. So we've heard uh, about some related to, uh, to transportation of on, obviously. Um, but I want to sort of talk about some other things here. Uh, necessarily that the, the, the servicing and policy responsibility for municipal governments hasn't really changed over the past 100 years. We've, we typically think of local governments as service delivery agents. Right? I would kind of challenge that, that conceptualization. I think you probably would as well. Um, but we, we think of them as doing things for us, right? Plowing snow, paving roads, stuff like this, right? Um, all of these things cost money, municipal budgets are tight, I don't have to tell you that, obviously. Um, uh, but uh, AI and, and ICTs and smart city technology gives us an opportunity to do more with less, right? So we can maximize budgets, create efficiencies, and save money. With that said, smart city technology also brings a host of brand new challenges, right? So um, municipalities, um, can and do, uh, do do procure vast amounts of technology, but they can't necessarily build it on their own. So um, this essentially means that most of these arrangements are public-private partnerships. Not necessarily a bad thing. Municipalities provide a lot of services that they don't necessarily produce. So this isn't uh, a sort of strange phenomenon. Um, but the question is uh, if there's always a clear understanding of what is being purchased and how it is being used. Um, so let me just use an example of roads. 
um, every municipality has uh, a roads person. So let's just, for the sake of simplicity, call that guy Steve, right? Every municipality has a Steve, a director of roads. They know how to procure asphalt. They know how, how to procure construction services, stuff like this. They've been doing it for a very long time, uh, whether it's uh, a very large city or a very small town. They know exactly what to procure. They know uh, estimates based on weather, traffic usage, stuff like this. Um, the question is, do people like Steve understand data governance agreements related to road sensors? Right? Do they understand the implications for international trade agreements as it comes to data control? Right? Uh, not necessarily. Right? In some places like Vaughan, Toronto, certainly there is understanding and skill related to AI technology and everything else. You, you move a bit farther outwards, uh, that's not necessarily there. But this is who we're putting the work of data governance on, right? People like Steve. Uh, we're, we're, we're asking a lot from them, and, and the question that I always have is, is whether this is necessarily fair, right? Do, do we, are we giving them the resources that they need to properly evaluate data governance and control agreements? Um, do they have the skill to, un to understand and evaluate the sort, of, the sort of technology that we are asking them to, uh, to uh, implement within our road systems or anywhere else. Um, the other thing uh, that I want to talk about here very, very briefly uh, is acquiring skill. So municipalities are very good at, at, at acquiring things. Um, I think when it comes to AI and smart, city, uh, and smart city technology, they need to be a lot more concerned about acquiring skill. Right? How do we find people who understand AI governance systems, people who, who, understand, dat who, who, who understand data governance, who understand smart city smart city technology, and how do we uh, turn these people into public servants? And I think that, um, that that's something that's an interesting question. I again apologize, I'm coming here with uh, a lot more questions than I have answers, but I guess that's a, the that's a point of events like this. Um, so I just sort of uh, wrap up by, by identifying what I'm kind of concerned about in terms of a skills gap, a capacity gap, and a participation and engagement gap when it comes to procuring smart city technology within municipalities in Canada. And I'll, I'll wrap it up there because I'm cognizant of time. We have some of your wonderful panelists who have great things to say. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> you have a lot to think about already. <laughs> uh, Dr. Vera Roberts, you're next. Uh, well, I, uh, I feel a little bit at a disadvantage. I was expecting questions and didn't come prepared with notes. But I will tell you why I'm here today. And uh, it's great to see all of you, and that's certainly a motivator. But I'm here in part to represent the voice of people with disabilities in AI data systems. Um, and this is an important voice because many of our data systems are based on uh, majority. They're based on the um, most common feature. And one of the things about disability is that the only common feature you have, if you have a disability, is that you're different from the normal. And so this is not a distinct group. We can't just fix AI data and systems by adding data about people who fit in a disability group, because that group doesn't exist. That group is very heterogeneous. It's, and looking at finding ways to improve how we're teaching our systems uh, means that we really need to think about this problem. And I really like that we've already talked about the issue of data governance. I think it's really tremendous that you brought that up because data governance applies to all of us. And all of us have to be concerned about our data privacy. So there's a lot of promise with AI, and I'm not an AI naysayer. But I am here to say we need to be thinking about some of the ways that AI may not provide the flexibility that we expect. Many of us think that when we bring in an AI system that we've introduced pure logic, that it will be flawless, that it won't be biased because it removes the human element. But the problem with most AI systems is that they've actually been trained on human data. And humans are flawed. Our data is flawed and it is biased. And we see that AI systems often amplify some of the challenges and biases that we experience in society. And so when we think about how we're going to use data, we need to be thinking about a number of things. What data do we have? What biases might it be introducing? 
Who is it impacting, especially people who are already feeling marginalized because of disability, but others too, who are at the margins of whatever context they're in. And then we need to be thinking about who controls our data and who do we give permission to to use our data. So a little bit of a naysayer, but not too bad, I hope. I think there is some promise and I want us to look at it together. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. And I think you raised some important issues in relationship to you know, the notion of fairness and equity and inclusion, uh, because whatever we do in, in, in our society uh, cannot be excluding individuals. And you Absolutely. said something about artificial intelligence I thought was uh, interesting, and you said it's not perfect, right? Right. Neither is intelligence, by the way. <laughs> it doesn't have to be artificial for its perfection. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And of course, I'm not saying that humans are necessarily better. What I'm saying is AI is based on human intelligence, and we are flawed, and our AI also has flaws that we just need to be aware of. We need to address those things. And I was a bit remiss, because I should have plugged my center a little bit. Uh, at the Inclusive Design Research Center where I work, uh, we've been conducting a few projects to try to address this. Uh, and uh, one of them would be We Count, which I encourage all of you to go to our website and look at some of the things we're doing to address bias in the data system. Um, but I've also had the pleasure in that project to look at Sidebox Labs, MI, uh, the uh, Master Innovation Development Plan, and do some assessments of it. And I think th in those assessments that are on the We Count site, you can also see some interesting uh, challenges that could be posed through AI systems. Thanks for that. Thanks for letting me plug the center. Yeah, no, that was good. And thanks for saying that we're all flawed. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> depends who you ask. Yes. <laughs> um, we're going to Keith Hemingway. Yeah, Welcome. Um, so I think in, in my view, AI is not new. And what the change now is, it's becoming more mainstream. It was a nerdy thing before. Now everybody's kind of hearing about it and knowing about it. But what I find with AI, the big change, is that the availability of data. And coming from the utility uh, background, we're very cognizant of cyber attacks, cybersecurity. And so what's the change I see over the last little while is the technology improvement in able to get that data out of protected systems that were uh, hidden away from public, it was air-gapped, you couldn't get it. And that data is critically important for utilities now to plan where we're going in the future because we're seeing a very big trend towards of e-mobility, electrification of, uh, of transit, uh, we're seeing a big trend towards electrification of heating coming, and the old ways of working of just putting up more poles and wires in the electricity sector aren't necessarily the way we need to go forward and we need to start utilizing new tools like AI with our, with our data to forward ourselves to build new platforms and new, uh, new schemes so that we can, we can move forward and build without, we, we want to be very cautious of building utility equipment out without overspending, without using a traditional. We don't want to put that cost back on, on the, uh, on the, on the ratepayer. But what I think it really boils down to is data privacy. And not just data privacy in your personal identification uh, data that we all, we all do very well in trying to protect. And, and I think the my other colleagues here on the panel have raised some very good data privacy issues. And I see that being addressed as cybersecurity becomes very front of, front of mind. But data privacy in that, if I give you a real world example that as we get more operational data out of our, our core systems, we want to be able to pinpoint where a fault is occurring. Our customers and our ratepayers are getting less and less tolerant to outages. So if we can pinpoint exactly where a fault is occurring, can we send a drone down there and examine the pole line to see our, 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 our overhead equipment for damage, for, for, uh, for issues, and rectify that in a faster manner? But anything you're doing with cameras out there, you always have overshoot. We may only care about an insulator, but we can, we can see into a backyard. It starts to get creepy if all of a sudden, you know, we do a line scan with a, with a drone and all of a sudden you're getting uh, in your inbox, you know, we've noticed that you have, you know, old patio equipment. So here, here's, some, uh, here's some stuff. Here's a, you know, a coupon for some new patio equipment. And I think it really boils down to 
in my mind, what is data? And everything comes back to data. It's all ones and zeros. Mm -hmm. Pictures, personal identification information, it's all ones and zeros. And how do we make that balance between the best for the public good, which is building a strong, resilient electrical system in our, in our, in our capacity, so that society, you know, there's obviously safety issues in society when the power's out, product, productivity issues in, in, our, in our economies, but also at the same time, utilize that data so that, and data governance is key, and I'm glad the, my other panelists have brought that up, because it is so key that data governance be forefront because who is using that? I think on the utility sector, we are here for the public good. We are trying to make our cities and our communities better. But it gets weird if now, like my example there of sending out <laughs> to you, you know, new patio equipment. Like, we want to keep that. We, we spend, as we discuss with different vendors, we're very cognizant of having our legal team and cybersecurity team sit down and review what the data we are going to send to a third party. It, even though it's just an image of an insulator or a pole, it still may have overshoot into your backyard, into your private life. And we want to be very cognizant of that as, as AI is growing. AI is neither good nor bad. It's how we program AI. And I think given the diversity of our, I choose to look at AI as being a very positive step forward for our, for our society and what we're able to do with AI in, in society. But it's still data and it still needs to be treated as a data privacy issue. And even though it's an image, it may be, it could be consumption data, we could see maybe you have an EV charging, can we incentivize you through, you know, maybe deferring your load so that we don't have to build for a peak. We can spread our load out. In, speaking in electrical terms, we, it's much better for us not to have a more balanced load than, than, than large peaks. So if we can spread our load out by incentivizing you to maybe shift your EV charging, um, maybe we don't have to spend as much money to, to build our systems, but it still comes back to that AI, da that data, and that data privacy, I think, is key because when you have, who is getting that data, and who are you distributing that data to, and then if that gets in the wrong hands, what can they do? Because there's nothing, I don't, my personal opinion is I wouldn't want to get anything else. I think the, our, our ratepayers would be happy that we're trying to build a, a strong, resilient electrical system, but at the same time, you don't want us to start sending that out, that data out, to other third parties who may not be as, uh, as strict with the data that, that we are. So I think it really turns to a lot of people here, and especially the, the, the lawyers in the room, what to do with privacy. Because at the end of the day, it's an image, it's a text, it all comes back to a one and zero, and that's data. So how do we protect that data, and what, what governance do we put around that data so that society as a whole is protected? Thank you, Keith. I just, uh, if I can, just for one second before we proceed to uh, Professor Guy Seidman. I, as, as this area of artificial intelligence and data gathering uh, privacy and accessibility, in your case, uh, becomes more and more important as a societal issue. Uh, have you found that your particular organization is investing a lot more time and resources in the field? Have you seen a dramatic change? Yes. And even over, like, we have a brilliant cybersecurity director in Electra, and I've learned so much from him. And just, I find it's the training, it's the constant knowledge upgrades. It's not so much. We have the experts, but it's those knowledge programs to shift that, that making the data be top of mind, making cybersecurity be top of mind, rather than as engineers, as technical folk, we tend to push forward with a solution and think, yeah, it's great, we, we have our best intentions, but we don't maybe look and say, well, could somebody else hack into this? We spend a lot of time securing those systems, and now as the world becomes more, more open and more connected, we have to make sure that that data is protected and we spend a significant amount of time protecting it. Cybersecurity for us is key, it's across every project it, and it's foundational. Thanks for that. We'll, I'm sure we'll get back to, to you uh, after. Uh, Professor, go ahead. Do I use the PowerPoint from here or over there? Oh, okay. Cool. Professor Seidman, welcome. Thank you. Uh, tell me what you prefer. Where you prefer me to be? It'll be easier for me to see the screen from here, though. Okay. So, yeah, I'm 
they've told me not to prepare a PowerPoint presentation, so I have 21 slides. <laughs> Short slides. And this is going to be a very tough crowd to follow, so I'll, I'll do my best. And I also realize I'm the last thing standing between you and your break, so I'll try to keep it brief. I probably won't, but I'll try. I have three points to make uh, over the next 21 slides, and I'll say them first, so in case I don't reach them, you know, I will have said them. Uh, first, uh, you know, the AVs are probably the most, uh, autonomous vehicles are probably the most important, uh, likely to be the most visible um, uh, impact that artificial intelligence is going to have uh, on our daily life. And to make a long story short, um, AVs are coming. Maybe not now, maybe in five years, 15 years, 25 years, but they're coming big time. And as someone who's not really interested in technology on a day-to-day -day basis, I am absolutely sure that they will come and will have a huge, huge impact. That is one of the reasons why the title Bracing for Impact is so apt because of all the little things that are going, I think this is one of the biggest ones um, coming and I'll explain in a minute why. Um, the legal ramifications, I'm a lawyer unfortunately, and to my parents' real, really sadness, they were really un unhappy about me going into the law. Um, I can only speak of, of the legal ramifications, they're going to be huge. However, I think law will be able to deal with them. Um, uh, law has, has ways of dealing with huge changes, it's always been very good about it, so I'm pretty sure we'll be good here and you'll see in a minute why. So the third point is, we already know, we foresee, we clearly know and can foresee that there will be huge changes. And they will not be legal per se, they will be matters of public policy. So the third part, um, which I will have to stop short because you're gonna call me on time, uh, is drawing on a book that Professor Aviv Gaon and I are writing. Uh, you know, we'll be very happy to have pre-orders and signed copies for a mere 25% extra um, is going to be on the public policy implications. And the reason I'm touting them now is because I really don't want to hear in 20 years, oh, we wish we could have thought about it. We can think about it, and most of these things are very clear, going, clearly going to happen now. So now I'm going to go over my 21 slides faster because I've told you all of my points. Okay, so how am I moving the slides? Try what? Error. Errors? Error. Okay. So clearly, you know, we've all seen these pictures. We've all been very excited about AVs. Um, but you know, as lawyers, the only, only ones who can see are courts, you know, in retrospect, when you file the suit and they have to decide whether it was something that was foreseeable. And one of the most beautiful quotes I have from a California co court says, on a clear day, you can foresee forever. But that's if you're a judge 20 years uh, behind. Now, you know, in the, it's a little bit more difficult in advance. Um, AVs, are we there yet, asked the donkey. Well, uh, no. So four years ago, I gave my first talk on AVs. We were very, very excited. It was gonna come really, really soon. It's four years later, and I'm reinviting myself for four years from now to say, nah, we're not there yet. Um, basically, there are two reasons why we're not there yet. One is technological, and the engineers will explain to you that this is not going to be simple, and we actually have a, one suggestion for that. And the second part is human. Um, you know, but you promised. Um, so one of the answers, the, the second pro problem, sorry, is, is transition time. And one of the things, the, the only th slide I, I bring here from 2018 is this one. So there were cars in the US starting in 1900, and there were millions of cars pretty soon. But only basically in the 30s did the number of cars exceed the number of horses, which is pretty shocking when you think about it. So I'm not suggesting we bring horses back, although that could be cute, uh, but you know, a lot of cleaning, Mayor. It's gonna be really difficult to clean the horses. But what I'm saying is autonomous vehicles will come in, but like electric vehicles, this will take a lot of time. There will be a fraction of the cars, then there will be more of the cars, and eventually there'll be you know, all of the cars, but that will take decades. So you know, what about transitions? Uh, the second problem is public acceptance, and I really don't want to spend too much time on this, but, but it's a really nice slide. So they asked Americans, because Americans actually answer the phone when you call them, and they asked them, you know, are you likely to embrace 
autonomous vehicles. You know, going into a pod you have no control over that, you know, might and very likely will kill you. And the, the very interesting data is that Americans are warming up to it. I don't have Canadian data or Israeli, so that's, that's all the data I have. At the moment, uh, what I find a, a pretty amazing 55% of US adults are actually willing to contemplate that. The, the data for uh, you know, pilotless planes is a lot, a lot lower than that. But it's interesting to know that women are more cautious. It's 35%, uh, 65% of men, but only 45% or so of women, which makes a lot more sense. And when you look at the ages, the younger you are, the more likely you are to be willing to embrace. So, you know, under 30, you know, 70% are willing to embrace, over 65, 40-something percent. And also when you look at education, the higher your education, the less, uh, the less guarded you are. Uh, so people who have high school education or less, or 50% of them are unlikely to be willing. But if you have postgraduate education, two-thirds are willing to trust the machine, which and I'm going to say this only in one note, it's going to be more in the book, and if not in this book, in the next one. This is again part of the ongoing political divide between people who trust science, the machine, uh, academia, uh, what people are telling them, and people who trust people they've seen on Oprah give medical advice. You know, no pun intended. Um, so what if it ha actually happens? And we are assuming, and we have a few guesstimates. So let me start with our premise. We actually think that the best thing to do with autonomous vehicles um, is not to have all this discussion of how, how to share uh, the road with regular cars and with pedestrians because that's going to be very difficult but it's probably going to be worthy of giving them their own lanes or even their own roads especially at very very condensed um, areas. So this is one of our assumptions that autonomous vehicles at least at some point will get at least in the beginning, we'll get their own roads. Our second assumption is that the autonomous vehicle revolution will sort of swallow the, uh, the electric car revolution, and that by the time we have uh, uh, autonomous vehicles, they will mostly be um, uh, electric. And the reason is that one of the benefits is, or one of the big ben potential benefits is to uh, air, air quality and to inner city lives of people who are actually uh, um, suffocating from um, uh, cars. Um, our, our third assumption or question is we have no idea whether the autonomous vehicles will be privately owned, will be taxis, will be buses, uh, but our assumption is that once you get into the city with the autonomous vehicle, whatever it is, you don't need to park it, you don't need to take care of it, you don't need to handle it, and that's going to be uh, of great importance um, in the next 15 minutes or so. Okay. So, what we are going to say is we are absolutely sure that autonomous vehicles are coming mostly because the stakes are so huge. You know, humans, now that we have autonomous vehicles, we realize humans shouldn't drive. It actually makes no sense. I don't enjoy driving, but humans shouldn't drive because they're such imperfect drivers. Uh, the uh, uh, um, American agency estimates that 94% of all collisions are due to human error. 94%. Now, remember, even if autonomous vehicles are not going to be perfect, which we demand of them, they're very likely going to have a much, much lower collision rate than 94%, right? If only 5% are due to uh, 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 AV error, that's, that's, uh, that's good enough. That's even better than the current uh, condition. Now, we, are, we realize that some people like to drive. Some people also like to ride horses and, you know, take them out we can you know, allocate for them the spaces to take out their cars, ride to their heart's content, probably not with horses at the same time, but otherwise, you know, I really don't see why we have to keep cars just because people enjoy driving cars. Reduction of estimates, reduction of commute times, uh, more productive commutes, assuming you can actually read, write, sleep, eat, whatever you want to do. And one of the many th issues we, we talk about in the book, and I will just mention it really briefly, is the issue of, of, of uh, parking spaces. If our assumption is correct, and most experts talk about this, and the whole premise of autonomous vehicle is that you don't need to park it. It takes you to work, and then you don't need to, to park it. Just think what's going to happen once we get rid of, uh, we're going to need less roads, but we're also not going to need parking spaces. So um, in a city like Los Angeles, where an estimated 50% of the entire territory is parking spaces and roads, just think of, you know, 2% gain, 3% gain, 5% gain, freed up spaces 
what a mayor like you could do with this is absolutely uh, breathtaking. My uh, electric vehicle assumption also assumes less pollution. All of this is very, very enticing. Okay. I'm going to jump over the next stage and I'm just going to say this. Uh, I'm not going to go over the law of the horse, but I'm going to say this. Um, I'm also going to jump over this. I'm absolutely sure that the law, which has seen many, many changes, will able to absorb uh, current changes. Just to give you a quick, quick, uh, a quick note about this. People are very worried who is going to pay for accidents and what's going to happen. Well, you know, we've had experience with railroads and then with horses and then with cars. You know, total insurance law is going to be able to find solutions. I'm hardly worried about that. We will find solutions. They're going to be co complicated. Maybe it's going to be state-run, whatever. But this is not something that's going to require a new set of, of a new framework for the law. Uh, most of the classic issues have been with us for actually thousands of years. We'll find an answer. Okay. Two, three little points, and I'm finished. I promise I'm finished. I've just no looked at the time. Traffic law. So one of the interesting things we note is that there will be a lot less use for traffic law. We won't need traffic law. There will be a lot less traffic stops. We do realize this is not completely realistic, that most of what we're saying is, is about urban cities, about cities in less urban cities, in less urban areas, in open areas, uh, uh, rural areas. This is going to be completely different. There's going to be uh, ridership. There's going to be policing and so on. But once you go on your AV, why do you need police? This is going to be huge because people don't like traffic law, because people don't like to be stopped. Most of the encounters of individuals with the police are during traffic stops. This is not good for police, which is not particularly uh, liked by, by individuals. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, civil rights issues, uh, you know, uh, uh, who are they stopping, why are they stopping uh, on all of this issue. This will go away, or potentially will go away, once you get on your taxi now called autonomous vehicle. However, and this is where our book sort of covers stuff, and I'm going to go over this quickly, and you're going to ask me to not to do so. We actually suggest that not having traffic law might not be such a great thing. I know this is somewhat counterintuitive. This is why the book is worth buying, and we're talking about the hardcover. For one thing, we actually think the traffic law is a form of legal education. In a really weird way, traffic law is maybe the most wide for wide form of education we give everyone. We give our children, and we give it repeatedly. And this is maybe the only, er only area of the law that we teach children, right? Before we teach them about the Constitution, the civil rights, we teach them, you know, when you go on the road, look right, look left. And we, and we also tell them how to control it themselves and who to trust, who not to trust. So in a bizarre sort of way, this is going to go away. And, you know, like we're talking about whether we should keep teaching children cursive, shouldn't we keep teach them about Traffic law. Now, traffic law is not just about being careful about traffic. This is also about letting other people cross, understanding who crosses first, understanding how to behave. This is about human conduct, about human behavior. And so this is a much bigger issue, and giving this up is not such a, a joke. This is also one of the last shared spaces. Um, you have to be basically the president not to share the road. You can be very rich or very poor, and we are in a society that draws people apart. We, don't, we live in ever, uh, um, the number of people living in every single unit uh, goes down every year. So we're actually living more separately, work more separately, and bizarrely enough, the roads are one of the last places we have to interact. We have to respect each other, we have to see what other people are doing, we have to interact, social skills. All of this might be gone, and this is not something that we should ignore. Maybe we should be willing to give it up, but we shouldn't ignore this uh, altogether. Um, one more thing, and this is sort of uh, maybe my, uh, this is 20, so this is the end. Um, even if we give up classic traffic law, we're going to have a new traffic law. So we're going to have a police that will have to interact directly with our car. So the po when the policeman sees our car doing something wrong, suppose we throw something out of the window and they want to stop us. Will the police be able to interact with the car directly, just tell it to stop? Uh, uh, what's going to happen with the data this car has? So we're actually opening a brand new can of worms. And all of this is very clear now. And this is only a s sort of a small part, a sampling of the issues that we raise. I think the technological issues are sort of clouding uh, uh, the new constructs that we clearly see are going to happen, are going to take place, and we're going to have to, to think about it. And 
Um, all of this, we think, uh, is sort of clear to us um, uh, now. Um, so basically what we're saying is we don't think law is going to be a problem. We think law is going to be, as usual, the solution. And we need public policy discussion among you know, public policy deciders, mayors, uh, uh, and other uh, basically political actors to decide what we want. And we think that in all revolutions there are going to be winners and losers. Uh, we, we understand that in all revolutions there are winners and use losers. And just to give you one little example, what's going to happen with this freed up resource of parking spaces, right? Who's actually going to compensate the poor people who now own parking lots that are going to be irrelevant? Uh, what are we going to do with, with these territories? What are we going to do uh, uh, with these funds? All of this has to be debated or considered now because we can't be surprised and shocked to find out in 20, 30 years, assuming global warming doesn't kill us. Before that, we couldn't really be shocked to find all these things. There's lots of policy implications, and I sort of assumed that I'll overstay my welcome. So this is a good time to say, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Since we have just, I think, four minutes left, what I think we'll do is this. Uh, the panel has obviously given uh, us a lot to think about um, from, uh, from various perspectives. But I do think it's, it's really important in life to, to kind of crystallize what, what, what are the essentials. So I'm going to give all of you a one minute opportunity to essentially uh, speak directly to the people in this room and people that are watching us uh, on, online um, to really say if you could leave us just with one message, one key message uh, from your presentation that requires all of our attention, what would it be? Me first? Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'd say just very, very quickly, the one thing uh, that kind of stood, stood to me is the comment about winners and losers. Um, I would say that uh, from a government perspective, our job is, is to look out for everyone, of course, so let's, let's really figure out who is winning, who is, who is, who is losing, and minimize the, the amount of losers and figure out a way that we can sort of um, uh, lead us all into a, a better, more digital future. So. Perfect segue. <laughs> Everyone needs to get involved in the decision about how we control our data, who controls it. Look at data trusts and other standards that are being developed around AI and data right now. Um, because data governance has come up, uh, pretty much all of us mentioned it. It's one of the most important things to think about, but not only about how that's being done, but how do we as individuals uh, adequately understand what we are agreeing to when we share our data and how can we uh, select the context and the ways our data can be used. We need to simplify that process, not just for people who have cognitive differences, but for all of us. I know I signed away a lot when I agreed to the Honk app today, uh, but I didn't read it. It was too long. Uh, and so we, we can't have those kinds of ways that we give permission. We need to create a new process, and everyone can get involved in that. Thank you for that. Kate? Yeah, I think, I think as I made the point, AI is neither good nor bad. It's what we make it, and it's what we program it, and biases we put into it. But I think as leaders, as future generations here, it's, it's data. It's all ones and zeros. So what is our expectation of privacy with those ones and zeros that may not be traditional? It may not be just credit card numbers and addresses. It could be images, it could be your backyard, it could be whatever. But I think that's, I think training for the users of the, the engineers of the top of mind is that what we're bringing to market and what we're utilizing to make our communities better meets those standards, but also at the same time, it's it's protected, and it can't just be we do a lot of protection for your credit card information. That same type of protection needs to be across all of your data, your images, your backyards, and your right to privacy. I think that's something that we as a society really need to work on and establish boundaries and guidelines around, because I think there's a lot of good there, but there also with that data being out there, we also need to protect that data a lot better, especially as it gets to third parties. 
Thank you. Professor? I think I've said all I had to say. I'll, I'll yield my, the time back to the break. If that's okay. I think I'm just going to yield the time back to the break and <laughs> say thank you to all for being patient with my slump, somewhat long talk. So. Yeah. Thank you so much. And the professor actually wants to end this very quickly because he wants you to go and pre-order his book. Um, <laughs> professor, thank you. I really enjoyed your, your comments. Uh, to everyone, we just, uh, Pina, yeah. we, were the, we were the first. Yeah. We were the first. We broke the ice yeah. and on time. Yeah. So thanks, everybody, for your participation. You gave us a lot to think about. Yeah. Uh, thank you to our panelists. We have a, a small token of appreciation, uh, our students. We'll, we'll make sure you get them. And also, I think it shows your exceptional chairing skills because you got us back on time, yeah, right? Uh, so thank you all very much. And now it's time to start having more fun with the robot. So outside, um, there will be a demonstration uh, from the MFE team on you'll get to meet Spot. And of course, Spot will be with us throughout the day, but this will be a first hello, meet and greet. And there's lots of um, also snacks and refreshments for you, so please help yourselves. If you need to go to the bathroom, um, it's across the hall. Uh, there are um, bathrooms there and then also throughout the school, but um, across. And then uh, if you have any questions on anything throughout the day, feel free to flag any one of us down and the students are all um, milling around and uh, are being very helpful. So thank you again. A big round of applause.
glass of water. For it's there, sorry. Yeah. All right. Good. Okay, welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a good break and had a chance to meet Spot. Of course, Spot is going to be with us throughout the day, so we'll have much more time to interact with him and the team at MFE. Uh, and now, on to panel two. And this one is very close to my heart. We'll be talking about AI for the future of legal practice. And I'm very proud that I have one of our very own here from Osgood, my dear colleague, Jonathan Penny, who's going to be chairing it. And John, I'm going to have to say a few things about you too, OK? You're good? All right. So uh, John uh, started here at Osgood in uh, July 2020. And he's also a visiting scholar at Harvard's Institute for Rebooting Social Media, a faculty associate at Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, and a longtime research fellow at the Citizen Lab based at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Now, he's a native of Hal Halifax, and we're happy that you're here with us in uh, in Ontario, he has studied law at Columbia Law School as a Fulbright Scholar and at Oxford University as a Mackenzie King Scholar, one of the very best, I do agree there. Um, he holds a doctorate in information, communication, and the social sciences from the famous Oxford Internet Institute at the University of Oxford, and uh, he was at Balliol College in 2016 and uh, love Balliol. Uh, before joining Osgood, he taught law at Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University and spent time as a senior research fellow at the Technology and Social Change Project at the Harvard Kennedy School's Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy, and as a research affiliate of Princeton Center for Information Technology Policy. John's research and teaching expertise lies at the intersection of law, technology, and human rights with strong interdisciplinary and empirical dimensions. From established technologies like the internet and social media to emerging ones like AI and machine learning, he aims to understand the legal, ethical, and human rights implications of technology and its role in public and, pro and private sectors. And, um, you know, he spans a host of different disciplines. He's also widely recognized across different media, and there's many here, and I won't list them all. Um, also, his uh, research on privacy and chilling effects was chronicled by Harvard Magazine, and he won the Rydenberg Kerr Paper Award in 2020. Uh, and the list goes on and on here, and um, he also serves on various boards, so he has that governance expertise, and uh, I really can't think of anyone more able to uh, lead the charge on this panel, and we're delighted that you're here with us, John, so welcome. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Pina. Um, that, I mean, really that goes, you went, you've gone far too over, <laughs> um, and I feel that the panelists that I'll be now briefly introducing, uh, if I were to give the same introduction to each of them, we would have no time to talk about AI and the future of legal practice, which is um, the fantastic and really important and timely topic that we'll be speaking to in this panel. Um, it is great to be here, um, and I want to thank Pina for putting this together, and Ashley and, and all organizers. I think uh, it's such an important uh, and critical discussion to be having at a really exciting time uh, for AI and society uh, and the legal profession. Um, my very distinguished um, panelists here um, will be speaking to a range of, I think, really exciting and cutting edge research and work across a number of different sectors affecting uh, the legal profession, AI, and society. Um, I'll start by just a brief introduction. 
Uh, to my left, I have Professor Sari Graben, who is an Associate Professor and Associate Dean Research and Graduate Studies at Lincoln Alexander School of Law uh, at Toronto Metropolitan University, who really does interesting and I think cutting edge work at the intersection of law, uh, technology, and public policy. I'm really looking forward uh, to her insights uh, today, and all of you should as well. Um, we also have uh, just uh, past her, uh, Nye Thomas, who is the Executive Director of the Law Commission of Ontario. Uh, uh, the Law Commission has been also doing such important work right now uh, on a range of different questions. Uh, concerning AI, society, questions of regulation, questions of law, questions of ethics, what the legal profession should do, what we should do as a society, and good governance when it comes to some of these important emerging technologies. And so we'll be hearing from him um, as well. Welcome, Nye. Uh, a little bit further down, we have, of course, uh, she goes without saying, Pina D'Agostino, who has organized this fantastic uh, conference uh, and has done so much important work on IP, uh, and technology and law, and now uh, is really leading the way here at Osgood on uh, a range of different AI and society projects, not just research. She's a leader uh, in teaching. Uh, she's a leader on bringing important actors together like we're seeing today, and so we'll be hearing from her as well. Uh, thank you, Pina. And lastly, we have Ryan Wong, um, an associate at Smart and Bigger, who is really doing interesting work in the legal profession and in, in his legal practice and we'll be hearing from him on some really important again cutting edge uh, ideas uh, and ways of uh, thinking about uh, AI in the legal practice. So without further ado I'd like to welcome the panel um, and I'll start off with with a with a kickoff question to each of you and we'll try to keep the first sort of question around uh, at 10 minutes you, you see I may give a, a signal or two um, and the question that I'll pose to all of you is, in your own professions in law, what has been your experience with AI and the power it has to shape the future of legal practice? Um, sorry, go ahead. So, thank you for inviting me to join this wonderful, distinguished panel. Um, I think. I'll just start with saying how I came to uh, this work because I didn't originally start out in this field. I came out a little bit of an STS studies, science and technology in relation to other uh, research areas, mostly around indigenous peoples and risk. Um, but I joined Lincoln Alexander um, to form the law school uh, several years ago. And in doing so, we had a very, very in-depth discussion starting back in 2017-18 as to what would a law and technology curriculum look like. And part of that was definitely AI um, as well as other technologies. Uh, and that discussion was quickly put into coursework, right? Because everybody in uh, the academy knows in some ways you just have to get it done. You have to roll out the type of curriculum that you think you're going to need um, and you're going to work with that. And so we rolled out a mandatory curriculum um, for our students. And based on the curriculum that other faculties were putting in across the world to address the issue. And the impact of AI on that has been um, so impactful because it's really hard to teach in law school. Um, we bit off something uh, so important, so needed, but so difficult to deliver that we are in a constant um, process of creativity. And I think that other schools are too because I've gone out um, in this work that I've been doing to help you know, lead and to um, strengthen up our curriculum. What are other schools doing? How are they actually delivering this curriculum as well? And so what we've found is that most schools are putting some specialized curriculum in place or some um, broad curriculum in place, but no matter what, are having a difficulty delivering that at the JD level. And why that is, um, I, I can go into some details on what is needed in, what I think is needed in the future of uh, legal pedagogy um, for this area, but the challenges come from the, I guess the debates we're having as to whether technology is something that is new to law 
or it's just another challenge that law can overcome. And AI is the penultimate example of that because it fundamentally changes, I argue, actually how we think about law. Uh, it is not something that we just uh, apply law in service to, right? So that is one component of AI and legal education. We are the lawyers who will help um, the creators of AI to overcome uh, the difficulties, but actually law itself and how we use AI in law and, and I would say in corporate decision making, in um, uh, arbitration, in, in all the ways that we actually do decision making, administrative decision making, the list goes on. Anywhere where there is decision making and AI is being implemented, we are at a moment where we haven't really identified exactly how law is changed by that. And, sorry, do I have 10 minutes all together to myself? Or? Yes, you do. Awesome. Okay, so, <laughs> so when we say um, that AI is doing decision making, is it mimicking law? And the answer is no. AI is not mimicking law and it is not mimicking humans. It is actually um, implementing a myth that we in law schools and as lawyers generally like to um, perpetuate or buy into or um, believe, which is that law is a series of rules that can be implemented in a, um, a logical and uh, foreseeable way. But really law is a series of exceptions and we don't know that exception occurs until it's over, right? Until we look backwards, which was the conversation um, at the panel prior to ours. So if we are really always engaging in the human decision making, the human exceptions, the, and the myriad of factors that we know from behavioral um, psychologists that when we make decisions, it is not just based on some rational basis that we've listed, although that is how we rationalize it, but law, our decision making is actually impacted by many subtle and maybe unknowable factors that go into that process. If we know that, and we know that's that's actually relevant in decision making, then we know that what AI is doing is it's crystallizing something, a series of rules that aren't necessarily applicable when done by a live actor, let's say. So for us, AI is actually changing <coughs> how do we structure the legal systems in which others operate. Secondly, I would say that AI really impacts the personalization of law, which also was a factor. That when we depersonalize law and we automate it, we actually contribute to a more isolated way of engaging with each other. And in doing that, by isolating ourselves, we've again undermined something so important in legal decision making or legal hearings, which I think the Law Commission report really identified but um, as, oh, there's something more to than, a hearing isn't just a place where we um, state our reasons back and forth, it's a place where we feel heard. And I don't know, I'm sure that wasn't eloquent enough, but it's capturing the essence of human trust. And we are putting our trust in decision makers who've been tr entrusted by others, and now we are altering that. We are depersonalizing trust, so it is not about the individual in front of us. Of course, we know it's about the system in front of us, right? We have, we have identified that the data is reliable. But even if we identify that the data is reliable, even if we know that it's not necessarily just about the bias data, which is a problem, of course, that we are keep addressing, but it's not just, we've, we've identified crystallized data crystallized decision making. And so when we depersonalize that, I think, and I love this field because you get to just look into the future and think about these things, I think we're asking whether we're changing the way that we um, contest that. Because an individual can no longer contest the system in an AI system. You must mobilize, you must organize, you must have a large data set of those who have been wronged with you. And so what we're doing is we're actually setting up a different legal system of contestation that is not individualized anymore. We have to um, bring collective action, you have to use data um, in that collective action, and you are got to get people angry in a way. And I wonder whether AI in the legal profession, we're not well, we haven't really thought about how decision making is changing the very legal systems in which we're operating. Okay, how much time do I have? Two, two three. Awesome. So I'll just briefly introduce what I think are the major challenges in legal pedagogy around this. 
Um, we all have heard, or anyone can read, just Google how do we teach law, how do we teach law and technology, and there are a plethora of blogs and comments and papers and um, uh, futurism. But I think that uh, they don't do justice to how, how disconnected that uh, work is from how we have practiced legal academies so far. So when we recruit faculty members who are able to engage with this, yes, they should, you know, we need, we need a wide swath. We need people like, um, I actually can't speak to the technical capabilities of anyone at the table, but you know, those who are maybe not as technically capable to get into the, um, the technologies with which we're working, but also you need those people who are technically capable, we know this, um, those who are the computer scientists, those are the coders, but we don't just need them because they understand. Those aren't insiders. An insider is actually someone who is trying to unpack the future of that technology. And investing in those faculty members that will lead the projects is key because the projects have such long time spans. To really get into the difficulties of the technology, you have a time span of maybe 10 years. You can't do a project in a couple of short years and understand it. You can critique it from the outside, you can get to know a lot of people, you can work with others, but really working in that design realm um, is immensely uh, time consuming and not necessarily valued in the academy. So I speak to many, many um, designers who are sprinkled all over the place in legal academy and they're doing work that's not necessarily understood by their peers because it doesn't look like traditional legal work or legal academic work. Um, and that needs a lot more support because when our students come in, their time spans are even shorter. They have three years to get in and figure out what law is, year one, right? We all know this, we've all gone through it if we're in law school, gone through law school, teach law school, that is about a year, and then you're really into getting a few specialized topics. If you wanna get involved with the project and get skilled, even if you have the computer science background, even if you have the capability, you have to be stepping into something that's ongoing. You can't start from, the, from scratch within law school. And so the training of the generation to come um, who can engage with this is critical, and yet we haven't really thought about what are the supports to put in place. That's it. And in time. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's perfect. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Graben. Uh, some really, uh, I think, important insights there. Something about the importance of technical and technological skills, mm -hmm. um, both for those in the academy, but also the importance of these these for, for students going forward, something we're thinking about at Osgood with our current curriculum reform um, processes. Um, Nai, same question to you. Uh, what has been your experience with AI and the power it has to shape the future of the legal profession? Um, first, I'll tell you a little bit about my organization. Uh, we're the Law Commission of Ontario. Um, we're actually located upstairs. Um, we're an independent legal policy think tank. And in the last couple of years, we've been doing a lot of work around AI regulation, AI and human rights, AI and privacy, AI and due process, and how you uh, think about AI governance, uh, keeping in mind some of these fundamental legal principles. And a lot of our work um, is, is organized around that. Um, first, I'll tell you about how AI is currently being used in the justice system, because it's actually being used more than people may appreciate. Um, the cutting edge of a lot of AI in the public sector and injustices in the criminal justice system, predictive policing systems, algorithms and AI systems that make recommendations on bail or sentencing, uh, biometric facial recognition systems that are used for surveillance. AI has been used uh, to determine government benefits, access to government services. AI has been used in all kinds of different regulatory uh, contexts, uh, most notably um, in the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States, but also it's beginning to, to be used elsewhere. Um, AI is used obviously in all different forms of um, screening applications, whether it be employment stuff, education stuff, a whole different series of things. So it's, it's not all in Canada, um, but it's, it's, it's coming. And if we're talking about bracing for impact, this is the impact, these are the implications we may be, we may be thinking about. There are a lot of disparate applications you know, uh, employment screening is obviously not the same as bail, it's not the same as, you know, determining uh, government benefits. The through line, legally, however, through a lot of these systems are, a lot of them affect human rights, a lot of them affect privacy, 
lot of them affect uh, due process issues, so how you challenge decisions. So a lot of work that my organization and others are doing are thinking about how you uh, protect, promote these transcendent legal principles across these different, these different applications, irrespective of whether they're the public sector, private sector, criminal justice, civil justice, you know, employment law, immigration, you name it. And that's the work that we're doing. Um, we talk about access to justice and AI. First thing you need, you need to know about is access to justice in Canada. And as you may know, there is in fact uh, an access to justice crisis in Canada. It's expensive, it's slow. Um, there's unequal access to services, unequal access to decision making. Law of decision making is subjective. It's opaque, it's often racialized. Um, there are extraordinarily poor metrics of justice uh, system decision making. We don't know a lot about how the system actually works because it's so decentralized. Uh, legacy, excuse me, data systems are so poor, it's even hard to track the, the, the travels of a single client through the justice system. So there's a lot wrong with, the just, with justice in Canada. There's an access to justice crisis. And of course, in my field is you know, justice, but it could be talking about the healthcare system, could be talking about a lot of other areas where the same kinds of issues apply. If you lay AI on top of the justice system, you can see the potential. Um, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. Faster decision making, cheaper decision making, greater access to, to decision makers. Uh, in a perfect world, uh, fair decisions, uh, decisions where bias is not a feature of decision making, but rather bias is identified and, and uh, decisions are, are fair across different communities and, and stuff. Even things like um, uh, AI uh, language technology, um, simple translation technology has an potentially has an extraordinary impact in the justice system because it's so difficult uh, for people to communicate um, in languages that may not be English or French in the, in the justice system. So the potential is there uh, to really improve the system. Um, there's a quote from an American academic uh, that kind of captures the potential that I, I really, really like. It's from a guy, uh, professor, I think he's at uh, University of Pennsylvania. Kerry Coglianese, he says, AI has the potential to crack the code of mass adjudication. And for an access to justice advocate like myself and John and others, it's really exciting. There's really, really potential, great, great deal of potential. The problem, of course, is that a lot of the issues with AI have been revealed in the justice system as well. Racialized decision making, uh, mass surveillance, um, problems with you know, the black box and opaque decision making, problems with being your ability to challenge decisions, problems with explanations. A lot of the issues we, we know uh, are, are uh, features of some AI systems are exacerbated when it comes to justice because that's where you're contesting individual rights and, and, uh, and the like. So the question is, you know, how do you, how do you balance this stuff? How do you maximize the benefits of AI while minimizing the potential harms? Can I just do a time check? Just see. Okay. So the current, um, current uh, prevailing thinking, and I'll, I'll say at the outset, I'm actually very optimistic about this. Um, and and there tends to be a pessimism and cynicism about AI and a lot of the justice system because of the, because of the law of the worst case scenarios, because a lot of the demonstrable harms of it, you know, the early implementations of AI and algorithmic technology in a whole host of uh, contexts, most notably in criminal justice, but that's not the only, that's not the only area. And that, that uh, pessimism has infused a lot of the analysis of, of AI, uh, AI systems. My own view is actually quite optimistic, um, and it's because there is uh, an extraordinary amount of work being done by my organization, many others, uh, public sector, private sector, NGOs, civil society organizations, around the concept of trustworthy AI. So what are the rules or practices or laws or uh, procedures you use to uh, ensure that AI systems, um, you, can, you can leverage the benefits of AI while minimizing the harms. And uh, it's not complete yet, it's an ongoing process. But if we just think about this uh, in terms of how much work is being done and the proactive work that has been done to identify um, these good practices, I'm actually quite optimistic. And I will cut it off there. So, thank you.
Okay, great. Thanks so much, Nai. Um, some really important thoughts on, on access to justice, we'll, and we'll come back to them. I think I'd like to follow up uh, on a few of those issues, but um, let's continue with Pina on the initial question. Same no. to you uh, and your experience. Um, uh, how can AI, uh, or what is your experience of AI and its, and its power to shape the future of the legal profession? Well, with Nai, I'm also optimistic, and uh, as an educator and uh, teacher and researcher within the university, I've really witnessed welcome change within the university and really, and I think the university is getting it right, in figuring out that we can't solve the complex questions on our own, not only within uh, you know, the Osgood realm or within uh, the faculty of science, engineering, business, we need all of us to come together. And uh, I really welcome that interdisciplinary approach. And I feel very at home here at York University because York, as you know, for a long time, we've said, you know, we're that interdisciplinary university. Well, I think on the AI front, we really are that. Uh, I was part of a, a task force. I was the co-chair with uh, Professor Elder, who you'll meet. Uh, later today, but essentially over the last three years, we did a lot of empirical work talking to faculty across the university, and we realized that there's a wealth of talent and incredible work being done within the pockets of the university, but we're not talking to each other. So we chronicled all of that in our report, which we launched just last year, Fostering the Future of Artificial Intelligence. And uh, in that, one of the recommendations was really to galvanize this strength and bring us all together to figure out these complex challenges. So I'm really happy that we've come to that moment, and later today we'll um, be hearing from VPRI Dr. Mira Sif on this. But I think, um, you know, and sorry, and I goes to your points, like these are complex questions, and you need the technical expertise with the legal, with the scientists all coming together. Um, and I really feel that the university needs to have a strong voice in leading these debates because the university, unlike many other um, you know, hubs, and not to slight anyone, but the university really, our business is that of education. Everything really starts and continues with education. And when we think about fostering the future of legal practice, like this is something that I really take to heart here at the law school. And I think we've also figured out that it has to be you know, human-centered, and we keep seeing a lot of these centers now pop up like mushrooms everywhere, right? I was just at Stanford Law School, and they just started uh, within the university high, right? Human-centered AI. Um, so every university that wants to count, that wants to be at the table, is getting it and is doing something. So I think we also need to be talking to one another, and I'm so glad that Ryerson well, uh, TMU is here at the table, and I welcome that collaboration, and I think the government welcomes that co collaboration. Um, also in my own work, so thinking back to research that, you know, I, um, for many times I thought I was like the, uh, I don't know, speaking ahead of my time, and I'm looking at Professor Weber. So back um, at the University of Oxford, Professor Weber was the PI leading us, and I was, you know, at the time just doing my doctoral work. But one of the projects was really working as a lawyer with computer scientists and social scientists on data governance. So this was 2001. And I remember speaking to many a conference room, and literally I'd see eyes glossing over rolling over, and I just felt like burrowing myself into a hole, because it was just people didn't have the appetite to hear from, from me, right, or know about the issues. And so when we are, and even now in many ways, um, there's, we're somewhat refractory to talk about data and the systems that are being deployed in terms of even the ownership question. Who should own, access, and control the data? We often uh, talk about, of course, privacy is important, cyber is important, human rights, but these are all slices. We need more interdisciplinarity even within the law to deal with these issues. So that's something that we tackled firsthand back in 2001, and we looked at the health uh, ecosystem and the electronic health record at the time. And we talked about those who are disenfranchised, and of course, Dr. Roberts talked about this, those who are sidelined by technology. And guess what? They're the patients, 
right? The patients themselves, who's talking to them? We did that, and we conducted many workshops. Um, so I feel like all, it, I think it's time now to also resurrect a lot of that work and bring it more um, you know, into the fore, especially now with all these groups mushrooming. So I welcome that. And I've always been intrigued by how technology, and in this case we're talking about AI, but any technology, and how it interrogates the existing social structures and the existing legal regimes and how the law needs to play catch up. Is there a way for the law to anticipate this? How can we train our students to do better? Um, so thinking of this, something that you may have seen also is AIDA, as I like to call it, the Artificial Intelligence and Data Act. And there, I think, is a case in point where it's a welcome introduction from the federal government. But again, you see that we're looking primarily to privacy, right? We're not looking at the ownership question that I just noted. So what do we need to do? Do we need to uh, do some surgery on other legal regimes? Come up with sui generis legislation? What are the tools that we have in place to make things better? Now, um, this event is uh, a case in point. So there's been a proliferation of AI events. I think there's like another few going on today, but you're at the right one. Uh, and I really believe that uh, when we first started Bracing for Impact, this was February of 2018, we were leading the charge here at the university. And so our goal is to plan to continue to do that, but of course, with more and more partners uh, together. Now, I love, sorry, you know, you're talking about curriculum, uh, you know, development and legal pedagogy. That's something that keeps me up at night. <laughs> it really does because I really dream and want that perfect class, that perfect program where that student can shine. And I'm looking to Ryan right beside me, right? And so, like, I've really... Um, tried to um, you know, revolutionize or in, in innovate the con curriculum in some way. And um, I think one of the initiatives that you know, I'd like to mention, and it's a nice segue going to Ryan, is the Innovation Clinic. So this is a clinic that I started back in 2010 and really in partnership with leading law firms because yes, it is about access to justice and fairness and there isn't a lot of that in the law as we know. And especially when we look to commercializing intellectual property, when you have that student that comes to you and they have that bright idea, what do we do? How do we help them out? So I rolled up my sleeves and with the law firms, we decided we're gonna start this clinic where we help students, we help faculty across the university to start up and think about how to protect, leverage their ideas to innovate our Canadian ecosystem, right? So that started in 2010 and uh, I crunched the numbers and it's pretty amazing. So these are just, you know, we need to have some metrics too, right? So we actually undercut almost $2 million that would have otherwise been billable. So we had our law firms devote so many countless hours working together with our students who are the leaders really helping um, you know, these, these clients. And that amounts to about 6,000 billable hours. So I'm really proud of this project. And so I mentioned 2010. And so this is where AI kicks in. In comes Isaac Newton, right? Or Putin, as we put it, IP, right? And so we figured that over the time, we learned a few things. So 10 years of running a clinic, guess what? You get a lot of repeat questions. So answering the same questions over and over again, we thought, why don't we harness all of this data that we're getting, right, with the power of AI to build a chatbot, to automate in many ways this process and to make accurate information more accessible. Because I don't know how many of you, you know, when you come across IP issues in the news, oh gosh, it drives me crazy. There's a conflation constantly between what is a copyright, what is a patent, what is a trademark, and if I have to be repeating that all the time, right, it gets a bit uh, mundane. So that's really, so it starts with those bedrock questions to allow, to build a chatbot that anticipates them and encourages um, people to come, the public, it's free, 
and they can access this resource and we keep on building it. Um, and here, uh, two of the communities, again, we talk about you know, those disenfranchised and those sidelined by the system. It really, when we look at women, female entrepreneurs, female inventors, and they often are uh, you know, not at the table or they don't have access. Many of them are not you know, the patent filers. And I'm looking to Costantinos uh, Yorgaras at the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. And of course, his team has done incredible work uncovering this data. Um, so women were more sensitive to looking at um, you know, that data and as well the indigenous communities. And so Paul Saparis, when you were chatting this morning on your project and how you help in, in inspire, that's something that um, you know, we need more and more of these collaborations to work together to build accurate data that is accessible and can help. And so I think that's a good segue to Ryan, because Ryan has been working with me uh, on the chatbot since its inception. So I'll pass it over to you to chat a bit more about it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, before I get into the demo, I uh, actually, we would need the, OK. Um, but before I get into the demo, I want to speak briefly about uh, the three-step process we take to develop the, the chatbot. Uh, the first step is curating the question bank. Uh, and so these questions come from a variety of sources, and as Professor D'Agostino has mentioned earlier, a lot of these questions come from our innovation clinic clients, and we really want to target those questions and build those uh, questions in first. Um, we also have sources on the internet that we use, like the SIPO and WIPO databases, uh, and these come in the form of FAQs. So we also build the, the questions in there as well. To, to help us broaden our set of questions and also to reach a, a wider audience. Once we have our question bank, uh, we build these questions in the chatbot as intents. By intents, we mean concepts or ideas that are underlying the question itself. Uh, and so we're really focusing on the information of, of what the user is intending to get from that question. Uh, we train the chatbot to, to five to 10 alternative questions to let them uh, learn what the intent is really about. And so let's say, for example, if we have a question like, what is a trademark? Uh, an alternative question will be, can you explain what a trademark is? Uh, the last step is, is testing. Uh, this is the area where students help out a lot. Um, we ask a group of students to, to do two things. The first thing is to test the intents themselves and make sure that the intents are working properly. Uh, the second part is testing the, uh, the questions in different ways and, and trying to ask uh, the same question in a variety of different ways, as many ways as possible, and see if the intent is still going to be able to answer that question. So now we're going to go on to the demo uh, itself. Uh, so, but I want you to imagine uh, an inventor that has an idea uh, that they would like to patent and commercialize for, for market entry. They have some IP knowledge, but not enough to really know exactly what they need to do. Uh, and so they find the IP Oz good website and they go into the chatbot. And one of the first questions they usually ask is, uh, oh. how do I get, sorry. It's always. Okay, so the first question will be uh, what is a patent? So here the chatbot gives us an answer, uh, a definition of a patent. Uh, second question would be why should I get a patent? Um, Inventors are really trying to figure out the, the commercial aspects of a patent. And so one of the questions they would also inevitably ask is, why should, what should I consider before getting a patent? Really doing amazing work there. Um, a cost is always important, so how much does a patent cost?
And uh, finally, how do I file for a patent? So as you can see here, most of our answers actually include a link in that one of our goals for the chatbot uh, is to direct our users to more credible sources and reliable sources on the internet. So most of these links are actually going to SIPO and WIPO pages. Uh, and so that's something that we want to continue on doing and include more links to, to our answers uh, and hopefully also include more answers to government pages as well. Uh, the great thing about a chatbot is that it will continue to grow. Uh, we're always looking for, for grants and funding to help us support us in, in that ma manner uh, and to also uh, maintain the chatbot as well as support the, the students to, to do this work for us. And so uh, really the, the more data we put in, the, the more chatbot will, will learn and develop and be able to answer uh, more and more questions as we go. So that's, uh, that's everything. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Brian. That is uh, fantastic. Um, I think the the I think the only way we can take this to the next level is if we get Spot in here asking questions of the <laughs> chatbot. Uh, that would be sort of like the only next level that you could take it. But that is absolutely fascinating, and and you can see already um, some of the really important uh, and I, when I said cutting edge in, in initiatives that that Pina has been leading. I think this is a, a fantastic example of that. So we, we've had a, a number of, I think, really important and interesting threads here from each of the different uh, uh, panelists, and I'd like to pull a, a few of them. So we'll, we'll, we'll move to, to question to Q&A now. Um, there are both microphones here. If you have a question, please um, stand up and, and we'll field questions from the crowd. I have a few questions and we'll also be keeping an eye uh, on the live feed for questions from there as well. But, um, and probably only other rule of, uh, of, of moderation in, in Q&A is that, again, just to reference, if Spot wanders in here and wants to take the mic, we'll have to defer uh, to Spot as well. Um, but let me come back to uh, uh, an issue that I flagged earlier that, that Nye talked about, uh, and I think it'd be important for us to follow up a little bit on it, and that's access to justice. So I'd love to hear from the panelists a little bit more on this count. Um, about how AI can either enable or undermine uh, access to justice. Uh, go ahead, sorry. Do you want to start with Nye first? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Nye. And, and maybe since you, you have talked about some of the promises and peril uh, on this count, if you have any specific ideas about what the legal profession in particular can do yeah. to ensure that potential and success rather than some of the, the risks and peril that you, that you mentioned. Sure, I mean, I, I, I talked about um, being optimistic, talked about uh, the potential. Um, that's contingent. You know, the potential, the benefits of AI ain't gonna happen by themselves. Um, it's gonna take work to get there, and it's gonna take, in my view, regulation to get there. Um, you know, notwithstanding all the, all the positive, uh, proactive efforts that are going on, um, around the country, around the world, in, in kind of the trustworthy AI space, of which there is a lot. Um, ultimately, what, uh, if you're concerned about human rights, if you're concerned about privacy, if you're concerned about due process, if you're concerned about the ability of people to challenge decisions that may affect them, um, you're talking about a form of legal regulation at, at, at a certain point. Um, I am not a fan of ethical AI, which is a term of, uh, from, I, you know, it's a little, little bit of a cheap shot. I'm in favor of legal AI. Um, and uh, it's an important distinction policy on the policy space and in the legal space. There have to be certain legal parameters uh, governing AI systems. Not all of them are the same. I do not believe that every AI system has to be subject to the full panoply, the full Cadillac model of legal regulations. That's because not every AI system has the same impact. There are some systems, however, which can be identified that have greater impact on vulnerable communities, on legal rights, constitutional rights, human rights, privacy issues, surveillance issues. Those can be identified and those should be subject to higher standards. Um, it's possible to do that. In fact, there's a lot of work in my organization and others working in all different kinds of uh, tools for identifying such things. I'll just make a pitch for us. Um, the Law Commission is working with the Ontario Human Rights Commission and the Canada Human Rights Commission, working on an um, AI human rights impact assessment. 
uh, first in Canada, I think, uh, at least I'm going to say so, um, that, you know, helps uh, whether it be governments, it's work in progress that helps either governments or helps uh, organizations think about um, the potential impact uh, on human rights of, of their systems. Not every system is going to be the same. Traffic management system is a lot different than a bail system, and they should be treated differently. Um, but that's, that's what it takes, um, in my view. It's not the only thing it takes, but it's a necessary condition for um, achieving, achieving uh, trustworthy AI and leveraging some of these benefits while minimizing some of the harms. Great. Thanks so much, Nye. Uh, anyone else want to jump in on that question? If not, I can, I can move on. All right, let, let's do it. So um, it was great to hear some optimism uh, on this count for the potential for AI and society and the legal profession in particular in teaching. And I too, I'm optimistic. I think law students are really well placed um, because we're, we teach students to be comfortable with uncertainty. And I think um, the most interesting and toughest and most difficult questions today are interdisciplinary, as you mentioned, uh, Pina. But to get to that optimism, to see that sort of um, bright future, there are challenges in, the, in this context. And so I'd love to hear um, panelist Pina or, or Ryan speak to this. Um, what are some challenges for teaching legal Their technology, um, for all the good reasons that we always have, really, um, incorporated what would be called legal practice or legal tech technology into our teaching in some limited fashion, you know, quick law uh, being one of them, right, the easy one. Um, that did change the way we practiced. That incorporation um, requires quite a bit of investment, I would say, in thinking through why are we working with this um, to train students to use it for legal practice. So I like to think, you know, um, an AI, access to justice, and I just want to link these two, uh, law school curriculum definitely wants to look at access to justice. Uh, access to justice um, and AI on family law is, in some ways, in my mind, a no-brainer, right? It's the most expensive um, uh, engagement with law that most people um, have some engagement with, right? You know, 50% of the population divorces, 50% of the population needs it. So uh, if we think about how we would develop or um, incorporate that into our training, we are engaging with um, either quick acceptance you know, un not able to really critique it or understand it, um, and who is well positioned to do so. Is every student to be trained on this AI technology and then engage with it, or do we select a few students who are very capable and well prepared, or is this just our grad students? Um, you know, I think we have some key questions around what are we doing with this um, AI technology in the curriculum? For positive. I'm not totally negative. I just want to know, you know, even for positive purposes. Yeah, go ahead. Peter. Yeah, no, just to add, I think um, I think we could train and educate our students to learn almost anything. I think the issue lies with who is doing the teaching, right, and how it's being done. So, and there's nothing special now, and you know, we're rolling out AI curriculum, but you know, it's the same in any other area of the law that has to tackle the new questions. An example, um, you know, stem cells, right? I can't imagine someone writing an article on stem cells and the law without actually talking to a stem cell scientist or teaching about it. So I'm actually married to a stem cell scientist, and I was horrified at reading much of the literature that was springing up, you know, at the beginning of, uh, you know, when it was sexy to write about it. Um, you know, I, who live with one, you know, I'm scared to do it. So I think we can, um, you know, we need to work more collaboratively with the experts in those different fields. So whether it's stem cells, whether it's AI, so there you bring in the coders, the computer scientists, and work collectively together to put the curriculum together and also have, you know, we, we do this a lot in the law school, like guest lectures, but things where we don't just feel that, you know, we're know-it-alls in our own little domains. And I think that's, uh, you know, talking about ethics. We're taught this in the rules of professional conduct, even when in our practice. If we don't know an area, it is incumbent on us to find the expert and bring them in to ad properly advise our clients, right? 
and I'm, I'm glad at least see our students are, are nodding, but I think that's also that ethical obligation we need to discharge even in our teaching and in our curriculum development. Absolutely. Uh, Ryan, did you want to? Yeah, I, I think I can come from a, a more of a student perspective here. Um, I think AI as a subject area is really diverse and really, really broad. And so uh, for a student, I think it's kind of daunting to, to get into to AI law as, as an area. Uh, and so having conferences like these where students can come in and participate and be a part of it, I think is a, a big step forward. Great, and I, I see we have a, a question from the, the audience. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to build on this, thank you everyone. So I'd imagine that if you had a room full of students in other disciplines, in the social sciences across this university and in the technical sciences, they would have similar conversations. Like, this stuff is interdisciplinary. How do we get into a room with people talking about the same topics, but in the different languages and subject-specific uh, subject you know, terms of art that are necessary for this? So my question, I guess, is how do we, and, and what is the role, I guess, of the university in supporting the kind of interdisciplinarity that we need that bridges, because right now it falls on the individual academics yeah. who are mentoring the individual students to build their networks, to bridge those networks, and so that labor gets intense. Yeah. And it burns the people out uh, I've seen, my work is in health and AI. It, to try to do that work is impossible on top of the, your regular workload. So what are the kinds of ways that we can see the institutions supporting these uh, and creating, helping us create these interdisciplinary opportunities for our students? Do you have spitballing? That's a great question. That is a great question. <laughs> um, well, I have some ideas. Um, so the university has already started trying to bring us together, more on the research front, right, with the CERCs that we've had, and you know, I'm part of a team, and really fostering that interdisciplinarity within the university. We haven't done that yet, though, on curriculum development, and I think that's where you're getting at, Ian, right? And so to do that, we need resources, and we need time. Um, because as you know, I mean, many of my colleagues, I see some here in the room, will know that our time is more and more fractured, and more and more is being asked of us, um, you know, with the, the current challenges we face. So I think if the university can help us on that regard and maybe have a grant for you know, curriculum development or we call it micro-credentials, whatever we wanna do to get us together and figuring out how we innovate in our curriculum. Absolutely, and by the way, I should say that that's just not any uh, questioner from the crowd. <laughs> that's Professor Ian Stedman from the School of Public Policy and Administration at York U. So um, thank you, Ian, for the great question. Um, uh, did anyone else want to jump in on Ian's? Okay, so how about we've got maybe uh, a two minutes left. Any final questions from the crowd? Okay, great, great. Go ahead, Hi. please. Well, first off, thanks guys, everybody. It was really entertaining listening to what you had to say. Um, as a university student, I kind of have a perspective in my undergraduate degree of like learning about AI, but not uh, the implications that it might have on society. And I've only remembered one time in my whole degree so far that we've talked about, for example, a sampling bias of like doing, looking at cases and uh, the, like, the racial injustice that that prompts. So I'm just curious as a student, like what can we do to like, uh, like ex generate more exposure to stuff like that because we don't look at it. Sorry, he's got an answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't have an answer in the sense that you're going to be satisfied. No problem. I think that um, there is a big problem in law, which is our data sets are not as um, uh, easily accessible um, and uh, recognizable for analysis in Canada relative to the U.S. So even when we look to train students, we're using U.S. case law because it has been scrubbed and um, placed into um, usable data sets, but, you know, uh, and in Canada we have a lot more complexity on the ownership, um, the use, and um, uh, the innovation in relation to those data sets. So I, I think that one of our, and this was one of the topics on the, of the panel, but um, it's really about um, taking that head on. We really have to um, advocate much more strictly, um, t yep, uh, to government, um, and within our own uh, academies, about how we're gonna use that data set of law. 
Okay, I think that's a great uh, note you. to finish on. So uh, if we could just uh, a round of applause to thank our panelists for our lovely uh, discussion. So we're at the lunch break. So um, what we'll do now is, uh, I believe there are, oh, they're already, I see them all set up there. So you're welcome to grab um, some lunch and uh, take it back to your seats. So we'll do that in about 15 minutes, take another bathroom break, and then we'll uh, resume with our lunch and keynote. So bon appétit tout le monde.
similar brand in the sense that you, you were calling, I think, for games and recommendations that I would really like you to call for me far from the house. I thought I would call, like, I don't want to be the one that calls the vigilance or something. I would be, so having you guys take that time to sort of robot call and call for me to really be the one to call. Sure. Yeah. Yeah.
All right. Okay. So I'll just. Yeah. Okay, everyone, if you could please take your seats. We're going to start up again. So please make sure you have something to eat. All right, and welcome back to uh, all of you joining us uh, from our live stream. Again, just a reminder that we are monitoring the chat. So if there are any questions or comments, uh, do feel free to let us know. So uh, back on AI. Now, one of the uh, familiar stories, right, that we often hear on AI is that what if AI becomes evil? And of course, Hollywood has reminded us uh, you know, of this with the Terminator movie. So in all other, um, I mean, there was even some comments earlier um, during our, our panels. Now, it's important to remind ourselves that, you know, the robots are not the only evil ones. Humans, too, can be evil. And so it's important to see what we can learn from history, right? So history is not a word that I've heard yet come up, but history is, is key to see how we don't make the same mistakes, right? And there are important lessons to be gleaned from history. And you know, one of these, you know, the lowest points for me in humanity was the Holocaust. And uh, you know, that should never happen again, nor should any sliding against a people because of their differences ever happen. And we heard uh, earlier from uh, Dr. Roberts on this. Now, in his work, Ghetto Copyright, uh, the title of his talk, Professor Zemer highlights the failure of yet another uh, legal system, and in this case, it's modern copyright, to do its part to redeem the atrocities of the Holocaust. So what I'll do is I'll first introduce uh, Professor Zemer. Very um, thank you for joining us all the way from Israel. And uh, then introduce uh, Justice Rothstein, who has also flown in uh, to be with us today from BC and to make some uh, comments. So Professor Lior Zemer, he is the Dean and Professor of Law at the Harry Radzner School of Law at Reichman University in Herzliya. His scholarship focuses on intellectual property, jurisprudence, and European Union law. He is the author of The Idea of Authorship in Copyright, arguing for a more inclusive approach, and there is that important word, um, so inclusive approach to the public in the creation process. He has published several edited collections in the field of IP and numerous articles in leading law review journals, and you know, there's a whole bunch, I won't go through them, and has also taught students at every level in undergrad, graduate, across the world. Um, he's the founder and director of the MA program in law, technology and business innovation, so also a trailblazer on the curriculum front, and which is an innovative and multidisciplinary program bridging between exactly what we were chatting about earlier, right? Law, science, technology, and business innovation for both law and non-law graduates. He's held academic positions at the faculties of law in Leicester, Birmingham, and University College London, and has been a regular visiting professor here at Osgood, I'm proud to say, and also at Boston University School of Law. Now, prior to joining legal academia, he served as the assistant lawyer to Judge J.D. Cook at the European Court of First Instance, and Judge S. Von Barr at the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg. So, I think it's very appropriate that working with justices, we have a justice uh, beside you. Very appropriate that he'll be providing some keynote uh, commentary, and that is Justice Marshall Rothstein. Now, it's a tremendous honor to, for me to introduce one of my all-time favorite human beings on this planet and most brilliant legal minds, uh, recently retired from the Supreme Court of Canada and currently a partner at Osler's Vancouver office. 
On top of all the accomplishments, uh, which I shall relay momentarily, he is a dear friend of mine and the law schools and the university, and he is a cherished founding member of the IP Osgood Advisory Board for the last 14 years, and he gives so much of his time and passion to guide, mentor, and teach our students over the many years. Um, his latest appearance, you were in my business associations class. So what area of law has he not tackled? He's always there to help, coach, and advise our students. And in doing so, he does it with supreme natural intelligence, good cheer, and genuine care, despite his very busy schedule. Now, Justice Rothstein is one of Canada's most esteemed jurists. He served as Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada from 2006 until his retirement in 2015, and he has over 50 years of judicial and legal experience. His work has shaped the Canadian business law landscape, having authored more than 100 judgments and arbitral decisions on domestic and cross-border cases of commercial significance and complexity. So AI is a piece of cake now, right? He has broad ranging experience across many areas of the law, including dispute resolution, MA, uh, mergers and acquisitions, tax, competition, IP, and transportation issues in the energy sectors as well. He's a Winnipeg native and attended the University of Manitoba. And uh, anyone you ask, for those of you uh, who are not Canadian, anyone who comes from Winnipeg is super nice. And it's true. He's earned a BCom and an LLB and was called to the Manitoba Bar in 1966 before becoming a civil litigator in private practice. He was appointed Queen's Counsel in 1979, and for nearly three decades, he solidified his reputation as one of the country's leading counsel in numerous high profile cases. Now, Justice Rothstein was appointed to the Trial Division of the Federal Court of Canada in 1992, was elevated to the Federal Court of Appeal in 1999, and then finally at the Supreme Court of Canada in 2006. Justice Rothstein was also appointed a Companion of the Order of Canada in 2017. And he more recently even weighed in with an authoritative forward to uh, my latest book uh, as editor with Aviv Gaon, um, writing there that there will be many societal challenges due to AI, and we in the law need to be ready for them. His breadth of knowledge and deep insights span so many topics, including today's. So please, with that, uh, a very warm welcome to you both. Uh, for first, Professor Zemer will uh, take the podium, and then we'll hear from Justice Rothstein. Well, <clears throat> I'm delighted to be here and very excited. Thank you all for, for being here today. My talk is not about the future. It's about the past and how we should not repeat uh, past mistakes as well as taking them for future lessons. Now, this is the first time I'm giving this talk. Uh, I've been working on this topic for the past 15 years and I will be traveling Europe and the States in the coming year including in Auschwitz, in other museums, in other law faculties. There's some music accompanying the talk. I'll try to be as less sensitive as I can, but you might see me natural. Almost two decades ago, after the uh, last of my grandparents passed away, and took away many of the memories I was never told, I have found myself searching for more information about my origins. The information I have found was of the kind that words cannot express, thoughts cannot bear, and imagination cannot translate into reality. I have found information explaining my surname, my given name, ideologies I was exposed to, and my inner sensitivities, which I never, never tried to fully understand. 
my political views, my taste in music and art, nothing could predict I will choose law. My insistence to know more about my origins did not leave me. I began a journey which part of it I will share with you today. Art and music were always part of the language we talked. It was an unnegotiable fixture in my daily reality. I apologize if certain parts of my talk will take you to the information that my thoughts could not bear. In my talk today, law and copyright will explain and define this information. I will take you with me to the most unforgivable, unimaginable and inhuman copyright scene where personalities of people who work to the death tell us the most authentic story of the Holocaust and show us through their creative expressions how barbaric was Nazi Germany. This copyright scene has never been discussed in legal, in legal scholarship. I will share with you thoughts and information that no one told me they belong to the history of my family and the future of my own family. Only few legal debates were never fully opened in copyright scholarship. Ownership of works of arts, drama, music and literature created by Jewish prisoners in Nazi concentration camps and ghettos is one of these few. Most of these works do not have names. Vast literature exists on looted works of art stolen from Jewish families. This literature covers only one subset of the discourse on copyright and the Holocaust and distances itself from dealing with core proprietary issues relating to creative expressions made within the ghettos. My talk today aims to remedy this lack of awareness. I hope to open an uncomfortable debate on who should be the moral owner of works of art, music, drama and authorship that were created within the boundaries of concentration camps and ghettos. Theatres, artists and authors, orchestras and other groups of creative individuals were an integral part of the horrific environments facing prisoners in the ghettos. The absence of a global debate on the rights has created an anomaly that permits repositories of these works such as archives and libraries in Germany Austria and the Auschwitz-Birkenau Museum, as well as other private institutions such as auction houses and private dealers to claim ownership of these works and patronize their social and cultural life. Most authors and artists, including of these works, were murdered in gas chambers, ghettos, labor camps and from other morbidities. The Nazis' atrocities were documented in these works that shed light on the cultural life of those who could not have a different fate. As I said, legal scholarship to date has never debated rights in these works. In my research on this topic, I aim to open the debate, not to close it. I offer the first inquiry challenging the ownership paradigm of copyrighted works created within the ghettos. The uncomfortable findings of my inquiry draw attention to sensitive human issues and legal controversies that lacked basic human attention for over seven decades. This is the most difficult research I have ever written and I think will ever write. My talk today is my personal manifesto as second generation Auschwitz and other camps survivors and dedication and in dedication to the Zema, Uziel, Benny, Shikansky and Hanverger families who never came back. No one can imagine an orchestra playing at the entrance of the gas chambers in Auschwitz or Treblinka. No one can imagine a show for kids showing the numbers tattooed on their hands moments before their death. And no one can imagine an artist drawing these children last smile or hug from the mother or father who were took away to the gas chambers. The cultural scene in concentration camps and ghettos was astonishing, shocking and beyond words. The cultural scene allowed Jewish prisoners to reconnect to their personalities and 
create a copyright scene from hell. Given the lack of attention to this copyright scene, I dedicate over half of my talk to examples of this scene. These examples hide many copyright questions. The examples I chose today do injustice to every example I did not choose. Berlin was held at the concentration camp in France in 1941 for seven months. Under difficult conditions, he authored a painting of the camp, including the camp's watch watchtower and prison booth. Because no paper was available, Berlin used eggshells from the scrap Jewish inmates were given as food. He attached them to a wooden plate he found in the camp. In 1942, he was transferred to Auschwitz, where he was murdered with his wife. On January 2021, Berlin's drawing was auctioned in Jerusalem for the bidding price of $8,000. Countless prisoners composed Countless prisoners composed music even under the most horrific circumstances during the darkest days of the Holocaust. Some penned short songs while other, others embarked on major works of opera or symphonies. For over 30 years, Francesco Lottoro has made it his life work to collect, complete and reassemble these pieces of music and bring them to light. Figurine of the Devil is an example of a useful work of art made from almost nothing and by an unknown creator. It was manufactured in Auschwitz from ribbon and a piece of wire. With help from the resistance movement, the figurine was used to smuggle secret messages out of the camp. The figurine is held not by his legal own. As a prisoner in Auschwitz, Dina Gottlieb Bova Babit was forced by Joseph Mengele, the angel of death, to paint watercolors of the haggard faces of gypsy prisoners. Seven of the 11 portraits that saved Mrs. Babit and her mother were later discovered and displayed at the Auschwitz-Birkenau Memorial and Museum in Poland. Dina requested ownership of the 11 portraits before she passed away in 2009. But her petitions were denied. They are definitely my own paintings. They belong to me, my soul is in them, and without these paintings, I wouldn't be alive. Many attempts were made to reclaim Dina's ownership in the portraits, including a 2001 resolution of the House of Representatives and a call by President George W. Bush to make all efforts to assist Dina's legitimate copyright claim. The Auschwitz Museum, which considers the watercolors, the watercolor artworks to be its property, has argued that they are rare artifacts and important evidence of the Nazi genocide. Music was part of the everyday life in many ghettos and concentration camps. You arrive in Auschwitz, you prepare to go to the gas chambers, somebody puts a cello in your hands and you have a chance at life. Members of the orchestra lived with other musicians, musicians in wooden barracks known as the music block in Birkenau. They performed together much of the time near the crematoria. The Vilna Ghetto was known for its cultural scene. An association of authors and artists was established in the ghetto, which encouraged creativity and spread art and culture. The association organized fortnightly liter literary and artistic gathering. Over a cup of tea, 
in which lectures were given and artists' performances were presented, including recitals and singing in Yiddish and Hebrew. In February 1942, the musicians in the ghetto established an organization which had 50 members. These organizations held creative competitions and cultural events and assisted artists in difficulty. On 26 April 1942, the Ghetto Theatre opened the small city hall with a production of Shlomo Molcho, the presence, um, in the presence of the Judenrat, police, writers, artists and the general public. Performances and lectures were held on Sunday mornings for workers who returned late at night. There was also a puppet spectator. There was also a puppet theatre. In 1942, there were 120 performances before 38,000 spectators. The theatre was active until the liquidation of the ghetto. The ghetto was liquidated on September 1943. Those who survived the mass killing within the ghetto were sent to death camps. These cultural and intellectual activities were performed in the places where life stopped. No one can deny that culture in these deadly places did exist moments before entire Jewish communities that were once part of the everyday life of European cities vanished. All this was carried out while or close to the end of life. The, um, the orchestras, painters, artists created their copyrighted expressions while all these atrocities took place side by side to creating culture. Those who could take part in the cultural scene, in the ghettos and concentration camps were those who gave us the privilege to this, to see the creativity in extreme circumstances and gave us a glimpse of hope that few moments before brutal mass killing and genocide, some of the inmates in the camps saw a friction of culture. In certain ghettos, the cultural scene was so vibrant, it, was, it is unimaginable to see how vibrant was the cultural scene in, for example, Theresienstadt. גם הסופרים והציירים נתמכו בידי מוסדות הגטו. לפרנסתם הם ניסחו ואיירו מודעות שונות במימון היודנרד. הסופר היידי הנודע, יהושע פרלה, התפרנס מכתיבת מודעות למחלקת ההספקה של הקהילה. ולהצגה הדבר על פי תגור, בבית היתומים בניהולו של יאנוש קורצ'אק, חיבר ולדיסלב שלנגל. יותר ממילים, השראה. יותר מרגש, חוויה. All these works made the conditions for original creative expressions, conform to the categories of copyright law and standards of ownership. Yad Vashem published a portrait book drawn by 21 artists in ghettos and concentration camps during the Holocaust. The book elaborates on the characteristics of this form of art and presents the significance of these drawings as a means to perpetuate, commemorate and immortalize the artists and the subjects they drew. Museums around the world publicly present replications of drawings made by the 1.5 million children that were murdered in the Holocaust. Some of them add colors, colors, some sell the originals and some keep them with no possible restoration in the event of damage. Only few artists are still alive. Yehuda Bakon is 93. Born in Moravia, the Czech Republic, at the age of 14, he was deported to Auschwitz. Painting his reality was his way to remain normal. Living in Jerusalem, he continues painting his memories. We often discuss his paintings together, sometimes over the phone, sometimes in other mediums. His sketches and paintings from Auschwitz were never returned to him.
Music served as a cultural survival technique and as a means of psychological resistance. It helped overcome the life-threatening situation at the camp. One of the moving examples of, of music is Stille, Stille. Stille, Stille is quiet, Stille. quiet. In Yiddish, Stille, Stille, Lohme Schweige. The song is a lullaby of sorts, but a very unusual one. Traditional lullabies are meant to help. Mothers and fathers put their children to sleep. In this song, which was written in the Vilna ghetto, the child is asked to push in order to observe the disaster befalling the community. The lyrics were written by Schmerk, an author, and the melody was written by an 11-year-old boy, Alexander, later to be Alexander Tamir. The song was played by, ma by many, included in films and shows recorded for many purposes. There was an author for this song. Anita Wolfish, Anita Laska Wolfish, survived, survived both Auschwitz and Bergen Belsen and was accepted into the Auschwitz Women Orchestra. She played the cello. Wolfish landed in Britain after the war and co-founded the English Chamber Orchestra, performing as both a member and as a solo artist and toured internationally. I will get back to her later. Like Anita, on April 1943, Esther Bejerano was deported to Auschwitz. There, she volunteered to play accordion in the newly formed Women Orchestra of Auschwitz. She passed away last year at the age of 96. The Czech, the Czech composer Pavel Haas was, gift, was a gifted musician as he did for, for so many Jewish musicians across Europe, the Nazi onslaught brought about dramatic changes to his life and career. Performances of his works were banned. On December 1941, Hass was sent on a transport from Brennan to the Resenstadt, where he continued to compose. The bass Carol Berman performed the four songs he wrote in Theresienstadt in 1944 and frequently included the work in his post-war programs. Haas was deported to Auschwitz on October 19, 1944 and murdered in the gas chambers shortly after arrival. Haas' compositions are performed worldwide. Haas' death has left many of his compositions incomplete. Professor Michael Wolper of the Jerusalem Academy of Music completed several of them. One of the most famous theatres in the ghettos was Lilliput Troupe, run by the Ovitz family. The Ovitz family was a Jewish family of actors and musicians from Romania that performed in the 1930s until Germany's invasion to Romania. Out of the 12 family members, seven were dwarfs. Despite the new Nazi race laws banning Jewish artists from performing in front of a Jewish crowd, they were still able to perform until 1944 when they were deported to Auschwitz. There, they were sent to take part in Mengele's experiments and due to his special interests in them, they have managed to live through a nightmare of systemic, systematic torture. Their performances for the Nazi's leaders and SS officers saved some of them from being sent to the gas chambers. They emigrated to Israel and settled in Haifa. The last member of them passed away in 2001. Movies, books, exhibitions were produced on behalf of the Ovitz family. They never claimed copyright in their performances. Works of authorship of creative text is perhaps the most common copyright categories. The, the number of texts written in the, in the ghetto in ghettos is innumerable. 
books, poems, plays, diaries. The most famous is Anne Frank diary. The fact that Anne Frank's father survived and died in 1980 allowed the diary to receive the attention on which copyright protection was based. Part of a diary were co-authored with her father and remain in protection until 2050. In October 2019, five letters written in Hebrew in 1938 by Jewish children in Poland were sent were said to be auctioned by a private auction house. These letters described the difficult life of a Jewish family not long before the Holocaust. An injunction issued by an Israeli court ordered the businessman who owned the letter to postpone the auction. All these examples from the most unimaginable copyright scene are real examples where copyright should subsist. All these disturbing examples raise emotional and legally complex leg uh, questions. Who is the owner? Who can perform, play, reproduce, display to the public or communicate to the public these works or versions of them? Or who is entitled to the right to complete uncompleted works such as those of us? Art is a form of testimony. When art is created under extreme circumstances, its unlimited message to the utter world is unparalleled to any other way of expressing the experiences in these circumstances. Using works created in the ghettos and concentration camps with no authorization <coughs> of the legitimate owner is morally and legally questionable. Before I offer you, with my answers, two very recent examples further explain my argument. A walk in Block 27 at the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp tells a moving copyright story that has never been told. Traces of Life is a permanent exhibition that publicly shows the inner power of art and emotional rescue that some of the 1.5 million kids that were murdered in the Holocaust have found while expressing the atrocities they have experienced in their daily lives. Artist Mikhail Rovner, the curator of the exhibition, stated that one can almost feel the urgency of the situation in many of the drawings. They are reflections and details of the life they were forced to leave behind and the new reality they encountered. These drawings are the legacies and our inheritance. Every visitor of the exhibition enters an empty space in which nothing is displayed and only the footnotes of children's voices emerge in the background. Rovna remained true to her undertaking not to change or produce her own version of the drawings and decided to copy the fragments with a pencil exactly as they were onto the walls of the room dedicated to the children. With just a pencil and copy paper, one by one, detail after detail, Rovna drew each line again on a scale of one to one. Rovna added color to some of the black and white, sometimes uncompleted drawings. On the one hand, the use by Rovna changed the drawings and altered the unique artistic symbolism that the original black and white, uncompleted versions provide. On the other hand, Rovna made these works accessible to young viewers and transformed the message and meaning in order to touch every viewer and raise awareness to the power of art. <coughs> Rovna's exhibition raises copyright concerns pertaining to the changes and modifications she made, to the message and meaning of the drawings, but more importantly, the exhibitions open a whole new and subtle concern relating to the ownership of these drawings. On September 20... On last September, during my visit to Warsaw, I noticed a street exhibition 
in the old city. The exhibition includes sketches and drawings made by children in concentration camps. They were displayed to the public in a place where some visitors mocked the drawings. Some of the drawings were colored, some were vandalized. Who holds the authority to display them to the public in this way? Copyrighted expressions created within the ghettos and concentration camps have no parallel example in human history. As such, these works deserve a sui generis protection. The authenticity of these works makes them a closed category. Copyright law protects and should continue to protect communicative and dialogical spaces. Copyright laws should not stand between exposure to authenticity, but at the same time should not avoid dealing with illegal ownership claims. Works that represent the genocide of six million Jews murdered in the Holocaust have owners. Do copyright laws provide any doctrinal remedies to the complex questions in this inquiry? Three copyright principles come to mind at this stage. Fair use can act as a means to limit known exposure to these works. There is a public interest in having the fullest information available. The unique nature of these works requires us at the same time, to present them as is, with no modifications, no transformative messages. Orphan works refer to artworks whose owner is impossible to locate or find. This usually leads to their seclusion and abandonment. If orphan works will be ignored in the future, archives in old formats will continue to decay and further delay the digitization means some will be lost for good. If we do not act to preserve orphan works, we will eventually lose them to the damages of time and memory. At common law, there is a general rule against perpetuities. Copyright laws, including international treaties, limit the protection of copyrighted materials. I argue that extreme times call for extreme measures. As such, copyright in works produced within the ghettos should have no expiration date. Only few examples exist of perpetual enjoyment of copyright. One of them is the famous Section 301 of the CDPA 1988, dealing with I, may be I might be criticized for this perpetual argument, but I reiterate my standpoint that extreme times call for extreme measures. And there is no parallel extreme time for that of the Shoah, the Holocaust. This brings me to the forefront of my commitment to offer an ownership paradigm that meets the claims, my claims, for copyright justice. Should there be a different and novel ownership model for these works, can countries once occupied by the Nazis own these works and be entrusted to preserve these memories? Can Auschwitz Museum claim ownership over Dina's 11 portraits? Can German museums own musical notes, sketches and other creative expressions of those whom they defined non-human and rationally abnormal and made them six million of them walk to their death. Protecting the authentic message of works created within the ghettos and concentration camps is a prime mission of the global IP community. It is the public interest, it is in the public interest to not be deprived of these works and at the same time to retain authors' exclusive rights to remain known to allow the personalities to speak out of the works indefinitely. I argue that ghetto art and authorship are Jewish common heritage. As such, in ghettos and concentration camps, Jewish traditional knowledge was born. I argue that all creative expressions created 
within the ghettos and concentration camps are traditional knowledge of the Jewish culture and heritage. No parallel example exists and no parallel event has molded a nation's identity and daily cultural reality as the Shoah did. Holocaust art should be defined as cultural expressions and recognized as part of Jewish collective identity and traditional knowledge of the Jewish culture, passed on from generation to generation. Traditional knowledge refers to a living body of knowledge passed on from generation to generation within a community. It often forms part of people's cultural and spiritual identity. The aim behind international recognition of new categories of protectable knowledge is to ethically and economically reward systems of knowledge that are embedded in the specific, in the specific cultural traditions of local communities. Copyright expressions created within the ghettos and concentration camps communicate Jewish culture and tradition as a living body of Past certain of the uh, of the slides because I know we don't have the entire day. Well, Celine is important to me for two reasons. First of all, because and this is the last uh, example so which I'd like to reiterate again. That to me this is Dina Babit. I feel I have to do something that belongs to me. This is Dina Babit's words, who claimed copyright over the eleven portraits. Dina passed away in 2009 and never received the 11 portraits back to her hands. These were real people. They are part of who I am. As third generation of Auschwitz survivors, I aim to offer the, be the beginning of a theory on which to develop a solid paradigm to addressing questions of ownership and copyright of these works, works that need sometimes no words. One statement from a woman in gold tells the, story, the opposite story of this article. The last prisoners of World War II are the stolen works of art. In fact, my talk today show that the last prisoners are the works created in concentration camps whose creators and owners will never be found. Those of you who visit Auschwitz will find books and books of names. That's how I came across the reasons for my and the origins of my surname and other names in my own family. It is, and it still is, a very difficult journey and a very complex, emotionally complex research. But the good part of it is that maybe I lived my life with people who tattooed with numbers on their hands. But today, my son, age 11, plays Pavel Wind Quintet for oboe in the Israeli Conservatory. And this is my own little victory. There are several words I would like to say before I complete. And this is my way to say thank you. First to you as an audience to listen. Second, Osgood was my home for many years. I owe a great debt of gratitude to Osgood Hall Law School and its academic community. First of all, before the comments, thank you, Justice Rothstein, for being here, for making the way and allowing me to hear your comments, which I'm sure will be invaluable for my research. 
I cannot complete my words without using this option to thank three people who sit in the audience. One, an indefinite student, one, an indefinite friend, and one who is responsible for my academic dedication and insistence to keep exploring original thoughts. Thank you, Aviv, for being part of my academic journey. Back to 2006, I arrived back to Israel in 2006, and Aviv joined me as a research assistant, and since, since then, it doesn't stop. Pina, one of my best friends, whom I see once every five years, or every three years, in the good scenario. We met at Oxford. What a great opportunity to have you as part of my academic life, academic roots, and group of close friends. Finally, there is one special person in the audience to whom I owe the biggest thank you I could express. And now thank you, Pina, for giving me the opportunity to doing this. It's Professor Weaver. Professor Weaver was my supervisor at Oxford. Well, definitely not easy time. My time as your student has changed and molded my abilities to interact with legal arguments and develop my own ones. My commitment to the academic project is thanks to you. Thank you for the many advices you were so kind to give over now two decades. Thank you all and Todaba. in his uh, extraordinarily powerful and moving remarks, uh, Dean Zemmer has introduced us to an important but difficult and controversial issue, the rights to works of anonymous Holocaust victims. Why has it taken so long? I'll tell you a personal story. My father was born in Celts, Poland, he had 10 siblings. His family owned a factory for making beer barrels and a hotel. <clears throat> the barrel factory and the hotel could not support 11 families, and the younger siblings emigrated to Canada before the First World War. My father went to Yorkton, Saskatchewan in 1912. He told me that the ship he sailed on from England to North America was one sailing prior to the Titanic. He was very lucky. In addition to my father, five brothers and one sister emigrated to Canada. I believe two brothers and two sisters remained in Poland. I know nothing about them and their families. It's ironic that the ones who remained and inherited the family business were annihilated by the Nazis as part of the six million victims of the Holocaust. My father and his siblings, who emigrated to Canada, didn't get the barrel factory and the hotel, but they were the lucky ones. I was born in Winnipeg at the end of 1940. I was also very lucky. Had my father remained in Poland, and had I been born there, I would have been one of the six million. I was four years old at the end of World War II, so I grew up in the late 1940s and 1950s. As best as I can recall, in my family in Winnipeg and amongst my Jewish friends, there was no talk of the Holocaust in the 1940s and 1950s. If my parents did talk about it, it wasn't in my presence. 
I believe the prevailing view was that this was a subject so traumatizing that children should be shielded from it. There was significant anti-Semitism in Canada even after the war. A poll conducted in 1946 found that the least desirable immigrants to Canada were first the Japanese and second the Jews. So as far as I knew, there was no groundswell of interest in the Holocaust in Winnipeg at that time. Indeed, many families had fathers, brothers, and sons in the armed forces who had lost their lives during the, during the war. Canadians would have been preoccupied with the sacrifices that had been made by Canadians. I know that some members of my family had been involved in the settlement of Holocaust survivors in Canada. But then the issue was getting them out of the displaced person camps in Europe and getting them to Canada. It was their survival, finding their relatives, and helping them find living quarters and jobs. Materialistic issues for sure. Where Holocaust survivors or relatives of Holocaust victims knew there were, there were looted assets, there were efforts made in the early years to recover those assets. And that would include, in addition to bank accounts, intellectual property in the form of works of art. And recovering those assets was fraught with difficulty. But that's a story for another occasion. And Dean Zemmer has told us in his writing, that is not what his paper is about. In those days, I do not believe there was much known and little interest about the works of Holocaust victims. Certainly, as Dean Zemmer notes, as he's shown us, the diary of Anne Frank was well known, but, very, but I think very little else. So it is perhaps not surprising that it has taken decades before any interest was taken in the recovery and disposition of works of Holocaust victims. And now, Dean, and now Dean Zemmer has taken the initiative to think about these works and raise what are complicated, sensitive, and controversial issues in relation to them. Why is Dean Zemmer's work important? It was the philosopher George Santayana to whom is attributed the saying, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Anti-Semitism has existed for 2,000 years. It has been manifested in pogroms, expulsions, torture, denial of rights to own land, and the right to hold public office. Even in the 1920, even in the 20th century, there were zoning bylaws and gentlemen's agreements precluding Jews from certain communities. And there were many employers who would not hire Jews as employees. Although the last half of the 20th century, although in the last half of the 20th century, anti-Semitism has significantly declined, the concern of the Jewish community is that it will re-energize. And so we know of incidents such as the Tree of Life shooting in Pittsburgh in 2018, which was only one of a number of such incidents, so the Jewish synagogues require security guards. And when times are tough, people look for someone to blame, and conspiracy theories develop and multiply, and Jews are always at the top of the list. Survey in 2020 found that over 50% of respondents didn't know that six million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust. 10% were unsure or denied that the Holocaust occurred, and another 10% believed that it was the Jews that caused the Holocaust. Dean Zemmer tell us, tells us that the work of Holocaust victims is an aspect of learning about the Holocaust. The lessons of the Holocaust are relevant today to understand anti-Semitism and indeed prejudice in any form. There is a danger in letting them be forgotten. With that background, I'll turn to copyright law for a moment and Dean Zemmer's work. 
Copyright law is largely concerned with economic rights. Statutory law giving the creator the exclusive right of production or reproduction, the right to perform or the right to publish for a fixed period of time in intent, is intended to incentivize the creation of original works. However, to paraphrase Justice Binney in the well-known 2002 decision uh, of the Canadian Supreme Court, Thurge versus Gallery d'Art, copyright law is usually presented as a balance between promoting the public interest in the dissemination of works of art and intellect and obtaining a just reward for the creator. Dean Zimmer takes us in a different direction. He explicitly has said that his work doesn't pertain to looted art where the original owner or their descendants are known. His work is concerned with the creations of victims of the Holocaust and where there are no known descendants. And so he is not concerned with the usual economic aspects of copyright law, but rather the moral rights that copyright law also recognizes and the importance of making publicly available the work of those victims. This change of focus has implications for aspects of copyright that are usually based on economic rights. Copyright in the United States, Europe, and, em and imminently in Canada extends for the life of the author or creator plus 70 years. Indeed, the U.S. Constitution expressly says that the United States Congress shall have power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries for limited times. The policy behind time limits is that the economic value of ex exclusivity should be limited. Additionally, there is the issue of finding rightful descendants decades and perhaps centuries after the death of the author or creator. Dean Zimmer presents us with a difficult aspect of copyright law that is not concerned with economic rights as such or with the problem of finding rightful descendants. If we are not concerned with economic rights of the creator or who their descendants are, Dean Zemmer's work argues that the rationale for time limits drops away. If our focus is on making publicly available the work of Holocaust victims, perhaps there is merit to the idea of a perpetual right of public availability of such work. In the common law countries, moral rights protect, protection is tied to the economic rights of copyright and terminate when the copyright protection ends, lifetime plus 70 years. In 2022, we are now beyond that term for works produced during the Holocaust. But perpetual moral rights are not unknown. Dean Zimmer tells us that in France, copyright and moral rights are not linked and that moral rights are perpetual. There is rationale for not linking the two and not subjecting both to time limits. The creator of Holocaust works dies without recognizing financial reward that copyright is intended to confer. So there's no economic reason for a time limitation. And as Dean Zemmer points out, Holocaust creations are unique. He uses the term sui generis, what he calls Jewish traditional knowledge. He tells us that even in the United States, with a constitutional provision respecting time limits for copyrights, the U.S. Supreme Court in Eldred versus Ashcroft in 2003 determined that repeated extensions of the term of copyright do not con constitute perpetual rights and therefore do not violate the constitutionally mandated time limits. But it can't be denied that repeated extensions of time 
may functionally result in what is tantamount to a perpetual copyright protection. In the United Kingdom, he tells us, while there are no constitutional time limitations on copyright, time limitations are provided by statute. He has referred to, to the United Kingdom Parliament's granting perpetual rights for J.M. Barry's Peter Pan for the benefit of the Hospital for Sick Children in Great Ormond Street, London. Of course, that's an economically motivated charitable endeavor, and there is no issue of finding rightful descendants. So Dean Zemmer says that these US and UK precedents show that time limits are not sacrosanct. Since copyright law is statutory law, time extensions or a perpetual right must be implemented by statutory amendment. Dean Zimmer appears to see this as a means of creating a perpetual right for the work of victims of, Holocaust, of the Holocaust and statutory amendment in a number of countries, a big hill to climb, but he makes a strong case for such a remedy. It is moral rights which are the foundation of Dean Zimmer's work. I believe. I was interested in how our Canadian law respecting moral rights would line up with Dean Zemmer's approach. Our Copyright Act recognizes moral rights. Even though Canadian law is essentially derived from English common law, moral rights law descends from the civil law tradition. In The Verge, just as Binney says, that the civil law adopts an elevated view of the relationship between the creator and his or her work, work, an extension of the creator's personality possessing a dignity which is deserving of protection. Think about that in the context of Dean Zemmer's remarks today. In our Copyright Act, section 28.2 provides that moral rights are infringed if the work is to the prejudice of the honor or reputation of the creator, distorted, mutilated, or otherwise modified, or used in association with a product, service, or cause, or institution. The concerns raised by Dean Zemmer would fit neatly in the Canadian understanding of moral rights. Distortion or mutilation of Holocaust works that prejudice the honor or reputation of the creator because they interrupt the linkage between the creator and the work is exactly what Dean Zemmer is addressing. The use of Holocaust works to promote commercial products, or worse, used in association with Holocaust ridicule or denial would be an egregious infringement of the moral rights of the creator, even if the creator is unknown. As I understand Dean Zemmer's objective, it is to ensure that these works arising from the Holocaust experience be maintained in the form originally created, that there be perpetual protection of the moral rights of the creators, that there should be public dissemination of these works and that they should not be withheld from the public. What he proposes is admittedly a monumental undertaking. Where ownership of property is unknown, title is cheats to the government. And that will be where the physical work is made and located. And physical ownership is indeed perpetual. So title to Holocaust works may be owned by the governments where those works are physically located. We're therefore talking about legislative changes in a number of countries and the possible removal of works from their present location. This will not be easily accomplished. But it is a worthwhile discussion that Dean Zemmer has introduced. We have seen even in recent weeks anti-Semitic comments on social media by the likes of Kanye West and Kyrie Irving. To be sure, they have lost some of their endorsements and Irving has been temporarily suspended by the Brooklyn Nets. 
Some attribute what Kanye West is saying to mental illness. Be that as it may, these individuals are iconic figures and have enormous followings on social media of many millions of adherents. What they are saying on social media normalizes anti-Semitism and gives license to others to express such views with impunity. Anti-Semitism is said to be the oldest prejudice. Jews have been subjected to persecution, expulsion, limitation of rights, and death solely because they are Jews, culminating in the calamity of the Holocaust. Dean Zimmer concludes his paper, and I quote, we must protect and promote the protection of these artworks to teach their most important lesson to us all, never again. We're indebted to Dean Zimmer for introducing us to this important discussion. Thank you. Just wanted to say um, thank you as well from my behalf, all of our uh, behalf, so I could just look around the room and I'm just grateful for you opening up this debate and as you put it, making us, you know, it's an uncomfortable debate and I want us to stay uncomfortable and we need to be uncomfortable until we can guarantee never again. And uh, I'm just so grateful for your authenticity, Lior, and all of this courageous work that you're doing to bringing this to light. and. Jonathan's photo there um, is close to my heart, so thank you for that. And Justice Rothstein, I think only you could do justice uh, to respond to this really uh, compelling and heartfelt uh, work. So uh, thank you uh, for all of your work, and I know you've put, to, like what you've heard today is actually um, authentic for the first time. It's not, you know, recycled stuff that many of us have in our repertoire. This is fresh, compelling, and done for us in this very privileged group. And so for that, um, we are grateful, eternally grateful. Thank you. Um, we're going to move straight to our third panel. And if I could call up our distinguished chair and our panelists. Oh, I don't need the chair.
Okay. I'll have to take a look because she's doing the moderation. All right. Okay, go ahead. All right. So thank you also to those of you online who are following us uh, today. Uh, I uh, just glanced at the chat and there are many um, congratulatory, many thank yous um, just following on our keynote and uh, our commentary. So thank you again. And to all of you um, online, please keep uh, your questions, feedback coming in. We value um, your, uh, your thoughts. And uh, on to panel three now. So um, this is AI for the future of health. And I'm very pleased that we have with us Mr. Costantinos Yorgaras. He is the newly minted CEO of the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. And uh, I believe this is one of your, among your first official speaking engagements. Very first. Tina. Very first. I love it. Yay. Okay. Okay, so that's, York is a place of firsts, right? And here at Osgood, so thank you so much for that. I'm, I'm delighted to hear that. Um, and uh, of course, in his role, Mr. Yorgaras provides strategic direction and leadership to the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, and CIPO's come up uh, quite a bit already. And he really ensures the provision of world-class IP services by granting IP rights and providing IP awareness and information really to, to the public, right, to Canada. He also represents SIPO and Canada's interests, both nationally and internationally. Mr. Yorgaras leads legislative, regulatory, administrative, and operational policy related to IP framework that SIPO administers. He provides expert advice and broader IP policy analysis, policy development, and framework modernization. He leads the Canadian delegations on key bilateral and multilateral initiatives, such as strategic um, WIPO committees, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation's IP committee, and other fora, all to develop and advance Canadian IP positions and interests internationally. Mr. Yorgaras began his career in the public service in 1984, so he's definitely. Uh, a long-time expert in uh, all things government, and has held strategic and executive positions within the departments of um, ICED now, and within Science and Technology and the Innovation Council. Uh, the list goes on. Mr. Yorgaras has extensive experience spanning strategic, economic, and legislative policy with direct responsibilities for IP, innovation, insolvency, and industrial and labor market policies. He holds a Master of Arts in Public Administration from Carleton University and an Executive Certificate in Public Leadership from the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. And I'm proud to say he's been a long-standing member of the IP Osgood Advisory Board, a dear friend of the university and the law school, and also an avid supporter of our IP Intensive, where we get to send our students every year to Ottawa, and also the IP Innovation Clinic. So a very warm welcome to you, Costantinos. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Pina, for the kind words. Um, I just want to confirm, oh yes, we do have our, our, uh, our fifth uh, participant on the panel. Uh, no, it's quite all right. Um, so uh, welcome to uh, this panel on AI for the future of health, data IP, and equitable access to personalized health care. Uh, as uh, Pina mentioned, um, I'm from the Canadian Intellectual Property Office and we of course are looking at AI from a policy perspective, but also in the adoption. And uh, here today we'll talk about uh, adoption uh, of AI in healthcare. Um, I, I really wish we would have had a bit of time just to breathe in what we just heard from uh, Dean Zimmer, Zimmer and uh, Justice Rothstein. A very important, meaningful presentation. Uh, I, I really will be reflecting on, on those voices that, that we heard. Thank you. 
Um, I had the opportunity to uh, meet the panelists virtually uh, a few days ago, and uh, believe me, you're in for a treat. Uh, we have a, a number of different perspectives around AI and healthcare from a health practitioner perspective, from a data perspective, and legal perspectives. And it got me thinking a lot over the last week or so about uh, what does it mean? What does healthcare mean in the age of AI? And I was thinking, you know, if Hippocrates had to rewrite the oath in an age of AI, what would it sound like? Would it be different at all? I didn't know who to ask, so I actually went to openai.com and um, a free, free service. I used the DaVinci 002 model script, and I put in the following nine words. Create new Hippocratic oath for doctors using artificial intelligence. In three seconds, uh, this is what AI told us about uh, a new Hippocratic Oath. Uh, four sentences. I pledge to use artificial intelligence in a way that benefits humanity and does no harm. I will use AI to save lives, to improve patients' lives, and to protect the vulnerable. I will never use AI to create weapons or to harm people in any way. I, I'm really interested in the transparency there to see how AI generated that one. And finally, I will always strive to stay at the forefront of AI technology and to use it responsibly, ethically, and with care. What does this mean? I mean, this is more than just a, a party trick here. Uh, AI is being used in many, many ways. It's in front of us. Uh, the future is now, and it's being applied everywhere. It is pervasive, and it is being used in healthcare. So with that, let me now turn to our panelists. So of course, we're, we're all eager to see AI broadly and successfully integrated into healthcare. And whether or not we're eager to see it uh, deployed, it's already happening. It is inevitable in many ways, and it is being deployed extensively. Recently, with the pandemic, um, this has highlighted the importance of data collection and data analytics for both personalized healthcare and public health. The pandemic has also reminded us that inequities exist within our healthcare systems, and simply taking available retrospective data to make predictions may do nothing more than just move old problems forward or potentially create new ones. So, with that in mind, I, I will not take any more time, but I'll turn to our esteemed panelists. And I'll ask you yourselves to quickly introduce yourself and think about two questions, if you could answer them. What do you think has been the biggest success in healthcare AI over the past few years? And what do you think is the biggest barrier that we still need to overcome if we're going to see real successful progress in this space? So what are the benefits, what are the barriers, or potential issues of concern? So let's turn in uh, to our um, esteemed panelists, first with Dr. Devin Singh. Doctor. Um, well, in true physician fashion, I was a bit late, so I apologize uh, about that. Um, and so I'm an emergency doctor at SickKids Hospital. I also have a master's in computer science, and so I write machine learning code, and I really focus my research on the translation of AI into clinical practice to really drive automation and improvements in the way we deliver care to our patients. I also um, am the CEO and co-founder of a health tech company that's sort of born out of sick kids called Hero AI. And that company came from this issue where we were building these super cool models in the academic space, but there was no way to get it into people's hands. Um, and that journey of trying to figure out how to get AI into people's hands um, you know, has given a lot of insight around some of the wonderful opportunities and barriers. Did you want me to talk about those now or we'll finish our introductions? Uh, please, please. Yeah, please. sure. So I mean, some of the uh, incredible opportunities at hand are around, I think, clinical automation. There are so many inefficiencies. If you've gone to an emergency department lately where you check in, um, your, your data is put into an EHR, and we all know when we look at that data exactly what tests you're going to need. You're going to need an abdominal ultrasound because we think you have appendicitis. You know, maybe you're having some urinary symptoms and your kiddo needs a urine test. But you'll wait six hours, eight hours for us to, you know, see you, then order that test, and then wait another four hours for the test to be done. And there's just so much inefficiency in the time spent waiting. And so I think there's a wonderful opportunity to leverage predictive analytics to get common orders placed in a, you know, 
real-time fashion to get things done in parallel while you're waiting, just drive efficiency. And so I think that's probably one of the biggest low-hanging fruit opportunities for machine learning right now um, is in the space of clinical automation. And the opportunity is really coming to life because of the birth of these EHRs spreading across you know, all of our uh, um, you know, different health systems and across the country, really, there's a lot of um, digitization of healthcare, which creates the data and that fuel needed for a machine learning model to come to life. Some of the greatest barriers, and these are really important barriers, um, I'd say, you know, probably halfway down my list um, would be around the regulatory landscape. And so there's a bit of confusion on how do we take these models, build them, and then translate them in a way that um, ideally sort of fits with the current regulatory space, but we know that the current space isn't ideal. So then what do we do? Are we trying to exceed with the regulatory and with the privacy laws and you know the, the laws of the land. From a sick kids perspective and a startup perspective, we're trying to exceed um, those benchmarks because we know that they, the bar should be raised. And so that creates a bit of confusion and a bit of grayness uh, in the space. Um, the models that we build are adaptive. Health Canada right now doesn't regulate adaptive machine learning models. So that just means a machine learning model that's continuously learning. Um, those are the models of today and of the future, but they can't be regulated right now. So that's a major barrier, obviously. Um, I think the biggest barrier, though, is the lack of um, data to allow us to do proper bias assessments and equity assessments. And so I can't look to the public and say, you know, we're going to deploy this model. It's going to order these automated tests for your kid when you come into sick kids. And this model is equitable regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your race regardless of your religion or your belief or your cultural practices. I can't do those assessments yet because I don't have the data to do that. And we know that that has to be done, right? I need to be able to you know, say to the public that yes, we're gonna add this incredible efficiency. It's gonna be awesome for you. Your wait's gonna be shorter and it's gonna be equitable. And so that's a massive barrier, right? Um, and that we need to solve. And the, the very last one that I'm really passionate about is around um, connectivity and internet connectivity. And so across the province, most people don't have access to proper, high-speed, reliable internet. We're gonna be translating these AI models into people's homes. That's gonna create a gap, right? Um, and so in the next five years, as my research takes off, I may accidentally, inadvertently, widen the healthcare gap for those who don't have connectivity to connect with these solutions, they're gonna be left behind. That's terrible, right? That's the complete opposite of what we're trying to do. And so there needs to be a lot of advocacy around creating these internet foundations um, across the country to make sure everyone is plugged in uh, and has good access. I could talk forever on this stuff, so I'm gonna stop. <laughs> I'm gonna stop there. No, that's just, uh, all right. I think that like a, a very a good academic, I, I have a few slides, so uh, Ashley, what? No, not, not 21. <laughs> no, but, all right, so uh, we'll see if, if the, the slides are not ready, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so it's not, the title is not is unnecessary, but it just, uh, it's, uh, okay. So just, um, yeah, so just, uh, my name is uh, Aviv, I'm a law professor at the Higher Regional Law School in Wachman University. And um, I was asked to, to talk about the challenges. So I think that one of the, I think that the elephant in the room, which, which is not really an elephant today, but it's practically uh, some version of an elephant, is what we call data. And data is the big issue. And this is also the challenge, uh, but also bear a significant potential. Um, so the main issue, the main problem that we have today with data, and I guess some of, her, some of the, uh, uh, presentable, the speakers here will, will address this too, is that we have limited access to data, what we call high quality data. And uh, people that are deals with uh, AI will tell you that we don't only need just uh, data. For developing AI, and especially AI in certain areas, we need what we call high quality data. And that's a significant barrier. And this is something that we need to learn how to resolve. Because without that, I think that it would be very difficult to continue this uh, exploration and development of, of uh, AI technology in health areas, but also in other fields. And the reasons we have these barriers, and this is what I want to highlight for this uh, uh, very, very short presentation, I'm not going to exceed my, uh, my time, is uh, what we called copyright, uh, and I will talk about this, uh, the one, one, one barrier in copyright, and the other two barriers in other areas of, uh, of IP. So 
Uh, the issue with copyright, I think, is, is, is something that we all know, and we talked about that earlier, and there is the, the fact that you, know, you own your creations, you own your data. Data is basically a resource, and you have ownership on that data. But the situation with AI, and this is a question that I think it's uh, something that I reflected uh, with uh, Professor D'Agostino back in, I think it was in, 20, in 2018 or 2019 when, we, uh, when Professor D'Agostino presented a paper to the parliament reviewing the Copyright Act, stating that we have to face that in, with, in a different way. Because we should look and see if we, if we can address data for the purpose of AI uh, within a different, building a different mechanism in order to make this data accessible for developing what we call important uh, AI uh, uh, startups and companies that will help humanity. And I think that in a way, this uh, way of uh, perceiving a, a copyright and perceiving data for copyright purposes is a very different mechanism than what we know uh, today. And this is exactly what we try to pitch, saying that we should think about uh, 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 lowering the copyright standards or uh, allowing this uh, access for, uh, for certain creations, certain data for these uh, purposes. So that's one issue that we have to face with. Uh, the second problem, the second issue is what we call contracts. And this is something that you probably don't think about that, but this is an, another issue that we, uh, which we raise, what we call data mining. Data mining. Uh, so you all know that, and you might think that we have unlimited access to data on the internet, but the fact is that it's not true. Because if you look into the internet, everything is basically, you have some sort of walls, it's called a contract, in terms of use. You can't really use certain data on the internet, so it's not really accessible for you. And the second barrier, and this is the way that I try to frame that, and I, I know that bears criticism, and, and some of my colleagues in, in Europe will, you know, criticize this, uh, this uh, version of, uh, of uh, this perception of, uh, of, of privacy as a barrier, but we should call this as it is. Privacy is really important, and I know this is something that we've seen in the last uh, few years, uh, mainly in Europe with uh, GDPR, and uh, I think in Canada we, we saw that uh, more recently, and privacy is really important, but privacy, as any other right, has a certain price, and we have to you know, face the price and understand that. And when we look into what is happening with healthcare, and we look into health data in that, in that regard, I think that some of the people here will, I mean, will, will admit that when we need to address privacy concerns, this is have some certain cost. And again, I'm not saying that the cost is not important. I don't think that we shouldn't pay this cost, but I think that you at least you know, realize that there is a cost and we have to, you know, in, in the discussion, in the legal debate, in, in, in the policy debate, this cost should be something that we should consider, see if we are willing to pay this cost or we are not willing to pay the cost. But the, the issue that I see as, as an academic, as a scholar in the field, that I don't think there, you know, there is many people that are actually discussing the costs. And the cost is something that, you know, might create some barriers for developing this type of technologies. Uh, so, I think that the, the issue that I want to raise here, and obviously I'll, I'll you know, yield the floor to my, my colleague and maybe we can talk about these issues more, is how we, you know, we create a new regulatory framework for that area that will take into consideration all the problems, that will take in, into consideration what we want for the future and the importance of developing AI tools in healthcare and also you know, try to build some, you know, some limitations and consider the problems that we are facing with privacy and copyright and other elements of law and make those laws and make those legal frameworks something that will work eventually for us, for the public. So, yeah. Thank you. All right, uh, now we turn to uh, Mary Jane Dykeman. Hi everyone, I'm Mary Jane Dykeman. I'm a managing partner at Inc. Law and we have a global consulting company aptly named Inc. Consulting. Uh, very happy to be here at Osgood. I'm a 96 grad, and it has transformed in the time since I was walking the halls. I was thinking a lot about health and data even back then. I had the uh, good fortune to article at the Ministry of Health Legal Services branch back in the mid-90s. My first file was the Personal Health Information Protection Act, which took, I think, between about 1995 to 2004 to come into force in Ontario, and so we've seen a lot of movement over time. So I take the point um, quite closely about privacy because I think it, it's so fundamentally important and yet it cannot be the barrier. I think there has to be a very good conversation about data and the opportunity of data, 
the opportunity to innovate and transform the health system and give opportunities and not um, to keep some of those opportunities away from the people who entrust us with the data. So I wear a few hats right now. I've also stepped in as interim uh, VP legal and risk at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. I'll be there until we find a permanent person, so if anyone's looking. Um, but when they asked me in May to come back in, I did say to them, I want to talk about what you're doing with data. The Crumble Center for Neuroinformatics is situated at CAMH, and there is such opportunity. And I'll say a couple of things because we, you know, we're being asked about what are the opportunities, what are the, the barriers. Um, it's all back to the data. And I probably am simplistic because I think quite often in the health system, if we had the right data, to your point about quality data, we don't, we don't always have that. So I've been thinking a lot about the continuum. It doesn't matter what shape it is. Is it a circle? Is it a rhombus? Is it a, you know, an infinity loop? I keep thinking in the health system, let's get to, do we know what data we hold? Because we often talk about the um, electronic health records, Many hospitals have many systems, so in addition to a main system, you may have 300 other systems. We used to worry about legacy systems and all of those talking. I'm actually saying peel it back, figure out what is the data we have, what is the quality data. And I've been at some conferences lately, including in Boston, and I had been thinking and drawing my circle or, or continuous loop on the data path, should we be looking to clean all the data? Well. It, it's almost impossible. So which piece in the loop do you do first? You start, find your data, make sure you've got clean data. Maybe it's being driven by that use case. How do you vet your use cases at the other end? I think along that continuum, this path, once we have quality data, there are a couple of things that are extremely important. So I'll count privacy as one of them. And I, I would never minimize that, but it's a, it's a must do but it cannot be a barrier. And every now and then when I'm at different tables, someone will sort of say, well, you know, legal and privacy are impeding us. And I've, I've heard it over the years in health research as well. You know, we don't want to impede science. And I keep thinking, no, I think legal and privacy should be there to create the appropriate guardrails because, of course, we don't have the regulatory framework as yet. We're waiting on Bill C-27 in Canada. We see, um, you know, draft bills in the US at local levels, some state legislation. We've got a federal act to look at. We know what's going on in the EU. So we're monitoring carefully, but the fact is it's happening now. And at least three years ago, my law partner, Carol Piovisan, and I were in Orlando and Barcelona talking to global CIOs. And after doing a session on artificial intelligence, one of them came up and he just said, he just looked at us and he said, I'm scared to do anything and I'm scared to do nothing. And for me, that really encapsulated where we are. Fast forward, you see what's happening at SickKids and ChemH, and I'll, I'll shout out to my friend and colleague, Dr. Mohammed Mamdani at Unity Health, St. Mike's and its other uh, sites, hospital sites. You know, they created a VP position on data science and advanced analytics, and it's not every group that has done that. So again, SickKids is doing some amazing work, and the teaching hospitals are stepping in. We're working with community mental health and addiction agencies, community health centers, family health teams, to say, get to the data. What are the problems that you want to solve? And one of the things that uh, we've done at St. Mike's is they developed a, a great path to figure out, well, what are the use cases? Because the things that we can change in the health system are almost endless. But what they did was they created a priority of what would have the best impact on patient outcomes, what would change things in terms of the health system. And if you come forward with a use case that perhaps can do both, then maybe it, it uh, carries some weight and gets the priority. But we are really in this transformative state. When I sat at the Ministry of Health all those years ago in a little airless room going clause by clause as a summer student thinking, I'm not sure I'd want to do this for a living, and yet here I sit. We are at the cusp of some amazing things. We need those guardrails, and what we need even in 
the interim is decisions about what standards to adopt. There's some great frameworks out there. Um, we, may, we may wait a little while for the pure regulation, but what, what are the ways we do this in an innovative and responsible way? So I'll leave it at that. Hi, um, I bring a different perspective. I'm currently counsel at uh, Norton Rose Fulbright. Prior to that, for about 20 years, um, I worked for a technology company. Uh, about the last eight years, I worked for a company that um, operated in the mental health space. So using AI to help people meditate and improve their mental health is what we did. And um, it, it you know, as, as I worked with the different engineers and, uh, you know, different people in, in, the, in the company, I uh, tried to emphasize uh, the importance of uh, thinking about uh, how the algorithm was built, how, you know, what kind of data was collected. Is our data uh, too specific in terms of uh, the type of people who use our wearable device? Um, you know, so there are so many issues uh, that we need to worry about from an AI perspective in terms of um, the quality of data, you know, if your algorithm itself is biased, if uh, how you're analyzing the data, all those things are important to consider. But what I've seen over the last few years, and, and I think all of you have probably experienced is, is that um, Using wearables uh, has become more mainstream, and as it's become more mainstream, it's um, helped us uh, all to gain more control over our own uh, health care. And, um, you know, we can use the input that we receive from the wearables that we wear to improve our own well being and also get assistance from others to improve our uh, well being. And with AI, as there's more data, and hopefully good quality data, um, the algorithm gets better, and uh, the data that's there is going to help us uh, take control over our, our well-being. So yes, I agree with all the panelists here. Um, privacy and individual privacy is key. Regulation is really, really important and um, you know, making sure that we are aware of bias. There were two students sitting at uh, the table with me um, earlier today that come in from Nova Scotia, and they were engineering students who decided to come and talk, you know, to come and sit in on this concert, uh, t this uh, session today. And they were saying that in engineering school, they're never talk told that they need to think about bias or anything else um, as, you know, and, and I think a lot of panelists earlier today talked about the fact that we need to have a multidisciplinary approach and, uh, you know, whether it's healthcare or any other form of AI, um, I'm a big subscriber to using multidisciplinary teams to improve what we've, you know, what we can achieve, uh, but making sure that appropriate regulation is in place and appropriate training. Very well said. So, hi everyone. My name is Laura Pio. I am actually the, from the technology companies who are always speaking that you should leverage AI. I'm specifically a data and AI specialist that supports our entire public sector for Ontario, and I also cover healthcare nationally. So I'll work with Ontario Health, the number of hospitals, and you're talking about other sensitive, like what we'll call industries. I also work with like policing and law enforcement. So I completely echo and agree with everything you're saying. And to the engineers, I also empathize with you because I did not plan for any of this either before coming into the role. And it was a very humble learning once you step into it. So in regards to the positives that can come from it, because I know a lot of the times we spoke for barriers and I'm like we as Microsoft are still navigating and going through this, the more and more organizations that we work with and the more and in, the increased number of use cases that are presented to us. So there's a lot of benefits that can come from it. And like we'll say the actual bettering patient outcomes is some of them. Like the fact that we can have a better response time on how we should triage ambulances depending on the ailment of the person and direct them to the appropriate hospital based on capacity and types of doctors available to provide the service. If we can identify what EMRs are doing, or sorry, what we're gonna say, like the actual respondents in the ambulance, what they're doing 
like points of care while you're in the ambulance to do a handoff? Were any of those practices better? Is there something that we should implement? Um, like all the way to using drones to take organs from Billy Bishop Airport and to avoid crazy Toronto traffic and airdrop them off at a hospital in record time. I mean, there's so many benefits that can come to improving cost of care. Like we saw during COVID, like, and I agree with you on connectivity, that's still always gonna be a barrier to it, but just increasing accessibility to healthcare now. Like I'm not sure if anyone really knows this, but at a lot of Toronto libraries, the most checked out item is actually the Rogers Wi-Fi or internet hubs just because people want to use them to get access to internet. So it's how do we start to make that better distributed because technology is there and now to be putting it at points of like our people's fingertips. So like, there's a lot of good that can come from it, but there's also, like we said, a lot of learning that should be presented. Like when we talked about data quality, so I see this when we talk from hospital to hospital to hospital, like yes, there's a lack of understanding of the data. Half the time, not everyone knows where it is in those multitude of systems that you've discussed. Like even just something as simple as terminology, like when we use the word gender, is that gender at birth? Is that gender that you now identify as? Is it just binary that we're only using terms as male and female? So there's even a lack of what we call standardization or guidance. I'm like, and it's, again, it, it'll vary by institution, but it hasn't been as prescriptively given from the governments as of yet. So it's what language are we gonna to start to use so that when we are rationalizing over this data, it's all that's in sync. That what one hospital is using the same to the others. What one province is using is the exact same to the others. So I'm like, we're finding that to be a bit difficult. We're sitting there and it's even just governance over this data, right? Like we talk about ethics, like that's a very, like what is ethic? What is ethical use of data, right? Like I sit there and it's, I got Facebook on my phone, they take everything. Like we all know that on the consent agreements, but it's a lot, it's very different when you're taking all my personal health like information. Do I feel comfortable doing that? When do you need consent from the patient? Like if I'm about to die and an AI algorithm can tell you instantaneously you should do A, B, C, D, do you need my consent at that point, seeing that you saved my life? Was it that worth the trade-off? So the more that we go through this and we speak with the organizations, like all these questions are coming to light. Like, who can use the data? How should they be using the data? Is de-identifying my health records enough? Is that fair enough that you've stripped just my name but you're using the rest? Should researchers be able to use it if they are technically getting money from a government which could be looked as capital? So it's like there's a fair number of questions that come from it and I think the more and more, like I'm fortunate enough actually to work with sick kids. They're one of the best customers that I have. So I'm like, I'm not just saying that because you're here, but I, I love them so much. <coughs> but I'm like, fortunately for them, like they're choosing to be like trailblazers down this path and helping us to define it. And it's something that they're then speaking to another hospital about and to another, to another health authority and defining it. So it's, we'll need to learn, unfortunately, at, like while, as we are going, I'm like Australia and the US and in the UK, they have, the UK has the national health system. So I'm not sure if everyone knows that's an actual federal or national sense. So what they can apply will apply to all. We're very fragmented in Canada, not only in our provinces, but even in points of care. Like mental health is different than a hospital, is different than what we're doing for long-term patient care. So there's just a lot of fragmentation and until we have this standardization, we'll see a bit of struggle for it. But I, like I said, I think the more and more people are willing to come together, participate, define those terms and work, we'll see the betterments for it. Thank you very much. Uh, so that was a brief introduction from a number of different perspectives. Um, I, I do invite uh, questions from the audience, uh, both online and from the floor. Um, but uh, let me start off. So clearly it comes down to data. So we've heard a lot about that. We've heard about potential bias in the data. Uh, we heard about connectivity, maybe a digital divide. I might be uh, segmenting out different groups. Uh, what do you think Canada needs to do? in order to facilitate better and safer access uh, to broad and representative data. Um, so kind of a big question, we touched on a few elements, but if you can kind of think of it from a Canadian perspective, what can we do to be leaders in here? And I'll open it to uh, anyone who wishes to jump in first. I'm happy to just, uh, yeah, so um, uh, I think it's a very important question. And uh, I think the, the solution to some of the issues mentioned here is basically comes to the government, government involvement in this, in creating the infrastructure. And one of the ideas that uh, I came into, and I think it's, it's an idea that's worth exploring, um, is creating data. 
And I know it's very, and you probably have something uh, to say about that too, but I know it's, it's a very challenging uh, way and it, I think it's a very challenging uh, thing to do, creating data. So first of all, how you create data, who should be responsible for creating this data. But uh, just uh, you know, from learning from, ex from some examples, uh, in Israel, this is one of the initiatives that uh, the, uh, the Ministry of Science is doing for the last, I think, three or four years. I'm not, I'm not saying that is, is, is actually really good right now, but I'm saying that it's something that might resolve some of the problems. And uh, I know that creating data, what we call synthetic data, is not always a solution, and some of the engineers that I spoke with, and, and maybe um, uh, you have to say something, you might have some, some, say something about that too, uh, told me that it's not really perfect and it's not really reflecting or resembling uh, actual data. Uh, but I think that if we try to think about what we should do ahead and considering the issues that I, I call that, you know, privacy is a barrier, but obviously as, as, you, as some of the other panelists mentions, mentioned as well, uh, we, we should also be really uh, aware of the of the issues of the problem that we have with privacy, um, so I think this is exactly what the government should do and explore this area and try to find ways to creating uh, data for researchers, data for companies, for startup companies, not only you know for public use but also for commercial purposes. Because this is, I think this is one way that we can support this type this type of initiative because these initiatives cost a lot of money, and I'm not saying that the government should be responsible for. Uh, putting all this, uh, all, the, all the funding for these projects, uh, uh, you know, by the government might be some sort of uh, uh, an industry and some some sort of cooperation between government and other and other partners as well. Um, yeah. I'd like to offer a differing opinion to that. Um, mm -hmm. If you're relying on government to uh, collect that data. The type of people that interact with government and government-related organizations are not um, reflective of the entire society. So uh, that data in itself could end up being biased. And so, you know, I, I think that uh, being aware of uh, who's touching that, you know, who, whose data you're collecting is really important. Just as important as what biases are going to be included in your algorithms and. So I, I, you know, I think that uh, it may be one way to look at it, but also to consider that. But just, just to comment for, for that, I'm, I'm not only saying that we're creating the data, but sorry, by uh, collecting the data, but also creating the data. So you're right, that's uh, one of the issues that we are facing in research right now with government is that it's not really you know, aware of all other uh, partners and all other uh, um, uh, groups. Uh, but that's why I think that w the government should be responsible for facilitating the project, but obviously it's not supposed to be a project that the government will, you know, only will be the only partner, because if that would eventually happen, I agree, that will result in, 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 certain, in certain bias issues. But the government should be willing and able to lead the project and to lead the group, uh, sort of uh, uh, building a consortium of partners that will uh, create this type of uh, synthetic data. Yeah, I would also add that it, it's not that I don't think government can do it. It's will it be done in a timely way? We look at the legislation, for example, and, and the fact that we don't have the regulatory framework. And I think of other components along that data continuum. I'm back in my loop. Things like cyber standards, um, de-identification, as you've said, and that is a moving target as to whether it's truly identified once we start thinking about the data linkages. The governance and oversight, uh, at some point, are we going on trust or binding people contractually? People can break contracts. But often, users will say, just tell me what I need to do. The health researchers will say, tell me what I need to do. Please make it simple. I will do it, but I want to move forward. So. One of my concerns is if we are waiting on a national robust solution, um, I think it's possible, but in the meantime, we still need to continue to advance. So I look at every project as to what data are we talking about? Is it identifiable? Um, how did we get it? Lots of questions about, as, you, as you've said, the, the bias, and I know bias assessment is the next frontier for sure. The de-identification, when we, gave a definition to the term de-identified in PHIPAA, the Ontario Health Privacy Legislation, years back. It was 
not reasonably foreseeable in the circumstances that it could be linked uh, to identify you. And now we're talking about coded data. Coded data generally is data that you can remove identifiers and, and someone here probably has a better definition, but just in terms of the ability to re-identify it. And the drafters came back some years ago, not that long ago, and said, well, we'll, talk, we'll call it de-identified data and we'll put a prohibition that we used to put into contracts saying third party can't attempt to re-identify it unless the health information custodian, say the hospital, healthcare provider, says they can. And I'm thinking, well, doesn't that mean that it wasn't de-identified in the first place? So again, I think there probably is an imperative to explore some of the technologies, including synthetic data, but it feels as though we need to do all of these and, and carry on in the way we did with cyber and de-identification where industry and uh, the health sector has simply said, we're going to keep moving. That's what Sick Kids is doing, it's what St. Mike's is doing, Chem each other organizations, um, because if we wait, anyway, I know it is aspirational, but but it is here now, and so what is the way forward in the moment? I can weigh in uh, a bit. I have some <coughs> conflicting thoughts, and when we talked as a group, we said, you know, the panel might get spicy, and so I think yeah. the, some of the comments might heat up a little bit. Um, from the synthetic data perspective, um, from a machine learning programmer perspective, often you think about leveraging synthetic data when there's an absence of data available, and so maybe um, rare diseases, um, you know, there's a project I have um, that looks at 3D photography of kids' heads and some of the syndromes are rare and so we use um, synthetic mechanisms for creating expanded data sets. But I think if you have the data available, then saying um, synthetic data, let's just use that, is like a, a crutch. It's saying that we can't figure out policy, we can't figure out access, so let's just make fake data and then build models off of that. So I see that as a, a bit of a crutch. Um, to not actually figuring out the issue at hand, which are solving some of these barriers around access, around regulatory, around privacy, et cetera. So that might not resonate well with people, but I think that's the truth. Um, the, the other piece is around, I'm conflicted from this whole idea around government versus startup and industry and where who's gonna solve this? Because when I think about things from a patient perspective, we really need sound policies, procedures, guidelines. Like we need to make sure that we don't have accidental harm translating to patients, that physicians aren't accidentally using these tools in inappropriate ways and leading to patient harm. And so to me, that's more of like a government role. Um, it's a regulatory role. It's um, the regulatory colleges that govern me as a physician have a role in that. Um, and so I think there's a really important place there. But then when I put my startup hat on, the very models that we want to translate, you know, very early next year, um, I can't get regulated, right? And, and the irony of it is I think these modeling techniques are actually safer than the models that are currently able to be regulated um, because they can adapt and adjust to changes in environment and uh, equate for like shifts in um, demographics and bias and whatnot. And so in a sense, the innovation in the startup space is actually a safer type of approach than what can even be allowed from government. And so that creates this interesting dilemma when I'm listening to these different opinions. Um, there needs to be uh, a role where both parties sort of synergize. Um, and if, you know, in this instance where we can't regulate adaptive machine learning models and we're totally holding back the field of AI in Canada on that front, um, there needs to be a mechanism where one can still apply to Health Canada uh, and um, demonstrate safety, efficacy, and get it approved while we wait for a national regulatory framework to be put into place. An opportunity for organizations like Health Canada to learn from that cutting edge innovation. So how do we enable both, right, um, I think is important. And, and I love the synthetic data, because I use it, yeah. but I just like, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it's not perfect. I don't want it to be a crutch for people to say, oh, let's not figure it, just make it. Yeah, it's, it's, right? it's, it's actually really funny because this is the type of conversation we all, you always have between lawyers and practitioners and industry leaders. So we are lawyers, so we are thinking about you know, certain structures when in fact when you look into you know, someone from the industry will tell you, I don't need these you know, structures. You need, you, you need to solve this issue for me. Don't build right. some, you know, some pathways. Yeah, you don't build some you know, uh, very uh, you know, uh, nice and elegant uh, legal framework. Just uh, do something tell that will work for me. Yeah, yeah, we need pathways to enable the translation of this technology safely. 
right? Easier said than done, but that's what's actually needed. I, I'll add one quick thing before we move on. We also have to get the public in it. And yeah. so we spend a lot of time on, do you need consent? Is it notice? What is the story we are telling? And when I say story, and I, I say this quite often, when I say story, I mean a true story. But historically over the years, fundraising or other initiatives in healthcare, there were certain patient populations where we said, well, no, we better have a list of, we can't reach out to them, or we won't have certain people, uh, patient groups participate in health research, for example. And ultimately, this data conversation, this is, this is my data, this is your data, it's everybody's data. And the story that people hear is what they see in the media, the negative, everything that's gone off the rails, which is happening in real time. And yet, what is the positive story about data and the moral imperative to <coughs> harness the data and move this forward with that engaged partner? So I think uh, it, it may be a competitive advantage for the companies and organizations that do it. Uh, I'm not saying that's the, exactly the right reason, but we're not doing a great job, at least in my view. very much for that. I see we may have a couple of questions from the floor, so uh, let's turn here and if you could please introduce yourself. Okay, uh, uh, this question is uh, for Dr. Singh. Uh, Dr. Singh, I'm also a doctor and we work in evidence base. So my question really is, taking into consideration safe and efficiency of using AI, do you think in your experience uh, the, the cost of uh, healthcare will go down because of using AI, because if, if that's the case, then I'm sure the government will say, hmm, that would be a good, uh, uh, th they will listen because of that. And the second question really is, I don't know if there is somebody from the health, uh, from the insurance company here, because if by using AI, will my malpractice premium will go down or will go up? Can I ask you one clarifying question? I know you're now skipping me. But by cost, do you mean <coughs> financial cost or do you mean like the cost of what could be on care, the cost on successful no, no. outcomes? Overall, healthcare, if using EI, because it's more efficient <coughs> and uh, it's targeted, it will come down. But do you mean like financial cost or do you mean like successful outcome cost? Like do you mean cost on human life? Uh, the, the, the final, uh, the, of course, you're taking into consider consideration the safety and uh, efficiency, basically it does. Yeah. So thank you so much for that question. I mean, the holy grail is sort of improving time efficiency, reducing cost, and improving care, that triangle, right? And so it's almost impossible to do. You usually think that if you're going to improve time or care, you got to increase cost. And so um, there's this like dream state where maybe machine learning, because software can be automated. Software is cheap uh, at the end of the day once it's developed and deployed compared to human labor. That maybe that is the holy grail and AI will be able to enable that. Um, certainly there's going to be a lot of additional costs though, right? So once you build the model and deploy it, um, you need teams of people to m ensure that the model is continuing to work really well, right? Um, and you need teams of developers. And so we might see a shift in where cost is being um, occurred or where, where cost is being spent or money is being spent. Um, but the promise of AI is just that, is that we reduce costs by gaining efficiency um, and while simultaneously improving care. And that's sort of what we're working towards. And I think when you talk about evidence-based medicine, um, we're getting towards this frontier now, particularly at SickKids, where we've built these models, um, we validated safety in a prospective silent trial, which means you just deployed it, you see that they're working, but you don't have it influence care at all. And then we need to move towards deployed um, clinical trials. And it's in those clinical type trials that will then generate that evidence to see, are we improving care, improving efficiency, while also doing cost analyses to see what happens. It's tricky in a publicly funded system, and at SickKids we're salary based, and so like, we kind of make up these cost units, and so how relevant is it actually? It's, it's a little bit tricky to measure the cost efficiency, but um, we're at the stage of doing that right now. Um, and then the second part of your question, 
uh, which I'm temporarily blanking on. What was the part, second part of the question? I'm coming off of a night shift, mind you, and I haven't slept yet for a long time. Um, and so maybe if you can remind me, just shout it out from. The insurance. Oh, yeah, this is a big dilemma. Yeah, yeah. Well, Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because then it, what you're kind of getting at is what is the standard of care going to become, right? And will you will leveraging machine learning become a bit of like an early adopter thing where it is perceived to be a bit more risky, so insurance goes up? Um, I don't think that's actually going to happen, though, right? I think what's going to happen is the shift to the standard of care will become this is a machine learning tool that's validated and it's determined to be more safe. And so it's expected of you um, to use that tool and to practice in that way. How we figure out assignment of liability, um, like if the hospital purchases the tool and you as the physician use it in a scenario, um, but it's purchased from a third party and something goes wrong, who's liable? I think that those questions need to be answered and the, the solution will probably be de determining on like where the failure point was. Did the software fail? Did the physician use the tool in the wrong way? Did the, well I don't know, the hospital has a really clever way, they have some very smart lawyers of, uh, downloading their liabilities to everyone else. <laughs> and so, um, but will the hospital, hospital be liable? Um, and so I don't think insurance cost is really gonna change significantly. Um, but I think that it will become expected to be insured um, that you follow the standard practice of care and that will eventually become leveraging these machine learning solutions. Yeah, I have had questions from clinicians saying, what if I don't agree? So again, maybe the tool ultimately says, you know, we've got a 96 percent predictive uh, outcome that is better than our you know, best or our average or whatever it is. But I've had clinicians at different junctures just say, but what if I don't agree with whatever I'm seeing and I'm gonna go with my clinical judgment? So I think, yeah, there's a, there's a lot to be determined on it for sure. Oh, two more. Oh, two more. Okay, good. Hi. Um, Dr. Goen touched on the significant cost of developing quality data sets, and I think um, Ms. Bawa has um, illustrated very well the tension that that causes with stakeholders when you try and utilize that um, more broadly, not just the person who develops that data set, but now they've got an asset that they're trying to, um, you know, whether it's commercialize or utilize. Um, unfortunately, in the data space, we don't have something like the legacy system of the patent system that allows that collaboration while reassuring those stakeholders. Um, we've heard a bunch of great solutions from the panelists, um, but I'm wondering in the absence of that legacy, have you as people who are in the trenches and in the field seen any of those solutions that have gotten more traction than others? Um, we can evaluate those solutions by their, you know, by what we suspect they're going to produce, but also we can evaluate them by have people adopted them, employed them? I remember th three, four years ago, we were talking about the E-Diamond yeah. case and data governance as a way to prevent that tragedy of medical information from occurring. Um, three years, four years later, have we seen any of the systems that were proposed back then or even these new systems that you propose today gaining any traction in any movement in the space? Or are they still generally theoretical? Who would like to take that one on? I feel like I can't answer this without being slightly biased. Um, <laughs> like, can I use the politically correct IT one and say it depends? Like, is it that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a legal one? I know too. it's also the legal. I have like I noticed everyone uses on it. Hand, but, um, on the other hand, like, I can sit there. So I'm like, okay, like, so we from Microsoft will come and speak and attest to this that like 
we have a number, like when you come and you talk to us, it's we always have a bunch of what we'll call Lego pieces and we build them and we work with yourselves to identify what do we need to capture, what use cases are we gonna be aligning to, what's terminology that we have to be respected for, like even in healthcare, we've created a, a specific subset of tools just to be able to see the terminology used in health and understand it. So like I can come to tell you, our suite can and come to do it all, but we also work with hundreds of thousands of partners, each specialized in varying industries, all coming to and saying the same thing. So I don't think that there is a silver bullet that's for it. I think there is certainly a much better understanding and focus now, because like we know PHI sensitive data, like a lot of institutions work with the banks and beyond that have PII data, which is also sensitive. So there's more and more respect being paid to it, but again, I can't tell you that anyone has, Microsoft's gonna be pissed, but I'm like, I can't tell you anyone has a magic button for it. It's just, we'll be working with yourselves and everyone in conjunction. Like a lot of the times we just make sure, especially on governance, like, have, like it's, we think of things people process technology. So I'm like, have you gone and identified, like do you have the stewards and such that are put in place? Like have you, like, have you done, what terms are important? Like, have we looked into metadata? What are we gonna need to tag? What are we gonna need to analyze? What are we gonna need to catalog? Again, what's that terminology that's set? How are we gonna explain how the data is being used? Like, who's touched it? How have they changed or manipulated it? What data should be presented to them? So I'm like, there's a lot of facets to it again. Like, the text just one piece, and I'm like, really, like, it can be whatever you want it to be. Like, every, like I said, there's Microsoft, we got another hundreds of thousands, Amazon does it, Google does it, like, all of us will do it. But I'm saying it's, it's the people and processes part which we have to dive into even more so and best define and then go and execute on that. So, I'm sorry, I wish I could say yes and that there was a one magic bullet, especially as Microsoft, but I'm like, I, I unfortunately, I can't. <laughs> but then also, like, what are the values you want to bake into that process, That's, right? Like, and how do you define those values? It is some of the hardest, like when we work with customers on this, like this isn't a like buy the button, press it and it works. Like this is multi months to years because then you're constantly refreshing, you're constantly reevaluating. like how a model drifts, so does all of these values. So I'm like it's something you're gonna have to continuously invest in and evolve and challenge and re-identify. Like you're right, like it's never, there's no one stop shop. Right, and so I guess my question is, is have you seen certain of those elements gain traction? The reason I bring this up is, is like Ms. Baba mentioned, there's an, there's an element of public adoption. I'm, I'm sorry, I think um, Ms. Dykeman also mentioned this, that there was an element of public adoption and, and bringing it to the public. Um, that is something that when we go and speak, you can talk to, right? The, pat the patent system, I brought that up, is something you can talk to because it's a, a more broad system. Right, and so it's un a little bit more understandable, although albeit complicated. So I was just wondering if, if there's something that gets put forth more often than others. That's really me. No. Thank you, and, and, that, and that's an honest answer, I, and I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you for that. Uh, we do have one more question from the floor. This is from Andrea in the chat. She asks, as one speaker noted, AI-driven innovation in health is a multidisciplinary team sport, and these team members don't always come from the same organization. Beyond benefiting patient outcomes, IP often creeps in as an important issue. How can we think about IP models that incentivize all players appropriately? Can you give a little bit of a plug on what we're experimenting with on the industry side with SickKids um, that's working really well? Um, and that's just that we, so we have access to all of this rich streaming EHR data for the purpose of, um, you know, creating these real-time models, deriving real-time insights. But regardless of who builds the model, whether it's someone on my industry side, whether it's um, someone on the SickKids side, because it was built off of patient data, you know, physician data, we have this deep respect for how that data was generated, that the IP will always sit with the hospital. Um, and we made that decision because it then just removed a lot of the barriers to collaboration, right? I thought it was the authentic thing to do, like people suffered in hospital to create this data, right? 
and so the, the IP, in our opinion, should be owned by the people, and in Canada, those are the hospitals. Um, it was also a way of sheltering the IP from investment. As we go and fundraise in the next couple of years, we're going to get investors from who knows where. I want them to be Canadian, but you know, even when you think they're Canadian, the money somehow comes from the U.S. And then what happens inadvertently is Canadian IP um, gets exported to the U.S. even when you never wanted it to be. And so having the IP owned by the hospital um, and having the AI delivery mechanism be the thing that's owned by the startup is a way of sheltering the IP even um, when we get investors from all these places. And so that strategy has been really popular um, for us. We've, it's broken down so many barriers in, in the hospital for collaboration. And it's one approach. I also agree with that. Again, I'll just speak from the platform advisor. I feel like if you leave a lot of this with any, like again, any one of the vendors that's providing the platform for it, you're going to have a view that is specifically sent to what can be monetized and what can be reused at scale. So a lot of times when we sit there, it's, yes, we want to make sure it's our customers that are owning the IP, that they are owning the collateral, it is their data, it is not something that we have come to create, because then you'll have questions of the transparency behind it, you can have questions on like, again, what bias was coming from behind the algorithms and beyond it, what's the use and how's it being extended at a multitude. So. Like, I, I agree with you. I think it should truthfully come from the institutions or, and like we're saying, and then it is everyone who would like to participate, you should be providing, like we're saying, what is the level of support, but always in guidance of that it is like, if it's the institution of any kind for the best intention, I don't ever agree that it should be like the platforms that are doing it. Like I think about some of the EHRs and it's almost like a little black box where it's like you just get an output and you have no idea how the data is being used or what data is being used and if that's being resold to another 37 plus institutions on the back end. So I'm like, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you on that. All right, thank you. Uh, we have uh, another question here. Ian? Thank you. So it sounds like good work is being done at the research hospitals. And that Sick Kids, for example, and Trinity or Unity, sorry, are doing a really good job keeping the bar high. But we've also heard that, Devin, you're saying you're not regulated by Health Canada when you're building a model in-house that isn't for commercial or you're not you're distributing it in some way. So my question for the panel is, how do we make sure that the wonderful work being done at the very rich hospitals in the middle of Toronto on unique patient populations for the most part and benefiting unique patient populations finds its way out into the community hospitals so that we're not, by building AI, again, further creating or exacerbating inequity within our healthcare system. What kind of solutions are being bantied about in the industry? I just want to jump in real quick and put my lawyer hat on, even though I'm not a lawyer. And I, I did not say that um, we're not being regulated with what we're building in-house, <laughs> um, because there's lots of regulation that we're, we're paying attention to. Um, but I mean, to your point, Ian, like if we build a model at SickKids and we want to translate it to another hospital, rapid fire, what are the barriers? Well, how do we get access to their data? So do we deploy on-prem or do they feel comfortable putting it into a cloud? And there's all these privacy concerns that that hospital have. The second piece is then if I'm going to deploy it from SickKids to another hospital in a sustainable way, I probably need to sell it or I need like government to pitch in and say, hey, we're gonna fund this program because this is awesome and therefore I don't need to sell it. If I'm gonna sell it, it needs to be regulated. Um, and then the types of models that we're all building these days can't be regulated because they're all adaptive because that just makes sense, that's what we should do. It makes no sense to build um, a static uh, machine learning model that then deteriorates over time but that's what we regulate at Health Canada. And I love Health Canada because um, we collaborate with them. But that's just like the state of affairs, right? So we, we can't do it outside of like research agreements. And so we may have a trial um, of some kind or we may create an REB approved research study that allows us to you know, pool our data together um, and deploy these models and, and get something off the ground. But that's really just like a cloak to you know, a proof of concept that actually isn't sustainable for the long run. And, and we do that while we wait for, you know, the folks in this room to help us figure out um, how do we actually move this work forward. Yeah, I'll, I'll pitch in to agree on that front because, again, amongst the teaching hospitals and, and other healthcare organizations, often things do get couched as research. Mm -hmm. And I always think from day, day one back to is it identifiable data? Is it going to be de-identified? Is there some other solution? But then once we're down the path, is it for healthcare? Is it for research? Is it for quality improvement or health system planning? 
we've got to figure this out because quite often research, health research, as you know, in Canada is regulated. We have frameworks, we have guidance, we have things that need to be done. We don't necessarily have them in the same way elsewhere, but I've had a number of uh, platforms that I've worked with where we started as research, then we morphed over to QI, and then we morphed back to research. And so we've been saying, well, let's not do it nine times. Let's sit down and have an open conversation about all of the places this might go and so that we can actually scale it, protect it, but we're, we're spinning a little bit, I'd say. Uh, yes, we have a question from Professor Weber. Um, I was a little uh, surprised, well, well, not really surprised, uh, when you say IP should be owned by the hospital. Uh, that's neat from the hospital's perspective, but somehow you'd, well, what happened to the patient here? Can I suggest another model? where the patient retains the right and exclusively licenses you, but uh, so that you have rights that you can play around with, but that uh, there are conditions built in to the relationship between you and the patient that enables the patient to have some control over what's happening uh, to what is, I mean, we, we can't, we either are calling this data proprietary to the patient, we're calling it proprietary to the hospital, or we're calling it proprietary to everyone, right? It's difficult to say everyone. Uh, ownership, uh, joint ownership by 30 million people and their descendants is a tricky concept. So you have to, I think, think in perhaps in those sort of <coughs> rather more binary terms, giving you rights to transfer something, but not giving you total rights of control vis-a-vis -vis the patient. And that's, uh, I think there's a question there somewhere where you probably can divine it out. <laughs> I mean, I think that's a, re a really great point. I mean, part of the philosophy of when we say, um, well, let's keep the IP in the hospital, really what we're trying to get at is let's keep the IP with the patients. And I know, technically speaking, it's not actually with the patients, though. It's with the hospital. And so um, what you raise is a, philosophically a really interesting idea that very much respects the patient's um, I say suffered, because I think going to the hospital is kind of suffering, um, to generate that data. Um, but then when I think about operationally and technically speaking, how do we make that come to life? Um, is that part of uh, a consent process? Um, does there then need to be like, almost like when you're a shareholder of a company and you want to make a decision like um, to commercialize or release, a, do then people get like a vote um, who contributed their data to that IP and is there like technology that would actually enable that to happen? I mean, certainly it could be done um, if the right technical system was in place to facilitate. Um, it also gets me wondering about uh, a parallel concept that I worry about with the idea that we will withdraw patient data or the right to be forgotten. Because that um, I think philosophically is, is the right thing to do. but. I get worried from an operational perspective when I've trained a model and we've deployed it out and then now I need to have the model forget that patient. Like how do I operationalize that? And so there's like a conflict there that's really interesting. I think the point really is... Um, and you've, you've suggested it without actually saying it. This is really a negotiation between patient and hospital. You can have set terms as part of a negotiation consent form, but it's something which I think requires patient input. Uh, whether it's through a patient uh, collective initially, and so you have sort of a, a collective agreement, as it were, with a hospital mm -hmm. relation, that. Mm -hmm. so it doesn't have to be one by one. But uh, I think it's 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 the way that you put it. I think you can I can see the the notion of the hospital as a sort of a trustee for the patients mm -hmm. uh, and administering the IP on their behalf. Yeah. But the legal structure that you've put into place is I'm the owner. So what the hell uh, is I'm not suggesting that's what you feel, but that's, that's the nature of the structure that you've suggested, where ownership means total control, is not perhaps quite the structure that uh, I would find terribly uh, conducive for patient welfare. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Right, uh, thank you for the questions and the, uh, the great discussion. Uh, we do have just a couple of moments left. Uh, perhaps I could turn to the panelists for a quick uh, closing remark. And I'll just pose this last question to help frame that. 
The technology is moving at lightning speed. Uh, the potential for benefit is vast. And we know that the data security privacy rules, regulations have not caught up yet. How hopeful are you that they will converge at one point where you can actually start doing good work? Do you want me to go first? Yes, please. <laughs> I mean, I'm very hopeful, right? I have to be hopeful because we're in the space, we're doing these panels, we're raising awareness. Um, and so I'm very hopeful within the next five to eight years, <laughs> we'll see like a real convergence of some of these regulatory mechanisms coming into place. There'll be conflict with industry and with those reforms caused. But I think what we'll really benefit from is a clear runway of this is what we need to do to translate. Um, but I do think that we need to step back from the technology, step back from the policy and all of it, and remember like these are human patients um, at, the, at the core of all of this, right? And so um, we need to stay human-centric in the way we build these models. We need to stay very respectful of what our values are as a society. How do we capture what those values are? Um, I suppose that's through voting and the people who take office. But I think that these need to be really key issues um, that people then can have representative of their values that then get these regulatory and these privacy things put into place. And um, the only way that we're going to see true convergence is actually stepping back from the technology, the policy, and thinking about what are our values and how do we then capture those values in the way we build the system that enables AI to translate broadly. Um, and uh, maybe I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Yes. So. Uh, I share optimism of uh, my, uh, my friends, my colleagues. I think that we are uh, on the right path. And uh, I think the role, as my uh, colleague, uh, Professor Zeidman said, uh, law should not be causing any problems. And I think that the, prob the, the issue that we should stick and we should find resolution to is how to create the right balance. And this is also something that is, is done here with the AI and Society uh, a new, uh, new center. I think this is exactly what we need to do. We have to frame the questions and try to look into the right solution that will serve society. And uh, when we find this right balance, I think that we can uh, uh, at least uh, take away some of the problems, some of the barriers, and look forward into creating something that is, uh, is serving society better, and patients, and, and obviously uh, the, all the other partners that are sitting around this uh, table. Thank you. Uh, I'll say even if the technology can do it, whatever that is, it doesn't mean that it should. So we'll go back to the multidisciplinary piece of gathering the people and creating a culture such that it does not go too far if, if for example, there's bias detected or, you know, we cannot explain it, it's not transparent, or there are harms that are being detected because we do a lot of work with developers as well, and they sometimes say, well, I knew in the room on that day that this was not going to end well, and there wasn't a culture where someone could step forward at that time. So I think that's a piece of it. I, having said that, I'm extremely optimistic. I think we can do it. I'm optimistic as well. Um, the only thing is, I think culture is not enough. Um, I think appropriate regulation. I know. Oh, I'm in for that too. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, being in industry uh, when the GP, uh, GP, GPD, uh, GDPR. GDPR came into force, uh, it was the monetary fines that uh, really resulted in traction and the fam and the companies uh, taking the right action to try and ensure that they were compliant. And so ensuring that the bad actors have consequences uh, with appropriate regulation um, is probably something that we will need to really um, you know, enjoy the benefit of AI. Um, so I think appropriate regulation that allows for innovation but also prevents harm is uh, something that I'd like to see. Um. What I'll tell yourselves from the field, I'm like, I'm like optimistic more than, I'm like, we have hospitals that are putting their hand up saying, we know this is important, it's something we want to undertake and go on the journey. We have the government not only saying the same thing, but also looking to create what are panels or what are like what we're going to call SWAT teams to say it's something we want to focus. Like there's documentation called the health data platform that our federal government's releasing. So it's, 
I agree with you, Devin, on it taking five to eight years. Like, I, like it's not going to be something that's quick. Like, remember, this is uncharted territories. Like, everyone's going to dip their toe really slowly into ice water. But just know that, like, it's happening. It's been identified. Fortunately, we have, like, what I'll call role models in other countries. Like, Australia has done this. I said the UK. The US did what you just discussed now, where it's, they said you're going to mandate your data on fire, or else we're not paying any of your medical claims. And obviously, that really worked quickly. So. It's, we'll have a number of things to look to that can help be a North Star for us, but more than optimistic, everyone seems to know that this is important. I think now it's just figuring out how do we take saying it's important and actualize it, so. All right, well, thank you all very much. Uh, let's uh, give the uh, panel a round of applause for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Well, now it's time to take a break. And uh, Spot is waiting for you outside. Um, and we'll be back here for 3 o'clock. Are we taking a picture across or standing up? Okay.
All right, so I'll get us started. So we're very excited that you're all here with us for uh, an official launch and uh, official digital presence of the new Center for AI and Society at York University. And it is my great privilege to welcome our fearless and tireless leader, and he actually just waltzed over from the Caniff Tower to be with us today, Dr. Amir Asif. He, of course, is the Vice President of Research and Innovation here at York University, and uh, James and I, Professor James Elder, who uh, will speak momentarily, have had the great honor to be working with him over the last number of years. Dr. Asif was already well known to members of the York community when he was appointed as the Vice President of Research and Innovation back in May 2020, and it was just at the height of the pandemic, right? So I'm sure there's lots of stories there. Um, and uh, he was known because, of course, he served as the founding chair of the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from 2006 to 2014 here at York. Now, he has more than 15 years of experience serving in senior university leadership positions. And most recently, he was the founding dean of the Gina Cody School of Engineering and Computer Science at Concordia University in Montreal, where he developed that school's strategic plan, inspiring a new generation of engineers and computer scientists. Now, we're fortunate that he's uh, you know, left Montreal and come back here to be with us at York, as he now elevates York's many researchers and is an avid supporter of all things AI and our many programs. And we're so grateful that he's agreed to say a few words. And uh, as we launch in many ways, I think his own baby. And Amir, really, this is all on you. You were phenomenal and had the vision and foresight to see that we needed to galvanize uh, the spirit of AI within the university and make this happen. And um, so, uh, Dr. Asif, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fina. Merci beaucoup. Bon après-midi, mesdames et messieurs. Good afternoon, everyone. So talking of um, COVID, I was actually sitting like 10 minutes ago in my office, you know, uh, thinking that it was an online conference. <laughs> and then I realized, I looked at my, my, my calendar and I, I, I realized, well, it's, a, it's an in-person conference, so I really had to rush um, to come in here. But anyway, it's such a pleasure to, speak, uh, to be speaking to this esteemed uh, colleagues and extreme group of researchers. So let me start by thanking Tina for putting together such a wonderful event. Um, you know, I'm, I'm so proud to celebrate your work, Tina, and the work of your co-director, uh, Dr. James Elder. James and I, we happen to be from the same department, the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, and our research work is qu quite similar as well. He works in machine learning, I work in, in signal processing, so many of the underlying principles and technologies and algorithms are more or less the same. In fact, I, you know, at one particular time, I took a course as a faculty member, which uh, James was teaching on, on machine learning way back. <laughs> anyway, so um, I would also like to recognize our partners in this collaborative event. First and foremost, Microsoft Canada uh, and the academics that joined us from abroad. From abroad. Uh, who is the representative for Microsoft Canada? If you could just... Just right. She just left. Okay. So, in terms of the the Center for Artificial Intelligence Society, uh, I just can't hide my excitement about this. As you know, artificial intelligence is at the heart of uh, modern day technology. Um, but you know, I think the the why York is different. Where York. Uh, is, uh, I guess, uh, takes an edge over other Canadian universities and other universities across the world, is actually the application of artificial intelligence in, in social sciences, humanities, STEM-related areas, law, etc. All of us know, 
you know, if artificial intelligence is used in the wrong way, and we've got so many lawyers in the room, so many of you would probably be involved in lawsuits. So if artificial intelligence is used in the wrong way, they are, they are serious ethical issues. And, and this particular center is, is one that is not only, not only going to focus on the artificial intelligence technology, it's development itself, but perhaps more importantly on the application of artificial, artificial intelligence to, to, to the benefit of society. Um, as you know, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing this United Nations SDG badge, um, our university academic plan focuses on the 17 UN SDG goals. And I think um, um, artificial intelligence is, is a solution to addressing many of the problems that are highlighted in those UN sustainability development goals. Um, the, uh, the work on this particular center started many years back and, and James Elder and Pina D'Agostino has taken a leadership role ever since we, we started talking about, uh, thinking about the center. There was a task force which was led by both of them and they came up with a report uh, and let me uh, read the name so that I don't get it wrong. Uh, this was a report from the task force on artificial intelligence and society called Fostering the Future of Artificial Intelligence. And it came up with several recommendations. And one of the recommendations was the establishment of an organized research unit, which is really a center of excellence um, in, the, in the context of York University. It brings together researchers from, from several disciplines. You know, you see Oscar and Lausanne School of Engineering, but also from health, uh, faculty of health, faculty of liberal arts and professional studies, faculty of science. Um, you know, many other faculties, and, and I, I see some, some individuals in here who are sitting, I see um, Ali sitting in here who leads the Disaster and Emergency Management, the United Nations CFEL Center in, the, in, in, in Disaster and Emergency Management. So it, it kind of provides, the, uh, provides a collaborative background for, uh, for these researchers who have such an interdisciplinary background to get together and solve some of the, what we call the more complex uh, societal problems. Um, so York has diverse research expertise in this area, as I've previously mentioned, but perhaps, you know, uh, the, most importantly, this, uh, the societal impacts, including political, legal, ethical, and social context. Um, this broad capacity positions York to be a leader in, in fostering the positive integration of artificial intelligence into, into society. So for this, uh, my appreciation to James Elder, as well as Pina D'Agostino, for, for the work they have done for almost three years now and, and, and making sure that we, we reach this particular stage. The other thing that is important is that when we were looking at uh, someone to, to lead this particular uh, organized research unit, uh, we thought that Pina and James are an, are, are an ideal professional couple to lead this, uh, given the fact that they have such different backgrounds. James is an engineer, but he's also a professor in psychology. So he has diverse background, and then Pina comes with law and has, um, has been really the, the force behind the success of IP Osgood. Um, so I think I'm, I'm, I've gone beyond my notes. Um, so again, at the very end, I would like to um, wish you the best of luck. Uh, and for others who are, who are in here, I want to extend this opportunity to you that York is a place for interdisciplinary collaboration. It is world renowned in this particular area. So please feel welcome. Please, um, uh, you know, I encourage you strongly to collaborate not only with this center, but we have, uh, we have another 29 centers of excellence in different areas. And if you see that there's an opportunity to develop collaboration, please feel free to reach either to me or to my team or to Pina and James Elder. With that, uh, congratulations once again and wish you the very best. We are counting on you. All right, so now um, I've done a lot of chatting, I was saying, so I would really love for you to meet my founding co-director, the amazing Professor James Elder. <laughs> So James and I have been working together for a number of years and um, you know, from every step of the way, convening the task force, uh, collecting the data, putting it together, and then presenting it and launching it. James, I, it's about a year now. November 16, I think I have here, November 16, 2021, was when we launched the Fostering the Future of Artificial Intelligence report. And here we are a year later. 
launching the new Center for AI in Society. So couldn't be more pleased, and with that, over to you. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Pina, and it's a delight to be here. I won't take too much time. I just want to say a few things. So first of all, thank you for organizing this amazing event. I think this is the kind of uh, really broad and multidisciplinary uh, event that we will be typical of what we'll try to do with the new center. Um, and it's been a delight to work with you, and I'm looking forward to many years of productive collaboration. I also really want to thank Amir, because um, you know it's one thing to write a report. It's another to actually uh, take action and do something. And Amir has been incredibly supportive in trying to turn those words into really positive initiatives. And so thank you, Amir, for that support. Yeah. Um, and as Amir mentioned, I am a uh, colleague of Amir's in the Lausanne School of Engineering. Um, and of course, I'm super excited about the potential for AI just from the point of view of being an engineer um, and a futurist. Um, I'm also excited about AI as a scientist, so I'm also in the Faculty of Health Department of Psychology. And AI models are becoming incredibly important for as models of uh, computational neuroscience, of, of uh, how the brain uh, does computations to support intelligence, perception, and memory, and so forth. So that's also really exciting from a scientific point of view. Um, but as Amir mentioned, the Center for AI and Society is much broader than that. So it is drawing from seven faculties at York University. And so it's really, as the name suggests, not just about the science and engineering of AI, but very much about the integration into society and all of not just the potential positive things, but also the potential risks and understanding how we um, you know, take advantage of those uh, potentials while uh, mitigating those risks, and in particular, trying to be as inclusive as possible and considering all members of society. So, um, so that's really at the heart of, of what we want to do. Um, and just maybe the last thing I'll mention is it's really uh, not just about integrating those faculties, but of course reaching out uh, to our partners in uh, industry and the public sector in Canada. So it's really exciting to see um, people here from, from you know, nearby uh, industry, Microsoft and, and Electra, and of course our, uh, our friends in the city of Vaughan and so forth. So we have lots of exciting projects in general in the region of York, city of Vaughan and Markham and so forth. And we really think York is positioned ideally to be a good partner uh, on those projects. And that's really, you know, the key equation, turning our research into, into actual um, uh, results, policy and product and so forth that can improve people's lives. Um, it really is that partnership between university and industry and the public sector that makes that happen. And then just finally, of course, uh, AI is really a global initiative, and so it's also about those collaborations with our international partners. So it's really great to see um, our, our uh, partners from uh, various countries, uh, the UK and Israel and elsewhere here today. So we're looking forward to building stronger relationships with, uh, with you and your organizations. Okay, and that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Pina. A call out to uh, each of you here today with us, uh, both online and in our physical presence that um, we're here. We want you to know that we want to work together, and I see already many of the researchers across the university uh, here with us. Thank you. So we look forward to hearing from you. We do want to do great things and uh, make you proud, uh, Amir. And uh, also, we just, as we're just starting out, I have to really say thank you to uh, Ian Stedman, Professor Stedman has been working on the website, and uh, he's been phenomenal, right? We've seen a lot of emails go back and forth, and we're finally live today. Now, the website is not fully built, but at least, yes, there's a skeletal form there, but nonetheless, uh, expect to see more great things on the website. And if you have any thoughts, suggestions for what you would like to see on that website. Um, oh, follow us on Twitter. Case at York U, okay, and that's a case in point, right? Uh, so, and I, 
<laughs> I was waiting for that. I love the, the uh, acronym and, you know, to just keep making jokes about it. It's good. So um, with that, thank you and look forward to working with you and uh, seeing you at our next event, really. Uh, see what CASE does. So uh, thanks once again. All right, so that's a wrap for our launch. Um, now from launch to celebration. So we're gonna be celebrating the uh, David Weber uh, Medal of Excellence in Intellectual Property. So we'll go right into that. So if I could have um, Justice Rothstein, Professor Weber. The students will come. I think you should have them up on the So. Okay, right. So we'll probably. Oh. Okay, Aviv, uh, Ian, do you want to come up, the, the recipient, or do you want to? Yeah, okay. So we'll have you set up already. You already know who you are. <laughs> so Ryan, you could come up too. And Bonnie. Okay, we'll have you seated. So like any great conference, right, we want to end with celebration. And in 2018, IP Osgood founded and awarded the first IP Osgood David Weber Medal of Excellence in IP. Now, the award was created in recognition of uh, my very dear friend, colleague, mentor, and world luminary in IP, and as I like to call him, Il Miglior Fabro. And I also like to call him Professore, and he's the only one I will call Professore, and that's Professor David Weber. And of course, we heard from uh, Dean Ziemer about uh, his, um, you know, how much he's just benefited and learned working with Professor Weber, and so many of us have here in this room. I mean, if you just had a, uh, if you were here for the previous panel, you will have been privy to his very witty and astute interventions and that's you know just on any number of topics you will see him weigh in with uh, class and uh, intelligence and authority so that's something that um, you know I really cherish and I feel very honored and privileged um, to have him at this great institution and to have named this award in his honor for the benefit of our students who are sitting here so it's important really that um, also, we, I thought important to honor him because he was also, um, you know, invested into the Order of Canada and uh, for his incredible career as a leader in IP. So we commemorated that and we put together this award. Now, the thing is, is that since 2018, we've actually given the award uh, on paper uh, but not really, they, they're, our students have never actually received the medal. And the medal was also a labor of love because we wanted to make sure staying true 
to the values of Professor Weber and uh, you know, artistic integrity and originality, we actually commissioned an artist to uh, design the medal for us. So it's a beautiful medal, and you see uh, in the poster there, but you will see it live very soon. Um, and uh, Aries Chung, of course, also designer for the Canadian Mint. Um, so we were lucky to get him and uh, design something that um, I think is also very fitting, if you know Professor Weber, of his uh, artistic style. And he is a, is a very good connoisseur of uh, art. <laughs> um, so um, the medal, the students, and all of this, we thought we, we need to do something um, because we have been largely deprived, really, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, we wanted to make things better. So here we are. And every year, we've given the medal to a graduating student, uh, either JD or in the graduate class, um, for not only academic excellence, but really exuding the spirit of Professor David Weber. So that's key. They have to be involved and committed and involved in all things IP and technology at the law school, at York University, and in our community beyond. And I think um, I can say this with uh, confidence that when I look at the recipients, um, you know, they exude these qualities. Now, of course, any award ceremony um, would not be proper without some uh, official remarks. And we've asked Justice Rothstein to prepare a few remarks in honor of Professor David Weber and this medal ceremony. So, Justice Rothstein, the podium is yours. Thank you, Pina. Medals and awards are named after individuals for a variety of reasons. I will tell you the reason the IP Osgood Award for Academic Excellence and Significant Contribution uh, to Research in Intellectual property, pro property carries the name the David Weber Medal. In my prior remarks, I referred to iconic figures. Professor David Weber, one of the foremost, foremost academics of our generation, is an iconic figure. I have Professor Weber's CV. It's well over 20 pages in length. I'm not going to read it to you. <laughs> Rather, I'm going to tell you a story. Having regard to the subject matter of Dean Zemmer's remarks at lunch today, it's fitting for me to tell you this story. That David Weber is with us today is truly a miracle. David was born one year after the end of the Second World War to Holocaust survivors in what was then Czechoslovakia. David's mother, who had been in hiding in Poland, was sent to Czechoslovakia by her brother early in the war. At the train station in Czechoslovakia where she got off, she approached a couple of local men to get directions. The younger man, uh, uh, the younger man about her age was a fair-haired Czech farmer who told her it was some distance away, but he could take her there in his horse and cart. Along the way, he persuaded her that it was not safe to travel further and instead found her some accommodation close to where he was living. She was young, about 21, and she was very pretty. She stayed with a woman who took her in that first day for the rest of the war. After some months, the young man revealed to her complete surprise that like her, he too was Jewish, using false papers, and was an active member of the Czech resistance. David's mother was able to pass on information to the young man about train timetables she picked up from her cleaning job at the railway station and thereby assist the resistance 
in disrupting German supply trains. The two married when the war ended and went to Cheb in western Czechoslovakia, where David was born in March of 1946. <clears throat> David's father worked in a typewriter factory in Czechoslovakia after the war. Eventually, the family went to Paris. David's mother had an older sister who had lived in Paris, but understandably, David's parents wanted to get as far away from Europe as they possibly could. The New Zealand government was looking for skilled people and granted refugee status to the family for them to sail to New Zealand. They all became naturalized New Zealand citizens very soon afterwards. David arrived in New Zealand at age four, speaking only French. His first teacher had to buy a dictionary to be able to communicate with him until he began to learn English. David's father started a typewriter business in New Zealand by buying secondhand typewriters and repairing and reselling them. He did this in his spare time as well as holding down two full-time warehouse and factory jobs. David's mother, who had wanted to be a fashion designer, made men's ties. David's parents were always grateful to the New Zealand couple who took the young family under their wing after meeting them at the refugee camp in New Zealand where they lived, where they lived when they first arrived. In the New Zealand couple saw how hard David's parents worked and acted as guarantors for the first bank loans his father took out to set up his first shop. The business grew as David's father began to import European typewriters and offer a full repair service. David, from the beginning, helped his parents with the paperwork, especially the correspondence, until his parents added English to the half dozen languages that they already had spoken. David also helped out at the shop after school and demonstrated typewriters by showing off his incredible speed at the keyboard. He was the New Zealand typewriting champion when he was 12, <laughs> typing more than 120 words a minute on a, on a manual machine. He beat all of the New Zealand top secretaries for the national prize and got his picture in all the newspapers. So there was an alternative opportunity for David if academics didn't work out. David's parents actually moved to Australia where they set up a highly successful similar business importing and distributing typewriters from all around the world and selling and repairing them in shops they owned in several Australian cities. What a remarkable couple were David's parents and what a remarkable gene pool to be the product of. I told you about Professor Favor's CV. I'll summarize. David has been a professor of intellectual property law at the University of Auckland, University of British Columbia, Oxford University, and Osgood, and continues at Osgood. He could not have held these positions without outstanding academic credentials. I'm not going to go over them. Trust me, they are outstanding. He has won myriad teaching and other awards and appointments, including the Order of Canada. They say about academics, publish or perish. I have another 20 pages of David's publications. No fear of perishing for this workhorse. When I speak to lawyers about advocacy skills, I always start off by telling them to remember who their best teachers were. They were the teachers that understood the subject so well that they were able to simplify it and make it easy to understand. Because in a factum or in court, the lawyers are teaching the judges. All the judges want are simple, direct, and reliable explanations of the facts and the law. I will tell you that at the Supreme Court of Canada, the judges all believe David Favor is the finest of teachers. The proof of that is the number of times his work is cited in Supreme Court judgments, sometimes by both a majority and dissent in the same case, but for different purposes, I hasten to add. By my count, 23 times by the Supreme Court of Canada, having regard to the fact that the Supreme Court hears very few intellectual property cases, 
that has to be a record in terms of citation intensity. I doubt that there has been an intellectual property decision issued by the Supreme Court in the last two decades that hasn't referred to David Vaver's work. Indeed, his work was cited earlier this year in the SOCAN VESA case. According to Quick Law, his work has been cited hundreds of times in all courts. This is a remarkable attestation of the regard the bar and the bench have for Professor Vaver's scholarship. Intelligence, dedication to standards of excellence, uncompromising integrity, a sense of humor, all powerful qualities that are David Vaver. Those of us who have benefited from Professor Vaver's enormous contributions are indeed fortunate. Those of us who know David personally are all the more enriched. Those are the reasons why we have the David Vaver Medal. It's a privilege for me today to introduce Professor David Vaver. Okay, so just to mention, William Foster, so Will actually was the one student who did receive the medal uh, the first year that we launched it, and uh, he also wanted to be here in a show of solidarity, but he was called into a trial, so expresses his regrets, but nonetheless, we have some beaming students here ready to receive their medal for the first time. So in order of, uh, well, let's go in order of the, the year, 2019. We now have Professor Aviv Gaon. Yeah, so you get to, yep. And uh, one thing I should note is that as um, as professors, we like to give homework. <laughs> so <laughs> what I asked each of the students was to prepare no more than two minutes of some <laughs> some remarks, and uh, this was the question, I'll, 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 ha I'll share yeah, it. So. so what does this award mean to you? And how does it prepare you to engage with AI and emerging technology in your career? Um, okay, so uh, thank you very much, Pina. Um, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Weaver and uh, Justice Rochden. Um, Professor Pina D'Agostino, uh, the founder and director of API Osgood, uh, and the co-director of the new RU in, in AI Center, and uh, Professor David Weaver, whom need no introduction or no further introduction, my dean, Professor uh, Lior Zemmer, Justice Rochten, uh, distinguished guests, friends, and colleagues, I'm truly honored uh, to receive the David Weaver Medal for IP Excellence. This medal reflects, as, as Pina asked to uh, say earlier, reflects the highlights of the academic journey I embarked back in uh, 2015 when I stepped into these halls, anxious and excited. I first met Professor Weber, I don't know if he remembers that, but I first met him when he attended the conference Professor Zemmer organized um, back, uh, back on those days. And I vividly remember, and I think this is one of the, one of the key points that I want to make here, I vividly remember how deeply uh, your remarks, Professor Weber, touched me and the discussions moved uh, moved me toward this, uh, this path that I took. Uh, today I realized that during those talks and those discussions uh, back then, uh, the seeds for my academic journey uh, were planted. Throughout the past several years, Professor Wavers and, and Pina and Lior uh, guided me in the academic maze, uh, or more truthfully to some of the professors that are here, um, the academic Machiavellian reality, as, as we, can, we can say, dealing with a lot of issues that some of them related to, to scholarship, but others uh, not necessarily. Um, Pina once told me um, in secret, now I'm going to re reveal that, that uh, there is a secret club, uh, a prestigious club, uh, and I can't be prouder uh, to be uh, considered to be part of this club, and I'm obviously talking about the David Weaver Club, and uh, it is my, my greatest honor to be considered to work, to work with, with you, with, uh, with Pina, and to be a, a, a worthy of, uh, of uh, this uh, reward. And uh, I'm looking forward to continue the award 
uh, aspiring for academic excellence and bearing this medal in great, great honor. Thank you. <laughs> You've written a couple of books too, so seven. <laughs> this will, I guarantee this will get you a very good restaurant reservation as well. <laughs> Congratulations, Alan. Mm. Okay, next, yes, Professor the Ian Stedman, the twenty twenty. Don't drop it. <laughs> thank you, Tina. Thank you, Professor Waver and Justice Rustin. I thank you everyone for being here today. So I have a bit of a, a different entry point to, to your world in that I'm not an IP scholar. I didn't come doing my, I did my PhD here at, at Osgood, but I didn't come thinking I was going to be doing uh, tech work. Actually, my work is in public sector ethics and accountability. But a few years before I came back to do my academic work, my graduate work, I was actually diagnosed with a rare genetic disease. And so I spent a lot of my extra time while I was practicing law, learning about the healthcare system and becoming an advocate for myself and for my daughter who has the same genetic diagnosis. And this is how I came into the world of AI in, in healthcare and, and met Devin and Mary Jane and others whom you've met earlier today. Uh, because AI and machine learning has tremendous potential to help people who have rare genetic diseases. So when I came back to this institution, I started on my first day in my PhD program with, with Aviv. And we sat beside each other on the first day. And we're like, oh, okay. <laughs> we, made, we made a friend. Um, but that was an incredibly important moment to make a friend on the first day because as most of you know who've done this, doing your PhD can be, at the best of times, an incredibly lonely pursuit. It's a kind of thing where you're trying to do something no one else has done. And so there are very few people who you have the intellectual community that you can share. And so for, for Aviv, he was my go-to. And Aviv's go-to, as you just heard, was Professor D'Agostino. And so this medal to me is a kind of symbol of the community that you were able to create for me. When I came back and I was doing work in public sector ethics but trying to learn more about the technology, you embraced me and you brought me into the IP Osgood fold and you gave me opportunities to, to grow, to learn, to develop, to contribute, to plan conferences with you nonstop, <laughs> to build websites, to be a part of this AI and society ORU that we're building. And really, you gave me a home that wasn't so lonely in my study, Carol. And you gave me an opportunity to learn about a space that was new to me, but deeply personal, understanding tech and its implications in society, and really the landscape. Um, I don't know much about IP, I must admit, but I get to sit in the room with all of you and listen to you talk about it and learn from you, and I'm forever grateful for that. So this medal to me is a symbol of community and opportunity to, to grow together, uh, and now that I'm here at York, you'll never get rid of me, so thank you. <laughs> This will make you an honorary IP person. Honorary? <laughs> <laughs> I won't answer any questions. <laughs> Congratulations. All right, up next, class of 2021, Ryan Wong. Uh, this is proof that I did my homework. Uh, thank you, Professor Weber, Justice Rossing. Uh, to be associated with, associated with Professor Weber in, in this manner is, is truly an honor. So I'm incredibly grateful to be receiving this award and hope that as I continue on in my career, I will at least be able to exemplify some of Favor, Professor Weber's qualities and strengths as a scholar, educator, and advocate. I think as we all heard today, AI is inevitable. The times for asking hypotheticals and what-if questions are long over. As IP lawyers, we all need to start studying AI uh, with all of its benefits and, and challenges. We might not be able to predict all the issues that come up, but we can at least be able to be knowledgeable enough in the area to tackle those issues when they do arise. And I hope to do that with the same rigor and spirit 
that uh, I've been so lucky to witness from, from Professor Weber. Before I end this, I want to say a, a big thank you to Professor D'Agostino also for, for all your mentorship. Uh, without IP Osgood Innovation Clinic, uh, I think my law school experience would be completely different. And so it really helped me establish my, my career as well. And I also want to say a, a quick shout out to my mom and my fiance that are over there. Um, they know how much they, they mean to me, and so thank you. See that you're continuing in with the IPJ, <laughs> right? Thank you very much. Fantastic. Okay. And now Miss Bonnie Hazan's day. 2022. Um, thank you, Professor Weber. Thank you, Justice Rothstein. I just want to take this opportunity to thank Professor D'Agostino and Professor Weber for everything that they do for the IP community and the Osgood community. I came to law school not entirely sure about what I wanted to do with my career. And through IP Osgood, I found purpose. And uh, IP Osgood made my law school experience so much more enjoyable and it's all because of great leadership and commitment to the student experience. And this medal to me symbolizes possibilities, which means a lot to me. <laughs> and I thank you for everything you're doing. Um, and since, since this is an AI event, um, I in my third year at Osgood, I had an opportunity to work on um, a research paper for the intensive on uh, precision medicine and AI. And now that I'm articling um, at, an, at a research hospital, I see that the future of medicine really is AI. So it's all coming together for me and that's, that makes it all the more meaningful to me. So thank you so much. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Congratulations. Well, mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Uh, well, well. Well, well, well. Uh, I'm going to be extremely brief. That's one of the qualities you didn't mention, but probably because it wasn't one of the qualities you ever recognized. <laughs> um, you've seen some uh, really worthy people uh, get honored in this way and they are worthy both uh, we have two phd students no longer students now professors and you have two uh, jd students now no longer j no, no longer students but jd and uh, both pursuing careers uh, that we know uh, we'll be proud of in the future years to come this is a conference on AI. And when I started off this in the uh, uh, neo-pianistic area, era, uh, there wasn't anything like AI. We had uh, the, the latest uh, technology was photocopiers, um, punch cards. You remember punch cards? Those were computers, uh, or the, the, the uh, uh, data that you fed into computers. Uh, and the really hot thing that was coming along at that stage was memory typewriters. Uh, they could actually remember a line, uh, line by line, and they were wonderful things. Uh, the IP law was uh, similarly a little, uh, IP laws were similarly, uh, 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 what should we say, dépassé. Um, rarely got amended. Um, I remember very well in uh, just in 1987, somebody put the question to a member of parliament in the UK, uh, why is it that it takes 20 years before you guys and gals change uh, an IP law? It's because uh, they are so, uh, they create so much uh, horror. Uh, you put in a law, you put in a bill that you think is completely innocuous, 
and all of a sudden you you know, the sky falls in on you from all sides. You had no idea that there were, uh, what 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 goes on here. So it, it it takes 20 years because that's about the general time that it uh, takes for a uh, member of parliament to uh, get out of parliament and some new fresh faces to come in who have no memory of how horrible the last experience was. So they'll take up the cudgels for an IP bill with great glee, only to find out it ain't a great uh, uh, thing after all. Wins you no votes whatsoever, probably loses your votes. Uh, so uh, that's been the, unfor the unfortunate experience of uh, how IP laws uh, uh, don't get changed that much. Well, they are now. Uh, I think uh, they're getting changed, but only bit by bit by bit. You look at the old Copyright Act, and you can see the 1921 Copyright Act sitting in there in the middle with bits bolted on, right? And that was a copy of the 1911 Act of the United Kingdom. And so it's, it's, it's all there, but at least that's better than the Patent Act, which uh, uh, has remnants of the 1793 US Patent Act there. Uh, so we, we, we like, uh, we can be inventive in all sorts of things except patent laws. That's, uh, that's the last thing we want to do. Uh, IP was not taught very much in 1970, uh, when I, uh, 1971, when I first started teaching in Canada. Um, I remember the story from one uh, that I heard about uh, uh, Harold Fox, who was the uh, doyen of IP laws before then, uh, and he came and taught uh, IP at Osgood, various, well actually it was patents, I don't think he taught copyright. Uh, but he would start his lecture, his uh, chauffeur would drive him up to the law school and he would step out and uh, the first thing he would say to his class is, I really don't know why I'm teaching you to take bread out of my mouth, but I hear it goes. Uh, and then he would uh, deliver his lecture and go back to his limo, get in and be driven off again. Uh, at least it gave the students who were doing the, uh, uh, who were in the class, uh, a reason uh, why they might want to continue with the subject. But uh, that's, that changed uh, in the 1970s or more into the 1980s. Uh, IP started being taught as a uh, more generally. Osgood is one of the leaders uh, in this in this field, uh, and uh, Oxford and Cambridge really were quite slow. First chair in IP in uh, Cambridge in, was in, uh, in 1990. First chair at Oxford was, I regret to say, uh, 1998. Uh, Cambridge stole a march that time, uh, never again. So uh, uh, I just want to say just one or two things about, uh, just to end off uh, on a slightly Oxfordy story, but um, uh, I was reading a book uh, by uh, an a biography by uh, uh, Michael and Ignatiev of uh, uh, Isaiah Berlin, the Oxford uh, philosopher and historian. Um, some of you uh, who have done uh, philosophy or history will have come across his name. He's a very, very distinguished uh, academic. Uh, and uh, I see man of the world, and not just academic. Uh, and uh, he, uh, uh, in the middle of this, early on in this uh, book, uh, it indicated that he was one of the things he wanted to look at uh, was law, and he looked at uh, studying law, but then decided it was too dull by half, as he said. So he went on to do uh, history and philosophy instead. So a, a loss to law, a gain to history and philosophy. Uh, but it, what uh, he, he wrote a book, a very interesting book, uh, or at least it started off as an essay and then became, an, uh, became a uh, collection of essays uh, called uh, Hedgehogs and Foxes. And uh, his theory was, and some of you all know this already who've done uh, philosophy or uh, indeed Tolstoy, since the lecture was, as the paper was actually largely about Tolstoy, uh, is that uh, you can divide uh, thinkers, writers, people into two classes, uh, hedgehogs or foxes. Hedgehogs know only one big thing, only, and that's it. And if they're attacked, 
they turn into a ball and that's it. Uh, and foxes, on the other hand, know many things, but not terribly deeply, uh, but they know many things. Uh, if, they are, if they are attacked, they know ways of avoiding attack and doesn't involve rolling up into a ball. Uh, and that goes for uh, ideas, history of ideas and, the, uh, and, and law as well. And it occurred to me that when you're thinking about IP or AI, uh, you can't be a hedgehog. You can't know one big thing. There is not one big thing to know about either AI or IP. You have to be a fox. You have to know lots of things. Uh, and not lots of things superficially. You have to know lots of things quite deeply. And you have to be flexible. And you have to be uh, creative in your thinking. Take on new ideas, not only take on new ideas, create new ideas, think about it and bring, uh, bring new ideas to the field. And it occurs to me that's exactly what uh, this conference has been about. It's been, on the one hand, a conference that has been uh, redolent in history uh, and at the same time it's been a conference that has been very much forward-looking dealing with a technology and with a subject that is dynamic always on the move and with various pressures and stakeholders having input into it. Uh, and so uh, I want to say to all of the uh, four recipients that we have here of, uh, of the medal. Uh, they have, I think, proved to be foxes, and I hope that they will continue being foxes, clever foxes, and never a hedgehog. Thank you. All right, thank you. So we're right on time. Uh, so I think you should have the last word, Professor Weber. So I'm just going to close this incredible conference with a big thank you to all of you. Uh, when I first started and, uh, you know, with my opening remarks, I said that I talked about bracing for impact. Well, I think we've reached, right? So no longer the need to brace for impact, but we've journeyed together, we've traveled together today, and I think we really had an authentic exploration from the various panels, the incredible speakers we had, to our incredible keynote. Uh, thank you, Professor Zimmer. Um, that, to me, is what this conference um, is about and what it will continue to be. And with great thanks to Microsoft for really uh, the resourcing behind it, because you know, it came up a bit. We do need resources, so if any of you want to help out, uh, feel free. But we're grateful to Microsoft because they've been with us from the very beginning. And of course, to all of our speakers, Justice Rothstein, Professor Weber, our students, Paul, uh, you're incredible, um, Amir, Cosantinos, uh, just as I look around the room, so many of you have, have really lent your time and expertise to making today a great success. And so you should stay tuned. Uh, Maria has been snapping some uh, happy photos throughout, so you'll see those, we'll put them up on the website. Uh, there'll be, the students have been avidly taking notes and they'll be blogging throughout the week, so stay tuned to the IP Osgood site, the Osgood YouTube channel for a recording of the event and the blogs. And as I like to say, the conversation always continues. So stay tuned also for upcoming um, announcements from the new Center for AI and Society at York. And again, going back to I think what really transcends it all is the humanity of w our work, right? And how um, you know it's human-led first, whether it's the patient, whether it's the student, it's about the people. Uh, behind uh, the AI and the technology, and that's what we care about, that's what we want to study, and that's what we want to talk about. So with that, a very big thanks, and it's time for drinks. Uh, outside, Spot is sticking around. Spot wants to meet each of you. Make sure uh, you get a chance to catch uh, another demonstration from MFE team. Very grateful for that. And thank you to our technical team. Uh, you've made everything run smoothly, and uh, that's really um, 
I think, a joy at a conference, especially in this hybrid environment that we're now in. So with that, merci tout le monde, and uh, a big round of applause to each of you.